Chapter 24 Joshua Reviews Israel's History Joshua gathered all the tribes of Israel to Shechem and called for the elders of Israel, for their heads, for their judges, and for their officers. And they presented themselves before God. Joshua said to all the people, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Your fathers lived of old time beyond the river, even Terah, the father of Abraham, and the father of Nahor. And they served other gods. I took your father Abraham from beyond the river, and led him throughout all the land of Canaan, and multiplied his seed, and gave him Isaac. I gave to Isaac Jacob and Esau, and I gave to Esau Mount Seir to possess it. Jacob and his children went down into Egypt. I sent Moses and Aaron, and I plagued Egypt, according to that which I did in its midst, and afterward. I brought you out. I brought your fathers out of Egypt, and you came to the sea. The Egyptians pursued after your fathers with chariots and with horsemen to the Red Sea. When they cried out to Yahweh, he put darkness between you and the Egyptians, and brought the sea on them, and covered them. And your eyes saw what I did in Egypt and you lived in the wilderness many days. I brought you into the land of the Amorites that lived beyond the Jordan, and they fought with you, and I gave them into your hand. You possessed their land, and I destroyed them from before you. Then Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab, arose and fought against Israel. He sent and called Balaam, the son of Beor, to curse you. But I would not listen to Balaam, therefore he blessed you still. So I delivered you out of his hand. You went over the Jordan and came to Jericho. The men of Jericho fought against you, the Amorite, the Perizzite, the Canaanite, the Hittite, the Girgashite, the Hivite, and the Jebusite and I delivered them into your hand. I sent the hornet before you, which drove them out from before you, even the two kings of the Amorites, not with your sword, nor with your bow. I gave you a land whereon you had not labored, and cities which you didn't build, and you live in them. You eat of vineyards and olive groves, which you didn't plant. Choose whom you will serve. Now, therefore, fear Yahweh and serve him in sincerity and in truth. Put away the gods which your father served beyond the river in Egypt and serve Yahweh. If it seems evil to you to serve Yahweh, choose this day whom you will serve whether the gods which your fathers served that were beyond the river, or the gods of the Amorites in whose land you dwell. But as for me and my house, we will serve Yahweh. The people answered, Far be it from us that we should forsake Yahweh to serve other gods, for it is Yahweh our God who brought us and our fathers up out of the land of Egypt from the house of bondage, and who did those great signs in our sight, and preserved us in all the way in which we went, and among all the peoples through the midst of whom we passed. Yahweh drove out from before us all the peoples, even the Amorites who lived in the land. Therefore we also will serve Yahweh, for he is our God. Joshua said to the people, You can't serve Yahweh for he is a holy God. He is a jealous God. He will not forgive your disobedience nor your sins. If you forsake Yahweh and serve foreign gods, then he will turn and do you evil 
and consume you after he has done you good. The people said to Joshua, No, but we will serve Yahweh. Joshua said to the people, You are witnesses against yourselves that you have chosen Yahweh yourselves to serve him. They said, We are witnesses. Now therefore, put away the foreign gods which are among you, and incline your heart to Yahweh, the God of Israel. The people said to Joshua, We will serve Yahweh our God, and we will listen to his voice. So Joshua made a covenant with the people that day, and made for them a statute and an ordinance in Shechem. Joshua wrote these words in the book of the law of God, and he took a great stone and set it up there under the oak that was by the sanctuary of Yahweh. Joshua said to all the people, Behold, this stone shall be a witness against you, for it has heard all the words of Yahweh which he spoke to us. It shall be therefore a witness against you, lest you deny your God. So Joshua sent the people away, every man to his inheritance. Joshua's Death and Burial It happened after these things that Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Yahweh, died, being one hundred and ten years old. They buried him in the border of his inheritance in timnath which is in the hill country of Ephraim on the north of the mountain of Gaash. Israel served Yahweh all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua, and had known all the work of Yahweh that he had worked for Israel. They buried the bones of Joseph, which the children of Israel brought up out of Egypt, in Shechem, in the parcel of ground which Jacob bought of the sons of Hamor, the father of Shechem for a hundred pieces of money. They became the inheritance of the children of Joseph. Eleazar, the son of Aaron, died. They buried him in the hill of Phinehas, his son, which was given him in the hill country of Ephraim. Judges Chapter 1 War Against Remaining Canaanites it happened, after the death of Joshua, the children of Israel asked of Yahweh, saying, Who should go up for us first against the Canaanites to fight against them? Yahweh said, Judah shall go up. Behold, I have delivered the land into his hand. Judah said to Simeon, his brother, Come up with me into my lot, that we may fight against the Canaanites, and I likewise will go with you into your lot. So Simeon went with him. Judah went up, and Yahweh delivered the Canaanites and the Perizzites into their hand, and they struck of them in Bezek ten thousand men. They found Adonai Bezek in Bezek, and they fought against him. And they struck the Canaanites and the Perizzites. But Adonai Bezek fled, and they pursued after him, and caught him, and cut off his thumbs and his great toes. Adonai Bezek said, Seventy kings, having their thumbs and their great toes cut off, gathered their food under my table. As I have done, so God has requited me. They brought him to Jerusalem, and he died there. Jerusalem and Hebron Captured The children of Judah fought against Jerusalem, and took it, and struck it with the edge of the sword, and set the city on fire. Afterward, the children of Judah went down to fight against the Canaanites who lived in the hill country, and in the south, and in the lowland. Judah went against the Canaanites who lived in Hebron. Now the name of Hebron before was Kiriath Arba, 
and they struck Shishai, and Ahiman, and Talmai. Additional cities captured. From there he went against the inhabitants of Deber. Now the name of Deber before was Kiriath Sefer. Caleb said, He who strikes Kiriath Sefer and takes it, to him will I give Aksa, my daughter, as wife. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother, took it, and he gave him Aksa, his daughter, as wife. It happened when she came to him that she moved him to ask of her father a field, and she alighted from off her donkey, and Caleb said to her, What would you like? She said to him, Give me a blessing, for that you have set me in the land of the south. Give me also springs of water. Then Caleb gave her the upper springs and the lower springs. The children of the Kenite, Moses' brother-in-law, went up out of the city of palm trees with the children of Judah into the wilderness of Judah, which is in the south of Arad. And they went and lived with the people. Judah went with Simeon, his brother, and they struck the Canaanites who inhabited Zephath and utterly destroyed it. The name of the city was called Hormah. Also, Judah took Gaza with its border, and Ashkelon with its border, and Ekron with its border. Yahweh was with Judah and drove out the inhabitants of the hill country, for he could not drive out the inhabitants of the valley because they had chariots of iron. They gave Hebron to Caleb, as Moses had spoken, and he drove out there the three sons of Anak. The children of Benjamin did not drive out the Jebusites who inhabited Jerusalem, but the Jebusites dwell with the children of Benjamin in Jerusalem to this day. The house of Joseph, they also went up against Bethel, and Yahweh was with them. The house of Joseph sent to spy out Bethel. Now the name of the city before was Luz. The watchers saw a man come forth out of the city, and they said to him, Please, show us the entrance into the city, and we will deal kindly with you. He showed them the entrance into the city, and they struck the city with the edge of the sword. But they let the man go and all his family. The man went into the land of the Hittites and built a city and called its name Luz, which is its name to this day. Places Not Conquered Manasseh did not drive out the inhabitants of Beth Sheen and its towns, nor of Teanach and its towns, nor the inhabitants of Dor and its towns, nor the inhabitants of Iblium, and its towns, nor the inhabitants of Megiddo, and its towns. But the Canaanites would dwell in that land. It happened, when Israel had grown strong, that they put the Canaanites to forced labor, and did not utterly drive them out. Ephraim didn't drive out the Canaanites who lived in Gezer, but the Canaanites lived in Gezer among them. Zebulon didn't drive out the inhabitants of Kitron, nor the inhabitants of Nahalol, but the Canaanites lived among them and became subject to forced labor. Asher didn't drive out the inhabitants of Akko, nor the inhabitants of Sidon, nor of Alab, nor of Axid, nor of Helba, nor of Aphek, nor of Rehob. But the Asherites lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land, for they did not drive them out. Naphtali didn't drive out the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh, nor the inhabitants of Beth Anath, but he lived among the Canaanites, the inhabitants of the land. Nevertheless, the inhabitants of Beth Shemesh and of Beth Anath became subject to forced labor. The Amorites forced the children of Dan into the hill country, for they would not allow them to come down to the valley. But the Amorites would dwell in Mount Heres, in Ajalon, and in Shealbim. 
yet the hand of the house of Joseph prevailed, so that they became subject to forced labor. The border of the Amorites was from the ascent of a crabbim, from the rock and upward. Chapter 2 Israel Rebuked at Bokan The angel of Yahweh came up from Gilgal to Bokan. He said, I made you to go up out of Egypt, and have brought you to the land which I swore to your fathers. And I said, I will never break my covenant with you, and you shall make no covenant with the inhabitants of this land. You shall break down their altars. But you have not listened to my voice. Why have you done this? Therefore I also said, I will not drive them out from before you, but they shall be as thorns in your sides, and their gods shall be a snare to you. It happened when the angel of Yahweh spoke these words to all the children of Israel, that the people lifted up their voice and wept. They called the name of that place Bokim, and they sacrificed there to Yahweh. The Death of Joshua Now when Joshua had sent the people away, the children of Israel went every man to his inheritance to possess the land. The people served Yahweh all the days of Joshua, and all the days of the elders who outlived Joshua who had seen all the great work of Yahweh that he had worked for Israel. Joshua, the son of Nun, the servant of Yahweh, died, being 110 years old. They buried him in the border of his inheritance, in Timnath Harris, in the hill country of Ephraim, on the north of the mountain of Gaash. Also, all that generation were gathered to their fathers, and there arose another generation after them, who didn't know Yahweh, nor yet the work which he had worked for Israel. Israel's Unfaithfulness The children of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and served the Baals, and they forsook Yahweh the God of their fathers, who brought them out of the land of Egypt and followed other gods of the gods of the peoples who were around them and bowed themselves down to them. And they provoked Yahweh to anger. They forsook Yahweh and served Baal and the Ashtaroth. The anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel and he delivered them into the hands of spoilers who despoiled them, and he sold them into the hands of their enemies all around, so that they could not any longer stand before their enemies. Wherever they went out, the hand of Yahweh was against them for evil, as Yahweh had spoken, and as Yahweh had sworn to them, and they were very distressed. Judges Raised Up Yahweh raised up judges, who saved them out of the hand of those who despoiled them. Yet they didn't listen to their judges, for they played the prostitute after other gods, and bowed themselves down to them. They turned aside quickly out of the way in which their fathers walked, obeying the commandments of Yahweh, but they didn't do so. When Yahweh raised them up judges, then Yahweh was with the judge and saved them out of the hand of their enemies all the days of the judge. For it grieved Yahweh because of their groaning by reason of those who oppressed them and troubled them. But it happened when the judge was dead that they turned back and dealt more corruptly than their fathers in following other gods to serve them and to bow down to them. They didn't cease from their doings, nor from their stubborn way. 
the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel. And he said, Because this nation hath transgressed my covenant, which I commanded their fathers, and have not listened to my voice, I also will not henceforth drive out any from before them of the nations that Joshua left when he died, that by them I may prove Israel, whether they will keep the way of Yahweh to walk therein, as their fathers did keep it, or not. So Yahweh left those nations without driving them out hastily, neither delivered he them into the hand of Joshua. Chapter 3 Nations Left to Test Israel Now these are the nations which Yahweh left to prove Israel by them, even as many of Israel has had not known all the wars of Canaan, only that the generations of the children of Israel might know to teach them war, at the least such as before knew nothing of it, namely the five lords of the Philistines, and all the Canaanites, and the Sidonians, and the Hivites who lived on Mount Lebanon, from Mount Baal Hermon to the entrance of Hamath. They were left to prove Israel by them, to know whether they would listen to the commandments of Yahweh, which he commanded their fathers by Moses. The children of Israel lived among the Canaanites, the Hittites, and the Amorites, and the Perizzites, and the Hivites, and the Jebusites. And they took their daughters to be their wives, and gave their own daughters to their sons, and served their gods. Othniel the children of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and forgot Yahweh their God, and served the Baals and the Asheroth. Therefore the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia. And the children of Israel served Cushan Rishathaim eight years. When the children of Israel cried to Yahweh, Yahweh raised up a Savior to the children of Israel, who saved them, even Othniel, the son of Kenaz, Caleb's younger brother. The Spirit of Yahweh came on him, and he judged Israel, and he went out to war. And Yahweh delivered Cushan Rishathaim, king of Mesopotamia, into his hand and his hand prevailed against Cushan Rishathaim. The land had rest forty years. Othniel, the son of Kenaz, died. Ehud delivers the Israelites. The children of Israel again did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and Yahweh strengthened Eglon, the king of Moab, against Israel because they had done that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh. He gathered to him the children of Ammon and Amalek, and he went and struck Israel, and they possessed the city of palm trees. The children of Israel served Eglon, the king of Moab, eighteen years. But when the children of Israel cried to Yahweh, Yahweh raised them up a savior, Ehud the son of Jira, the Benjamite, a man left-handed. The children of Israel sent tribute by him to Eglon, the king of Moab. Ehud made him a sword which had two edges, a cubit in length, and he wore it under his clothing on his right thigh. He offered the tribute to Eglon, king of Moab. Now Eglon was a very fat man, when he had made an end of offering the tribute, he sent away the people who bore the tribute. But he himself turned back from the quarries that were by Gilgal, and said, I have a secret errand to you, king. The king said, Keep silence. All who stood by him went out from him. 
Ehud came to him, and he was sitting by himself, alone in the cool upper room. Ehud said, I have a message from God to you. He arose out of his seat. Ehud put forth his left hand and took the sword from his right thigh and thrust it into his body, and the handle also went in after the blade, and the fat closed on the blade, for he didn't draw the sword out of his body, and it came out behind. Then Ehud went forth into the porch and shut the doors of the upper room on him, and locked them. Now when he was gone out, his servants came, and they saw, and behold, the doors of the upper room were locked, and they said, Surely he is covering his feet in the upper room. They waited until they were ashamed, and behold, he didn't open the doors of the upper room. Therefore they took the key and opened them, and behold, their Lord was fallen down dead on the earth. Ehud escaped while they waited, and passed beyond the quarries, and escaped to Sierra. It happened, when he had come, that he blew a trumpet in the hill country of Ephraim. And the children of Israel went down with him from the hill country, and he before them. He said to them, Follow me. For Yahweh has delivered your enemies, the Moabites, into your hand. They followed him, and took the fords of the Jordan against the Moabites, and didn't allow any man to pass over. They struck of Moab at that time about ten thousand men, every lusty man and every man of valor, and there escaped not a man. So Moab was subdued that day under the hand of Israel. The land had rest eighty years. Shamgar After him was Shamgar, the son of Anath, who struck of the Philistines six hundred men with an ox goad, and he also saved Israel. Chapter 4 Deborah and Barak. The children of Israel again did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, when Ehud was dead. Yahweh sold them into the hand of Jabin, king of Canaan, who reigned in Hazor, the captain of whose army was Sisera, who lived in Harosheth of the Gentiles. The children of Israel cried to Yahweh, for he had nine hundred chariots of iron, and twenty years he mightily oppressed the children of Israel. Now Deborah, a prophetess, the wife of Lapidoth, she judged Israel at that time. She lived under the palm tree of Deborah, between Ramah and Bethel, in the hill country of Ephraim. And the children of Israel came up to her for judgment. She sent and called Barak, the son of Abinoam, out of Kadesh Naphtali, and said to him, Hasn't Yahweh, the God of Israel, commanded, Go and draw to Mount Tabor, and take with you ten thousand men of the children of Naphtali and of the children of Zebulun? I will draw to you, to the river Kishon, Sisera, the captain of Jabin's army, with his chariots, and his multitude, and I will deliver him into your hand. Barak said to her, If you will go with me, then I will go. But if you will not go with me, I will not go. She said, I will surely go with you. Nevertheless, the journey that you take shall not be for your honor, for Yahweh will sell Sisera into the hand of a woman. Deborah arose and went with Barak to Kedesh. Barak called Zebulon and Naphtali together to Kedesh, and there went up ten thousand men at his feet, and Deborah went up with him. Now Heber the Kenite had separated himself from the Kenites, even from the children of Hobab, the brother-in-law of Moses, and had pitched his tent as far as the oak in Zeanonim which is by Kadesh. 
they told Sisera that Barak, the son of Abinoam, was gone up to Mount Tabor. Sisera gathered together all his chariots, even nine hundred chariots of iron, and all the people who were with him, from Herosheth of the Gentiles to the river Kishon. Deborah said to Barak, Go, for this is the day in which Yahweh has delivered Sisera into your hand. Hasn't Yahweh gone out before you? So Barak went down from Mount Tabor, and ten thousand men after him. Yahweh confused Sisera and all his chariots and all his army with the edge of the sword before Barak. And Sisera alighted from his chariot and fled away on his feet. But Barak pursued after the chariots and after the army to Herosheth of the Gentiles, and all the army of Sisera fell by the edge of the sword. There was not a man left. Jael kills Sisera. However, Sisera fled away on his feet to the tent of Jael, the wife of Heber the Kenite. For there was peace between Jabin the king of Hazor and the house of Heber the Kenite. Jael went out to meet Sisera and said to him, Turn in, my lord, turn in to me, don't be afraid. He came in to her into the tent, and she covered him with a rug. He said to her, Please, give me a little water to drink, for I am thirsty. She opened a bottle of milk and gave him drink and covered him. He said to her, Stand in the door of the tent, and it shall be, when any man comes and inquires of you and says, Is there any man here, that you shall say, No. Then Jael, Heber's wife, took a tent peg and took a hammer in her hand and went softly to him and struck the pen into his temples. And it pierced through into the ground, for he was in a deep sleep. So he swooned and died. Behold, as Barak pursued Sisera, Jael came out to meet him and said to him, Come, and I will show you the man whom you seek. He came to her, and behold, Sisera lay dead, and the tent peg was in his temples. So God subdued on that day Jabin, the king of Canaan, before the children of Israel. The hand of the children of Israel prevailed more and more against Jabin, the king of Canaan, until they had destroyed Jabin, king of Canaan. Chapter 5 The Song of Deborah and Barak Then Deborah and Barak, the son of Abinoam, sang on that day, saying, because the leaders took the lead in Israel, because the people offered themselves willingly, be blessed, Yahweh. Hear, you kings, give ear, you princes. I, even I, will sing to Yahweh. I will sing praise to Yahweh, the God of Israel. Yahweh, when you went forth out of Seir, when you marched out of the field of Edom, the earth trembled, the sky also dropped. Yes, the clouds dropped water. The mountains quaked at the presence of Yahweh, even Sinai, at the presence of Yahweh, the God of Israel. In the days of Shamgar, the son of Anath, in the days of Jael, the highways were unoccupied, the travelers walked through byways, the rulers ceased in Israel. They ceased until I, Deborah, arose, until I arose a mother in Israel. They chose new gods. Then war was in the gates. Was there a shield or spear seen among 40,000 in Israel? My heart is toward the governors of Israel, who offered themselves willingly among the people. Bless Yahweh. Tell of it, you who ride on white donkeys, you who sit on rich carpets 
and you who walk by the way, far from the noise of archers, in the places of drawing water. There they will rehearse the righteous acts of Yahweh, even the righteous acts of his rule in Israel. Then the people of Yahweh went down to the gates. Awake, awake, Deborah, awake, awake, utter a song. Arise, Barak, and lead away your captives, you son of Abinoam. Then a remnant of the nobles and the people came down. Yahweh came down for me against the mighty. Those whose root is in Amalek came out of Ephraim, after you, Benjamin, among your peoples. Governors come down out of Maker. Those who handled the marshal's staff came out of Zebulun. The princes of Issachar were with Deborah, as was Issachar, so was Barak. They rushed into the valley at his feet, by the watercourses of Reuben. There were great resolves of heart. Why did you sit among the sheepfolds, to hear the whistling for the flocks? At the watercourses of Reuben there were great searchings of heart. Gilead lived beyond the Jordan. Why did Dan remain in ships? Asher sat still at the haven of the sea and lived by his creeks. Zebulon was a people that jeopardized their lives to the deaths. Naphtali also, on the high places of the field. The kings came and fought. Then the kings of Canaan fought at Teanach by the waters of Megiddo. They took no plunder of silver. From the sky the stars fought. From their courses they fought against Sisera. The river Kishon swept them away. That ancient river, the river Kishon. My soul, march on with strength. Then the horse hooves stamped because of the prancings, the prancings of their strong ones. Curse Miraz, said the angel of Yahweh. Curse bitterly its inhabitants, because they didn't come to help Yahweh, to help Yahweh against the mighty. Jael shall be blessed above women, the wife of Heber the Kenite. Blessed shall she be above women in the tent. He asked for water. She gave him milk. She brought him butter in a lordly dish. She put her hand to the tent peg and her right hand to the workman's hammer. With the hammer she struck Sisera. She struck through his head. Yes, she pierced and struck through his temples. At her feet he bowed. He fell. He lay. At her feet he bowed. He fell. Where he bowed, there he fell down dead. Through the window she looked out and cried. Sisera's mother looked through the lattice. Why is his chariot so long in coming? Why do the wheels of his chariots wait? Her wise ladies answered her, Yes. She returned answer to herself. Have they not found? Have they not divided the spoil? A lady, two ladies to every man, to Sisera a spoil of dyed garments, a spoil of dyed garments embroidered, of dyed garments embroidered on both sides, on the necks of the spoil. So let all your enemies perish, Yahweh, but let those who love him be as the sun when it rises forth in its strength. Then the land had rest forty years. Chapter 6 Midian Oppresses Israel The children of Israel did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and Yahweh delivered them into the hand of Midian seven years. The hand of Midian prevailed against Israel, and because of Midian, the children of Israel made them the dens, which are in the mountains, and the caves, and the strongholds. 
So it was, when Israel had sown, that the Midians came up, and the Amalekites, and the children of the east. They came up against them, and they encamped against them, and destroyed the increase of the earth, until you come to Gaza, and left no sustenance in Israel, neither sheep, nor ox, nor donkey. For they came up with their livestock and their tents. They came in as locusts for multitude. Both they and their camels were without number. And they came into the land to destroy it. Israel was brought very low because of Midian. And the children of Israel cried to Yahweh. It happened when the children of Israel cried to Yahweh because of Midian, that Yahweh sent a prophet to the children of Israel, and he said to them, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, I brought you up from Egypt, and brought you forth out of the house of bondage, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all who oppressed you, and drove them out from before you, and gave you their land. And I said to you, I am Yahweh, your God. You shall not fear the gods of the Amorites, in whose land you dwell, but you have not listened to my voice. The Call of Gideon The angel of Yahweh came, and sat under the oak which was in Ophrah, that pertained to Joash the Abiezrite. And his son, Gideon, was beating out wheat in the winepress to hide it from the Midianites. The angel of Yahweh appeared to him and said to him, Yahweh is with you, you mighty man of valor. Gideon said to him, O oh, my Lord, if Yahweh is with us, why then has all this happened to us? Where are all his wondrous works? which our fathers told us of, saying, Didn't Yahweh bring us up from Egypt? But now Yahweh has cast us off and delivered us into the hand of Midian. Yahweh looked at him and said, Go in this your might, and save Israel from the hand of Midian. Haven't I sent you? He said to him, O oh Lord, how shall I save Israel? Behold, my family is the poorest in Manasseh, and I am the least in my father's house. Yahweh said to him, Surely I will be with you, and you shall strike the Midianites as one man. Gideon's Offering Consumed with Fire He said to him, if now I have found favor in your sight, then show me a sign that it is you who talk with me. Please don't go away until I come to you and bring out my present and lay it before you. He said, I will wait until you come back. Gideon went in and prepared a young goat and unleavened cakes of an ephah of meal. He put the meal in a basket and he put the broth in a pot, and brought it out to him under the oak, and presented it. The angel of God said to him, Take the meat and the unleavened cakes, and lay them on this rock, and pour out the broth. He did so. Then the angel of Yahweh stretched out the end of the staff that was in his hand, and touched the meat and the unleavened cakes, and fire went up out of the rock and consumed the meat and the unleavened cakes. And the angel of Yahweh departed out of his sight. Gideon saw that he was the angel of Yahweh, and Gideon said, Alas, Lord Yahweh, because I have seen the angel of Yahweh face to face. Yahweh said to him, Peace be to you. Don't be afraid. You shall not die. Gideon destroys Baal's altar. Then Gideon built an altar there to Yahweh and called it 
Yahweh is peace. To this day, it is still in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. It happened the same night that Yahweh said to him, Take your father's bull, even this second bull, seven years old, and throw down the altar of Baal that your father has, and cut down the Asherah that is by it, and build an altar to Yahweh your God on the top of his stronghold, in an orderly way. And take the second bull, and offer a burnt offering with the wood of the Asherah, which you shall cut down. Then Gideon took ten men of his servants, and did as Yahweh had spoken to him. And it happened, because he feared his father's household, and the men of the city, so that he could not do it by day that he did it by night. When the men of the city arose early in the morning, behold, the altar of Baal was broken down, and the Asherah was cut down that was by it, and the second bull was offered on the altar that was built. They said one to another, Who has done this thing? When they inquired and asked, they said, Gideon, the son of Joash, has done this thing. Then the men of the city said to Joash, Bring out your son, that he may die, because he has broken down the altar of Baal, and because he has cut down the Asherah that was by it. Joash said to all who stood against him, Will you contend for Baal, or will you save him? He who will contend for him let him be put to death while it is yet morning. If he is a god, let him contend for himself, because someone has broken down his altar. Therefore, on that day, he named him Jerub Baal, saying, Let Baal contend against him, because he has broken down his altar. Gideon's Army then all the Midianites and the Amalekites and the children of the east assembled themselves together, and they passed over and encamped in the valley of Jezreel. But the Spirit of Yahweh came on Gideon, and he blew a trumpet, and Abiezer was gathered together after him. He sent messengers throughout all Manasseh, and they also were gathered together after him. And he sent messengers to Asher, and to Zebulun, and to Naphtali, and they came up to meet them. The Signs of the Fleece Gideon said to God, If you will save Israel by my hand, as you have spoken, behold, I will put a fleece of wool on the threshing floor, if there be dew on the fleece only and it be dry on all the ground, then shall I know that you will save Israel by my hand, as you have spoken. It was so, for he rose up early on the next day, and pressed the fleece together, and wrung the dew out of the fleece, a bowl full of water. Gideon said to God, Don't let your anger be kindled against me, and I will speak but this once. Please let me make a trial just this once with the fleece. Let it now be dry, only on the fleece, and on all the ground let there be dew. God did so that night, for it was dry on the fleece only, and there was dew on all the ground. Chapter 7 Gideon's Army of Three Hundred then Jerubbaal, who is Gideon, and all the people who were with him, rose up early and encamped beside the spring of Herod. And the camp of Midian was on the north side of them, by the hill of Moreh, in the valley. Yahweh said to Gideon, The people who are with you are too many for me to give the Midianites into their hands lest Israel vaunt themselves against me, saying, My own hand has saved me. Now, therefore, 
proclaim in the ears of the people, saying, Whoever is fearful and trembling, let him return and depart from Mount Gilead. Twenty-two thousand of the people returned, and ten thousand remained. Yahweh said to Gideon, The people are still too many. Bring them down to the water, and I will test them for you there. It shall be that of whom I tell you, this shall go with you, the same shall go with you. And of whoever I tell you, this shall not go with you, the same shall not go. So he brought down the people to the water, and Yahweh said to Gideon, Everyone who laps of the water with his tongue like a dog laps, you shall set him by himself. Likewise, everyone who bows down on his knees to drink. The number of those who lapped, putting their hands to their mouth, was three hundred men. But all the rest of the people bowed down on their knees to drink water. Yahweh said to Gideon, by the three hundred men who lapped will I save you, and deliver the Midianites into your hand. Let all the other people go, each to his own place. So the people took food in their hand, and their trumpets, and he sent all the men of Israel, every man, to his tent, but retained the three hundred men, and the camp of Midian was beneath him in the valley. Gideon's Dream It happened the same night that Yahweh said to him, Arise, go down into the camp, for I have delivered it into your hand. But if you are afraid to go down, go with Pura, your servant, down to the camp, and you shall hear what they say, and afterward your hands will be strengthened to go down into the camp. Then he went down with Pura, his servant, to the outermost part of the armed men who were in the camp, the Midianites and the Amalekites and all the children of the east lay along in the valley like locusts for a multitude, and their camels were without number, as the sand which is on the seashore for a multitude. When Gideon had come, behold, there was a man telling a dream to his fellow, and he said, Behold, I dreamed a dream, and behold, a cake of barley bread tumbled into the camp of Midian, and came to the tent, and struck it so that it fell, and turned it upside down, so that the tent lay flat. His fellow answered, This is nothing other than the sword of Gideon, the son of Joash, a man of Israel. God has delivered Midian into his hand with all the army. Gideon defeats Midian. It was so. When Gideon heard the telling of the dream and its interpretation, that he worshipped, and he returned into the camp of Israel and said, Arise! for Yahweh has delivered the army of Midian into your hand. He divided the three hundred men into three companies, and he put into the hands of all of them trumpets and empty pitchers with torches within the pitchers. He said to them, Watch me and do likewise. Behold, when I come to the outermost part of the camp, it shall be that, as I do, so you shall do. When I blow the trumpet, I and all who are with me, then blow the trumpets also on every side of all the camp, and shout, For Yahweh and for Gideon! So Gideon and the hundred men who were with him came to the outermost part of the camp in the beginning of the middle watch, when they had but newly set the watch. And they blew the trumpets and broke in pieces the pitchers that were in their hands. The three companies blew the trumpets and broke the pitchers and held the torches in their left hands and the trumpets in their right hands with which to blow, 
and they shouted, The sword of Yahweh and of Gideon. They stood every man in his place around the camp, and all the army ran, and they shouted and put them to flight. They blew the three hundred trumpets, and Yahweh set every man's sword against his fellow and against all the army. And the army fled as far as Beth Shittah, toward Zerorah, as far as the border of Abel Mehola, by Tabith. The men of Israel were gathered together out of Naphtali, and out of Asher, and out of all Manasseh, and pursued after Midian. Gideon sent messengers throughout all the hill country of Ephraim, saying, Come down against Midian, and take before them the waters, as far as beth Bara, even the Jordan. So all the men of Ephraim were gathered together, and took the waters as far as beth Bara, even the Jordan. They took the two princes of Midian, Oreb and Zeb, and they killed Oreb at the rock of Oreb, and Zeb they killed at the winepress of Zeb, and pursued Midian. And they brought the heads of Oreb and Zeb to Gideon beyond the Jordan. Chapter 8 Gideon Defeats Zeba and Zalmunna The men of Ephraim said to him, Why have you treated us this way, that you didn't call us when you went to fight with Midian? They rebuked him sharply. He said to them, What have I now done in comparison with you? Isn't the gleaning of the grapes of Ephraim better than the vintage of Abiezer? God has delivered into your hand the princes of Midian, Oreb, and Zeb. What was I able to do in comparison with you? Then their anger was abated toward him when he had said that. Gideon came to the Jordan and passed over, he and the three hundred men who were with him, faint yet pursuing. He said to the men of Succoth, Please give loaves of bread to the people who follow me, for they are faint, and I am pursuing after Zeba and Zalmunna, the kings of Midian. The princes of Succoth said, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your army? Gideon said, Therefore, when Yahweh has delivered Zeba and Zalmunna into my hand, then I will tear your flesh with the thorns of the wilderness and with briars. He went up there to Penuel and spoke to them in the same way. And the men of Penuel answered him as the men of Succoth had answered. He spoke also to the men of Penuel, saying, When I come again in peace, I will break down this tower. Now Zeba and Zalmunna were in Karkor, and their armies with them, about fifteen thousand men, all who were left of all the army of the children of the east. For there fell one hundred twenty thousand men who drew sword. Gideon went up by the way of those who lived in tents on the east of Noba and Jogbeha, and struck the army, for the army was secure. Zeba and Zalmunna fled, and he pursued after them, and he took the two kings of Midian, Zeba and Zalmunna, and confused all the army. Gideon, the son of Joash, returned from the battle, from the ascent of Heres. He caught a young man of the men of Succoth, and inquired of him, and he described for him the princes of Succoth, and its elders, seventy-seven men. He came to the men of Succoth and said, See Zeba and Zalmunna, concerning whom you taunted me, saying, Are the hands of Zeba and Zalmunna now in your hand, that we should give bread to your men who are weary? He took the elders of the city, and thorns of the wilderness and briars, and with them he taught the men of Succoth. He broke down the tower of Penuel, and killed the men of the city. Then he said to Zeba and Zalmunna, What kind of men were they whom you killed at Tabor? They answered, They were like you, 
Each one resembled the children of a king. He said, They were my brothers, the sons of my mother. As Yahweh lives, if you had saved them alive, I would not kill you. He said to Jether, his firstborn, Get up and kill them. But the youth didn't draw his sword, for he was afraid, because he was yet a youth. Then Zeba and Zalmunna said, Rise and fall on us, for as the man is, so is his strength. Gideon arose and killed Zeba and Zalmunna, and took the crescents that were on their camels' necks. Gideon's Ephod Then the men of Israel said to Gideon, Rule over us, both you and your son, and your son's son also, for you have saved us out of the hand of Midian. Gideon said to them, I will not rule over you, neither shall my son rule over you. Yahweh shall rule over you. Gideon said to them, I would make a request of you, that you would give me every man the earrings of his spoil. For they had golden earrings, because they were Ishmaelites. They answered, We will willingly give them. They spread a garment, and every man threw the earrings of his spoil into it. The weight of the golden earrings that he requested was one thousand and seven hundred shekels of gold, besides the crescents and the pendants and the purple clothing that was on the kings of Midian, and besides the chains that were about their camels' necks. Gideon made an ephod of it and put it in his city, even in Ophrah. And all Israel played the prostitute after it there, and it became a snare to Gideon and to his house. Forty Years of Peace So Midian was subdued before the children of Israel, and they lifted up their heads no more. The land had rest forty years in the days of Gideon. Jerub Baal, the son of Joash, went and lived in his own house. Gideon had seventy sons conceived from his body, for he had many wives. His concubine, who was in Shechem, she also bore him a son, and he named him Abimelech. Gideon's Death Gideon, the son of Joash, died in a good old age and was buried in the tomb of Joash his father, in Ophrah of the Abiezrites. It happened, as soon as Gideon was dead, that the children of Israel turned again, and played the prostitute after the Baals, and made Baal Berith their god. The children of Israel didn't remember Yahweh their god, who had delivered them out of the hand of all their enemies on every side. Neither did they show kindness to the house of Jeroboam, who is Gideon, according to all the goodness which he had shown to Israel. End of section 21. Chapter 9 Abimelech's Conspiracy Abimelech, the son of Jerob Baal, went to Shechem to his mother's brothers and spoke with them and with all the family of the house of his mother's father, saying, Please speak in the ears of all the men of Shechem. Is it better for you that all the sons of Jerob Baal, who are seventy persons, rule over you, or that one rule over you? Remember also that I am your bone and your flesh. His mother's brothers spoke of him in the ears of all the men of Shechem all these words, and their hearts inclined to follow Abimelech, for they said, He is our brother. They gave him seventy pieces of silver out of the house of baal Berith, with which Abimelech hired vain and light fellows who followed him. He went to his father's house at Ophrah and killed his brothers, the sons of Jerob Baal, being seventy persons, 
on one stone. But Jotham, the youngest son of Jerubbaal, was left, for he hid himself. All the men of Shechem assembled themselves together, and all the house of Milo, and went and made Abimelech king by the oak of the pillar that was in Shechem. Jotham's Parable When they told it to Jotham, he went and stood on the top of Mount Gerizim, and lifted up his voice, and cried, and said to them, Listen to me, you men of Shechem, that God may listen to you. The trees went forth on a time to anoint a king over them, and they said to the olive tree, Reign over us! But the olive tree said to them, Should I leave my fatness, with which by me they honor God and man, and go to wave back and forth over the trees? The tree said to the fig tree, Come and reign over us. But the fig tree said to them, Should I leave my sweetness and my good fruit, and go to wave back and forth over the trees? The tree said to the vine, Come and reign over us. The vine said to them, should I leave my new wine, which cheers God and man, and go to wave back and forth over the trees? Then all the trees said to the bramble, Come and reign over us. The bramble said to the trees, If in truth you anoint me king over you, then come and take refuge in my shade. And if not, let fire come out of the bramble and devour the cedars of Lebanon. Now, therefore, if you have dealt truly and righteously in that you have made Abimelech king, and if you have dealt well with Jerubbaal and his house, and have done to him according to the deserving of his hands, for my father fought for you and risked his life and delivered you out of the hand of Midian, and you have risen up against my father's house this day and have slain his sons, seventy persons, on one stone, and have made Abimelech, the son of his female servant, king over the men of Shechem, because he is your brother. If you then have dealt truly and righteously with Jerubbaal and with his house this day, then rejoice in Abimelech, and let him also rejoice in you. But if not, let fire come out from Abimelech and devour the men of Shechem and the house of Milo. And let fire come out from the men of Shechem, and from the house of Milo, and devour Abimelech. Jotham ran away, and fled, and went to Beer, and lived there for fear of Abimelech, his brother. Gael conspires with the Shechemites. Abimelech was prince over Israel three years. God sent an evil spirit between Abimelech and the men of Shechem, and the men of Shechem dealt treacherously with Abimelech, that the violence done to the seventy sons of Jerubbaal might come, and that their blood might be laid on Abimelech their brother, who killed them, and on the men of Shechem, who strengthened his hands to kill his brothers. The men of Shechem set an ambush for him on the tops of the mountains, and they robbed all who came along that way by them. And it was told Abimelech. Gael, the son of Ebed, came with his brothers and went over to Shechem, and the men of Shechem put their trust in him. They went out into the field and gathered their vineyards and trod the grapes and held festival and went into the house of their god and did eat and drink and cursed Abimelech. Gael, the son of Ebed, said, Who is Abimelech, and who is Shechem, that we should serve him? Isn't he the son of Jerubbaal, and Zebul his officer? Serve the men of Hamor, the father of Shechem. But why should we serve him? Would that this people were under my hand, then I would remove Abimelech. He said to Abimelech, Increase your army, and come out. When Zebul, the ruler of the city, heard the words of Gael, the son of Ebed, 
his anger was kindled. He sent messengers to Abimelech craftily, saying, Behold, Gael, the son of Ebed, and his brothers are come to Shechem. And behold, they constrain the city to take part against you. Now, therefore, go up by night, you and the people who are with you, and lie in wait in the field. And it shall be that in the morning, as soon as the sun is up, you shall rise early and rush on the city. And behold, when he and the people who are with him come out against you, then may you do to them as you shall find occasion. Abimelech sows the city with salt. Abimelech rose up, and all the people who were with him, by night, and they laid wait against Shechem in four companies. Gael, the son of Ebed, went out, and stood in the entrance of the gate of the city. And Abimelech rose up, and the people who were with him, from the ambush. When Gael saw the people, he said to Zebul, Behold, people are coming down from the tops of the mountains. Zebul said to him, You see the shadow of the mountains as if they were men. Gael spoke again and said, Behold, people are coming down by the middle of the land, and one company comes by the way of the oak of Meonanim. Then Zebul said to him, Now where is your mouth, that you said, Who is Abimelech, that we should serve him? Isn't this the people that you have despised? Please go out now and fight with them. Gael went out before the men of Shechem and fought with Abimelech. Abimelech chased him, and he fled before him, and many fell wounded, even to the entrance of the gate. Abimelech lived at Aruma, and Zebul drove out Gael and his brothers, that they should not dwell in Shechem. It happened on the next day that the people went out into the field, and they told Abimelech. He took the people and divided them into three companies, and laid wait in the field. And he looked, and behold, the people came forth out of the city. He rose up against them and struck them. Abimelech and the companies that were with him rushed forward and stood in the entrance of the gate of the city. And the two companies rushed on all who were in the field, and struck them. Abimelech fought against the city all that day, and he took the city, and killed the people who were therein. And he beat down the city, and sowed it with salt. When all the men of the tower of Shechem heard of it, they entered into the stronghold of the house of Elberith. It was told Abimelech that all the men of the tower of Shechem were gathered together. Abimelech went up to Mount Zalman, he and all the people who were with him. And Abimelech took an axe in his hand, and cut down a bough from the trees, and took it up, and laid it on his shoulder. And he said to the people who were with him, What you have seen me do, make haste, and do as I have done. All the people likewise each cut down his bow, and followed Abimelech, and put them at the base of the stronghold, and set the stronghold on fire on them, so that all the people of the tower of Shechem died also, about a thousand men and women. A millstone dropped on Abimelech. Then went Abimelech to Thebes, and encamped against Thebes, and took it. But there was a strong tower within the city, and there fled all the men and women, and all they of the city, and shut themselves in, and went up to the roof of the tower. Abimelech came to the tower, and fought against it, and drew near to the door of the tower to burn it with fire. A certain woman cast an upper millstone on Abimelech's head, and broke his skull. Then he called hastily to the young man, his armor-bearer, and said to him, Draw your sword and kill me, that men not say of me, a woman killed him. His young man thrust him through, and he died. When the men of Israel saw that Abimelech was dead, 
they departed, every man to his place. Jotham's Curse Fulfilled Thus God requited the wickedness of Abimelech, which he did to his father, in killing his seventy brothers. And all the wickedness of the men of Shechem did God requite on their heads. And on them came the curse of Jotham, the son of Jeroboam. Chapter 10 Tola Leads Israel After Abimelech, there arose to save Israel Tola, the son of Pua, the son of Dodo, a man of Issachar. And he lived in Shamer, in the hill country of Ephraim. He judged Israel twenty-three years, and died, and was buried in Shamer. Jair leads Israel. After him arose Jair, the Gileadite, and he judged Israel twenty-two years. He had thirty sons who rode on thirty donkey coats, and they had thirty cities, which are called Havoth Jair to this day, which are in the land of Gilead. Jair died and was buried in Canaan. Philistine and Ammonite Oppression The children of Israel again did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and served the Baals and the Ashtaroth, and the gods of Syria, and the gods of Sidon, and the gods of Moab, and the gods of the children of Ammon, and the gods of the Philistines. And they forsook Yahweh, and didn't serve him. The anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he sold them into the hand of the Philistines and into the hand of the children of Ammon. They troubled and oppressed the children of Israel that year. Eighteen years oppressed they all the children of Israel that were beyond the Jordan in the land of the Amorites, which is in Gilead. The children of Ammon passed over the Jordan, to fight also against Judah, and against Benjamin, and against the house of Ephraim, so that Israel was very distressed. The children of Israel cried to Yahweh, saying, We have sinned against you, even because we have forsaken our God, and have served the Baals. Yahweh said to the children of Israel, Didn't I save you? from the Egyptians, and from the Amorites, from the children of Ammon, and from the Philistines, the Sidonians also, and the Amalekites, and the Mayanites did oppress you, and you cried to me, and I saved you out of their hand. Yet you have forsaken me, and served other gods. Therefore I will save you no more. Go and cry to the gods which you have chosen. Let them save you in the time of your distress. The children of Israel said to Yahweh, We have sinned. Do you to us whatever seems good to you. Only deliver us, please, this day. They put away the foreign gods from among them and served Yahweh and his soul was grieved for the misery of Israel. Then the children of Ammon were gathered together and encamped in Gilead. The children of Israel assembled themselves together and encamped in Mizpah. The people, the princes of Gilead, said one to another, What man is he who will begin to fight against the children of Ammon? He shall be head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Chapter 11 Jephthah Delivers Israel Now Jephthah the Gileadite was a mighty man of valor, and he was the son of a prostitute. And Gilead became the father of Jephthah. Gilead's wife bore him sons. 
And when his wife's sons grew up, they drove out Jephthah and said to him, You shall not inherit in our father's house, for you are the son of another woman. Then Jephthah fled from his brothers and lived in the land of Tob. And there were gathered vain fellows to Jephthah, and they went out with him. It happened after a while that the children of Ammon made war against Israel. It was so that when the children of Ammon made war against Israel, the elders of Gilead went to get Jephthah out of the land of Tob. And they said to Jephthah, Come and be our chief, that we may fight with the children of Ammon. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, Didn't you hate me and drive me out of my father's house? Why have you come to me now when you are in distress? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, Therefore we have turned again to you now, that you may go with us and fight with the children of Ammon, and you shall be our head over all the inhabitants of Gilead. Jephthah said to the elders of Gilead, If you bring me home again to fight with the children of Ammon, and Yahweh deliver them before me, shall I be your head? The elders of Gilead said to Jephthah, Yahweh shall be witness between us. Surely, according to your word, so will we do. Then Jephthah went with the elders of Gilead, and the people made him head and chief over them. And Jephthah spoke all his words before Yahweh in Mizpah. Jephthah sent messengers to the king of the children of Ammon, saying, what have you to do with me, that you have come to me to fight against my land? The king of the children of Ammon answered to the messengers of Jephthah, Because Israel took away my land when he came up out of Egypt, from the Arnon, even to the Jabbok, and to the Jordan. Now, therefore, restore those lands again, peaceably. Jephthah sent messengers again to the king of the children of Ammon, and he said to them, Thus says Jephthah, Israel didn't take away the land of Moab, nor the land of the children of Ammon. But when they came up from Egypt, and Israel went through the wilderness to the Red Sea, and came to Kadesh, then Israel sent messengers to the king of Edom, saying, Please, let me pass through your land. But the king of Edom didn't listen. In the same way, he sent to the king of Moab, but he would not, and Israel stayed in Kadesh. Then they went through the wilderness and went around the land of Edom and the land of Moab and came by the east side of the land of Moab, and they encamped on the other side of the Arnon, but they didn't come within the border of Moab, for the Arnon was the border of Moab. Israel sent messengers to Sihon, king of the Amorites, the king of Heshbon. And Israel said to him, Please let us pass through your land to my place. But Sihon didn't trust Israel to pass through his border. But Sihon gathered all his people together and encamped in Jahaz, and fought against Israel. Yahweh, the God of Israel, delivered Sihon and all his people into the hand of Israel, and they struck them. So Israel possessed all the land of the Amorites, the inhabitants of that country. They possessed all the border of the Amorites, from the Arnon even to the Jabbok, and from the wilderness even to the Jordan. So now Yahweh, the God of Israel, has dispossessed the Amorites from before his people Israel. And should you possess them? Won't you possess that which Chemosh, your God, gives you to possess? So whoever Yahweh our God has dispossessed from before us, them we will possess. Now are you anything better than Balak, the son of Zippor, king of Moab? Did he ever strive against Israel, or did he ever fight against them? While Israel lived in Heshbon, and its towns, and Aror, and its towns, 
and in all the cities that are along by the side of the Arnon, three hundred years. Why didn't you recover them within that time? I therefore have not sinned against you, but you do me wrong to war against me. Yahweh, the judge, be judge this day between the children of Israel and the children of Ammon. However, the king of the children of Ammon didn't listen to the words of Jephthah, which he sent him. Jephthah's Tragic Vow Then the Spirit of Yahweh came on Jephthah, and he passed over Gilead and Manasseh, and passed over Mizpeh of Gilead, and from Mizpeh of Gilead he passed over to the children of Ammon. Jephthah vowed a vow to Yahweh and said, If you will indeed deliver the children of Ammon into my hand, then it shall be that whatever comes forth from the doors of my house to meet me when I return in peace from the children of Ammon, it shall be Yahweh's, and I will offer it up for a burnt offering. So Jephthah passed over to the children of Ammon to fight against them, and Yahweh delivered them into his hand. He struck them from Aurora until you come to Mineth, even twenty cities, and to ebel Karamim, with a very great slaughter. So the children of Ammon were subdued before the children of Israel. Jephthah came to Mizpah, to his house, and behold, his daughter came out to meet him with tambourines and with dances, and she was his only child. Besides her, he had neither son nor daughter. It happened when he saw her that he tore his clothes and said, Alas, my daughter, you have brought me very low, and you are one of those who trouble me, for I have opened my mouth to Yahweh, and I can't go back. She said to him, My father, you have opened your mouth to Yahweh, do to me according to that which has proceeded out of your mouth, because Yahweh has taken vengeance for you on your enemies, even on the children of Ammon. She said to her father, Let this thing be done for me. Let me alone two months, that I may depart and go down on the mountains, and bewail my virginity, I and my companions. He said, Go. He sent her away for two months, and she departed, she and her companions, and mourned her virginity on the mountains. It happened at the end of two months that she returned to her father, who did with her according to his vow which he had vowed, and she was a virgin. It was a custom in Israel that the daughters of Israel went yearly to celebrate the daughter of Jephthah, the Gileadite, four days in a year. Chapter 12 Jephthah Defeats Ephraim The men of Ephraim were gathered together and passed northward, and they said to Jephthah, Why did you pass over to fight against the children of Ammon and didn't call us to go with you? We will burn your house around you with fire. Jephthah said to them, I and my people were at great strife with the children of Ammon, and when I called you, you didn't save me out of their hand. When I saw that you didn't save me, I put my life in my hand and passed over against the children of Ammon, and Yahweh delivered them into my hand. Why then have you come up to me this day to fight against me? Then Jephthah gathered together all the men of Gilead and fought with Ephraim. And the men of Gilead struck Ephraim, because they said, You are fugitives of Ephraim, you Gileadites. In the midst of Ephraim and in the midst of Manasseh, the Gileadites took the fords of the Jordan against the Ephraimites. It was so that when any of the fugitives of Ephraim said, Let me go over, the men of Gilead said to him, Are you an Ephraimite? If he said, No, 
Then they said to him, Now say, Shibboleth. And he said, Sibboleth, for he couldn't manage to pronounce it right. Then they laid hold of him and killed him at the fords of the Jordan. At that time, 42,000 of Ephraim fell. Jephthah judged Israel six years. Then died Jephthah, the Gileadite, and was buried in one of the cities of Gilead. Ibzan, Elon, and Abdon. After him, Ibzan of Bethlehem judged Israel. He had thirty sons and thirty daughters he sent abroad, and thirty daughters he brought in from abroad for his sons. He judged Israel seven years. Ibzan died and was buried in Bethlehem. After him, Elon, the Zebulonite, judged Israel, and he judged Israel ten years. Elon, the Zebulonite, died and was buried in Ajalon, in the land of Zebulon. After him, Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirithonite, judged Israel. He had forty sons and thirty sons' sons who rode on seventy donkey colts, and he judged Israel eight years. Abdon, the son of Hillel, the Pirithonite, died and was buried in Pirithon, in the land of Ephraim, in the hill country of the Amalekites. Chapter 13 The Birth of Samson the children of Israel again did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh. And Yahweh delivered them into the hand of the Philistines forty years. There was a certain man of Zorah, of the family of the Danites, whose name was Manoah, and his wife was barren and didn't bear. The angel of Yahweh appeared to the woman and said to her, See now. You are barren, and don't bear, but you shall conceive, and bear a son. Now therefore, please beware, and drink no wine, nor strong drink, and don't eat any unclean thing. For, behold, you shall conceive, and bear a son, and no razor shall come on his head. For the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb, and he shall begin to save Israel out of the hand of the Philistines. Then the woman came and told her husband, saying, A man of God came to me, and his face was like the face of the angel of God, very awesome, and I didn't ask him where he was from, neither did he tell me his name. But he said to me, Behold, you shall conceive and bear a son, and now drink no wine nor strong drink, and eat not any unclean thing, for the child shall be a Nazarite to God from the womb to the day of his death. Then Manoah entreated Yahweh and said, O oh Lord, please let the man of God whom you did send come again to us, and teach us what we shall do to the child who shall be born. God listened to the voice of Manoah, and the angel of God came again to the woman, as she sat in the field. But Manoah, her husband, wasn't with her. The woman made haste and ran, and told her husband, and said to him, Behold, the man has appeared to me, who came to me the other day. Manoah arose, and went after his wife, and came to the man, and said to him, Are you the man who spoke to the woman? He said, I am. Manoah said, Now let your words happen. What shall be the ordering of the child, and how shall we do to him? The angel of Yahweh said to Manoah, Of all that I said to the woman, let her beware. She may not eat of anything that comes of the vine. Neither let her drink wine 
or strong drink, nor eat any unclean thing. All that I commanded her, let her observe. Manoah said to the angel of Yahweh, Please, let us detain you, that we may make a young goat ready for you. The angel of Yahweh said to Manoah, Though you detain me, I won't eat of your bread, and if you will prepare a burnt offering, you must offer it to Yahweh. For Manoah didn't know that he was the angel of Yahweh. Manoah said to the angel of Yahweh, What is your name, that when your words happen, we may honor you? The angel of Yahweh said to him, Why do you ask about my name, since it is wonderful? So Manoah took the young goat with the meal offering and offered it on the rock to Yahweh. And the angel did wondrously, and Manoah and his wife looked on. For it happened, when the flame went up toward the sky from off the altar, that the angel of Yahweh ascended in the flame of the altar. And Manoah and his wife looked on, and they fell on their faces to the ground. But the angel of Yahweh did no more appear to Manoah or to his wife. Then Manoah knew that he was the angel of Yahweh. Manoah said to his wife, We shall surely die, because we have seen God. But his wife said to him, If Yahweh were pleased to kill us, he wouldn't have received a burnt offering and a meal offering at our hand. Neither would he have shown us all these things, nor would at this time have told such things as these. The woman bore a son and named him Samson. And the child grew, and Yahweh blessed him. The spirit of Yahweh began to move him in Mahanidan, between Zorah and Eshtaol. Chapter 14 Samson's Marriage Samson went down to Timnah, and saw a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. He came up and told his father and his mother, and said, I have seen a woman in Timnah of the daughters of the Philistines. Now, therefore, get her for me as wife. Then his father and his mother said to him, Is there never a woman among the daughters of your brothers, or among all my people, that you go to take a wife of the uncircumcised Philistines? Samson said to his father, Get her for me for she pleases me well. But his father and his mother didn't know that it was of Yahweh, for he sought an occasion against the Philistines. Now at that time the Philistines had rule over Israel. Then went Samson down, and his father and his mother, to Timnah, and came to the vineyards of Timnah. And behold, a young lion roared against him, the Spirit of Yahweh came mightily on him, and he tore him as he would have torn a young goat, and he had nothing in his hand. But he didn't tell his father or his mother what he had done. He went down and talked with the woman, and she pleased Samson well. Samson's Riddle After a while he returned to take her and he turned aside to see the carcass of the lion. And behold, there was a swarm of bees in the body of the lion, and honey. He took it into his hands and went on, eating as he went. And he came to his father and mother, and gave to them, and they ate. But he didn't tell them that he had taken the honey out of the body of the lion. His father went down to the woman, and Samson made there a feast for so used the young men to do. It happened, when they saw him, that they brought thirty companions to be with him. Samson said to them, Let me tell you a riddle now. If you can declare it to me within the seven days of the feast, and find it out, then I will give you thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothing. But if you can't declare it to me, then you shall give me thirty linen garments and thirty changes of clothing. They said to him, Put forth your riddle, that we may hear it. 
he said to them, Out of the eater came forth food, out of the strong came forth sweetness. They couldn't in three days declare the riddle. It happened on the seventh day that they said to Samson's wife, Entice your husband that he may declare to us the riddle, lest we burn you and your father's house with fire. Have you called us to impoverish us? Is it not so? Samson's wife wept before him and said, You just hate me and you don't love me. You have put forth a riddle to the children of my people and haven't told it me. He said to her, Behold, I haven't told it my father nor my mother, and shall I tell you? She wept before him the seven days while their feast lasted, and it happened on the seventh day that he told her, because she pressed him severely, and she told the riddle to the children of her people. The men of the city said to him on the seventh day before the sun went down, What is sweeter than honey? What is stronger than a lion? He said to them, If you hadn't plowed with my heifer, you wouldn't have found out my riddle. The spirit of Yahweh came mightily on him, and he went down to Ashkelon and struck thirty men of them and took their spoil and gave the changes of clothing to those who declared the riddle. His anger was kindled, and he went up to his father's house. But Samson's wife was given to his companion, whom he had used as his friend. Chapter 15 Samson Denied His Wife But it happened after a while, in the time of wheat harvest, that Samson visited his wife with a young goat. And he said, I will go in to my wife into the room. But her father wouldn't allow him to go in. Her father said, I most certainly thought that you had utterly hated her. Therefore, I gave her to your companion. Isn't her younger sister more beautiful than she? Please take her instead. Samson defeats the Philistines. Samson said to them, this time I will be blameless in regard of the Philistines when I harm them. Samson went and caught three hundred foxes and took torches and turned tail to tail and put a torch in the midst between every two tails. When he had set the brands on fire, he let them go into the standing grain of the Philistines and burnt up both the shocks and the standing grain and also the olive groves. Then the Philistines said, Who has done this? They said, Samson, the son-in-law of the Timnite, because he has taken his wife and given her to his companion. The Philistines came up and burnt her and her father with fire. Samson said to them, If you behave like this, surely I will be avenged of you and after that I will cease. He struck them hip and thigh with a great slaughter, and he went down and lived in the cleft of the rock of Edom. Then the Philistines went up and encamped in Judah and spread themselves in Lehi. The men of Judah said, Why have you come up against us? They said, We have come up to bind Samson, to do to him, as he has done to us. Then three thousand men of Judah went down to the cleft of the rock of Edom and said to Samson, Don't you know that the Philistines are rulers over us? What then is this that you have done to us? He said to them, As they did to me, so have I done to them. They said to him, We have come down to bind you that we may deliver you into the hand of the Philistines. Samson said to them, Swear to me that you will not fall on me yourselves. They spoke to him, saying, No, but we will bind you fast and deliver you into their hand, but surely we will not kill you. 
they bound him with two new ropes and brought him up from the rock. When he came to Lehi, the Philistines shouted as they met him, and the Spirit of Yahweh came mightily on him, and the ropes that were on his arms became as flax that was burnt with fire, and his bands dropped from off his hands. He found a fresh jawbone of a donkey, and put forth his hand and took it, and struck a thousand men therewith. Samson said, With the jawbone of a donkey, heaps on heaps, with the jawbone of a donkey, I have struck a thousand men. It happened, when he had made an end of speaking, that he cast away the jawbone out of his hand, and that place was called Ramoth Lehi. He was very thirsty and called on Yahweh and said, You have given this great deliverance by the hand of your servant, and now shall I die for thirst and fall into the hand of the uncircumcised? But God split the hollow place that is in Lehi, and water came out of it. When he had drunk, his spirit came again, and he revived. Therefore its name was called in Hakori, which is in Lehi, to this day. He judged Israel in the days of the Philistines twenty years. Chapter 16 Samson Escapes Gaza Samson went to Gaza, and saw there a prostitute, and went in to her. It was told the Gazites, saying, Samson is here. They surrounded him and laid wait for him all night in the gate of the city and were quiet all the night, saying, Let be until morning light, then we will kill him. Samson lay until midnight and arose at midnight and laid hold of the doors of the gate of the city and the two posts and plucked them up, bar and all, and put them on his shoulders and carried them up to the top of the mountain that is before Hebron. Samson and Delilah It came to pass afterward that he loved a woman in the valley of Sorek, whose name was Delilah. The lords of the Philistines came up to her and said to her, Entice him, and see in which his great strength lies and by what means we may prevail against him, that we may bind him to afflict him, and we will each give you eleven hundred pieces of silver. Delilah said to Samson, Please tell me where your great strength lies, and what you might be bound to afflict you. Samson said to her, If they bind me with seven green cords that were never dried, then shall I become weak and be as another man. Then the lords of the Philistines brought up to her seven green cords which had not been dried, and she bound him with them. Now she had an ambush waiting in the inner room. She said to him, The Philistines are on you, Samson! He broke the cords as a string of tow is broken when it touches the fire. So his strength was not known. Delilah said to Samson, Behold, you have mocked me and told me lies. Now please tell me with which you might be bound. He said to her, If they only bind me with new ropes, with which no work has been done, then shall I become weak and be as another man. So Delilah took new ropes and bound him therewith, and said to him, The Philistines are on you, Samson! The ambush was waiting in the inner room. He broke them off his arms like a thread. Delilah said to Samson, Until now you have mocked me and told me lies. Tell me with what you might be bound. He said to her, If you weave the seven locks of my head with the web. She fastened it with the pin and said to him, The Philistines are on you, Samson! He awakened out of his sleep and plucked away the pin of the beam and the web.
Delilah discovers the secret. She said to him, How can you say, I love you, when your heart is not with me? You have mocked me these three times and have not told me where your great strength lies. It happened when she pressed him daily with her words and urged him that his soul was troubled to death. He told her all his heart and said to her, No razor has ever come on my head, for I have been a Nazarite to God from my mother's womb. If I am shaved, then my strength will go from me, and I will become weak and be like any other man. When Delilah saw that he had told her all his heart, she sent and called for the lords of the Philistines, saying, Come up this once, for he has told me all his heart. Then the lords of the Philistines came up to her and brought the money in their hand. She made him sleep on her knees, and she called for a man and shaved off the seven locks of his head. And she began to afflict him, and his strength went from him. She said, The Philistines are upon you, Samson. He awoke out of his sleep and said, I will go out as at other times and shake myself free. But he didn't know that Yahweh had departed from him. The Philistines laid hold on him and put out his eyes, and they brought him down to Gaza and bound him with fetters of brass, and he ground at the mill in the prison. However, the hair of his head began to grow again after he was shaved. Samson's Vengeance and Death the lords of the Philistines gathered them together to offer a great sacrifice to Dagon their god and to rejoice. For they said, Our god has delivered Samson, our enemy, into our hand. When the people saw him, they praised their god. For they said, Our god has delivered our enemy and the destroyer of our country who has slain many of us into our hand. It happened when their hearts were merry that they said, Call for Samson that he may entertain us. They called for Samson out of the prison, and he performed before them. They set him between the pillars, and Samson said to the boy who held him by the hand, Allow me to fill the pillars whereupon the house rests, that I may lean on them. Now the house was full of men and women, and all the lords of the Philistines were there. And there were on the roof about three thousand men and women who saw while Samson performed. Samson called to Yahweh and said, Lord Yahweh, remember me, please, and strengthen me, please, only this once, God, that I may be at once avenged of the Philistines for my two eyes. Samson took hold of the two middle pillars on which the house rested and leaned on them, the one with his right hand and the other with his left. Samson said, Let me die with the Philistines. He bowed himself with all his might, and the house fell on the lords and on all the people who were therein. So the dead that he killed at his death were more than those who he killed in his life. Then his brothers and all the house of his father came down and took him and brought him up and buried him between Zorah and Eshtaol in the burial site of Manoah, his father. He judged Israel twenty years. Chapter 17 Micah's Idolatry there was a man of the hill country of Ephraim, whose name was Micah. He said to his mother, The eleven hundred pieces of silver that were taken from you, about which you uttered a curse, and also spoke it in my ears. Behold, the silver is with me. I took it. His mother said, Blessed be my son of Yahweh. He restored the eleven hundred pieces of silver to his mother. And his mother said, 
I most certainly dedicate the silver to Yahweh from my hand for my son, to make an engraved image and a molten image. Now, therefore, I will restore it to you. When he restored the money to his mother, his mother took two hundred pieces of silver and gave them to the founder, who made of it an engraved image and a molten image. And it was in the house of Micah. The man Micah had a house of gods, and he made an ephod and teraphim, and consecrated one of his sons, who became his priest. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. There was a young man out of Bethlehem, Judah, of the family of Judah, who was a Levite, and he lived there. The man departed out of the city, out of Bethlehem, Judah, to live where he could find a place. And he came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, as he traveled. Micah said to him, Where did you come from? He said to him, I am a Levite of Bethlehem, Judah, and I am looking for a place to live. Micah said to him, Dwell with me, and be to me a father and a priest, and I will give you ten pieces of silver per year, a suit of clothing, and your food. So the Levite went in. The Levite was content to dwell with the man, and the young man was to him as one of his sons. Micah consecrated the Levite, and the young man became his priest, and was in the house of Micah. Then Micah said, Now know I that Yahweh will do good to me, since I have a Levite as my priest. Chapter 18 The Danites Settle in Laish In those days there was no king in Israel. And in those days the tribe of the Danites sought them an inheritance to dwell in. For to that day their inheritance had not fallen to them among the tribes of Israel. The children of Dan sent of their family five men from their whole number, men of valor, from Zorah and from Eshtaol, to spy out the land and to search it. And they said to them, Go! Explore the land. They came to the hill country of Ephraim, to the house of Micah, and lodged there. When they were by the house of Micah, they knew the voice of the young man, the Levite, and they turned aside there and said to him, Who brought you here? What do you do in this place? What do you have here? He said to them, Thus and thus has Micah dealt with me, and he has hired me, and I am become his priest. They said to him, Please ask counsel of God, that we may know whether our way which we go shall be prosperous. The priest said to them, Go in peace. Your way in which you go is before Yahweh. Then the five men departed and came to Laish and saw the people who were therein how they lived in security, in the way of the Sidonians, quiet and secure. For there was none in the land possessing authority that might put them to shame in anything, and they were far from the Sidonians and had no dealings with any man. They came to their brothers, to Zorah and Eshtaol, and their brothers said to them, What do you say? They said, Arise! And let us go up against them, for we have seen the land, and behold, it is very good. Do you stand still? Don't be slothful to go and to enter in to possess the land. When you go, you shall come to a secure people, and the land is large, for God has given it into your hand, a place where there is no want of anything that is in the earth. There set forth from there of the family of the Danites, out of Zorah and out of Eshtaol, six hundred men girt with weapons of war. They went up and encamped in Kiriath-Jerim, in Judah. Therefore they called that place Mahanetan to this day. Behold, it is behind Kiriath-Jerim. 
they passed there to the hill country of Ephraim and came to the house of Micah. Danites take Micah's idols. Then the five men who went to spy out the country of Laish answered and said to their brothers, do you know that there is in these houses an ephod, and teraphim, and an engraved image, and a molten image? Now, therefore, consider what you have to do. They turned aside there, and came to the house of the young man, the Levite, even to the house of Micah, and asked him of his welfare. The six hundred men, girt with their weapons of war, who were of the children of Dan, stood by the entrance of the gate. The five men who went to spy out the land went up and came in there and took the engraved image and the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image. And the priest stood by the entrance of the gate with the six hundred men girt with weapons of war. When these went into Micah's house and fetched the engraved image, the ephod and the teraphim and the molten image, the priest said to them, What are you doing? They said to him, Hold your peace, put your hand on your mouth, and go with us, and be to us a father and a priest. Is it better for you to be priest to the house of one man, or to be priest to a tribe and a family in Israel? The priest's heart was glad, and he took the ephod and the teraphim and the engraved image, and went in the midst of the people. So they turned and departed and put the little ones and the livestock and the goods before them. When they were a good way from the house of Micah, the men who were in the houses near to Micah's house were gathered together and overtook the children of Dan. They cried to the children of Dan. They turned their faces and said to Micah, What ails you that you come with such a company? He said, You have taken away my gods which I made and the priest, and have gone away, and what more do I have? How then do you say to me, What ails you? The children of Dan said to him, Don't let your voice be heard among us, lest angry fellows fall on you, and you lose your life with the lives of your household. The children of Dan went their way, and when Micah saw that they were too strong for him, he turned and went back to his house. They took that which Micah had made, and the priest whom he had, and came to Laish, to a people quiet and secure, and struck them with the edge of the sword, and they burnt the city with fire. There was no deliverer, because it was far from Sidon, and they had no dealings with any man, and it was in the valley that lies by beth -Reub. They built the city and lived therein. They called the name of the city Dan, after the name of Dan, their father, who was born to Israel. However, the name of the city was Laish at the first. The children of Dan set up for themselves the engraved image, and Jonathan, the son of Gershom, the son of Moses, he and his sons were priests to the tribe of the Danites until the day of the captivity of the land. So they set them up, Micah's engraved image which he made, all the time that the house of God was in Shiloh. Chapter 19 The Levite and His Concubine It happened in those days, when there was no king in Israel, that there was a certain Levite living on the farther side of the hill country of Ephraim, who took to him a concubine out of Bethlehem, Judah. His concubine played the prostitute against him and went away from him to her father's house, to Bethlehem, Judah, and was there the space of four months. Her husband arose and went after her to speak kindly to her, to bring her again, having his servant with him and a couple of donkeys, and she brought him into her father's house. And when the father of the young lady saw him, he rejoiced to meet him. His father-in-law, the young lady's father, retained him, and he stayed with him three days. 
So they ate and drank and lodged there. It happened on the fourth day that they arose early in the morning, and he rose up to depart. And the young lady's father said to his son-in-law, Strengthen your heart with a morsel of bread, and afterward you shall go your way. So they sat down, ate, and drank, both of them together. And the young lady's father said to the man, Please, be pleased to stay all night, and let your heart be merry. The man rose up to depart, but his father-in-law urged him, and he lodged there again. He arose early in the morning on the fifth day to depart, and the young lady's father said, Please, strengthen your heart and stay until the day declines. And they both ate. When the man rose up to depart, he and his concubine and his servant, his father-in-law, the young lady's father, said to him, Behold, now the day draws toward evening. Please stay all night. Behold, the day grows to an end. Lodge here that your heart may be merry, and tomorrow go on your way early, that you may go home. But the man wouldn't stay that night, but he rose up and departed, and came over against Jebus. The same is Jerusalem. And there were with him a couple of donkeys saddled. His concubine also was with him. When they were by Jebus, the day was far spent, and the servant said to his master, Please come and let us turn aside into this city of the Jebusites and lodge in it. His master said to him, We won't turn aside into the city of a foreigner, that is not of the children of Israel, but we will pass over to Gibeah. He said to his servant, Come and let us draw near to one of these places, and we will lodge in Gibeah or in Ramah. So they passed on and went their way, and the sun went down on them near to Gibeah, which belongs to Benjamin. They turned aside there to go in to lodge in Gibeah, and he went in and set him down in the street of the city, for there was no man who took them into his house to lodge. Behold, there came an old man from his work out of the field at evening, now the man was of the hill country of Ephraim, and he lived in Gibeah. But the men of the place were Benjamites. He lifted up his eyes and saw the wayfaring man in the street of the city, and the old man said, Where are you going? Where did you come from? He said to him, We are passing from Bethlehem, Judah, to the farther side of the hill country of Ephraim. I am from there. And I went to Bethlehem, Judah. I am going to the house of Yahweh, and there is no man who takes me into his house. Yet there is both straw and provender for our donkeys, and there is bread and wine also for me, and for your handmaid, and for the young man who is with your servants. There is no want of anything. The old man said, Peace be to you. Howsoever, let all your wants lie on me. Only don't lodge in the street. So he brought him into his house and gave the donkeys fodder, and they washed their feet and ate and drank. Gibeah's Crime As they were making their hearts merry, behold, the men of the city, certain base fellows, surrounded the house, beating at the door, and they spoke to the master of the house the old man, saying, Bring out the man who came into your house, that we may have sex with him. The man, the master of the house, went out to them and said to them, No, my brothers, please don't act so wickedly, since this man has come into my house. Don't do this folly. Behold, here is my virgin daughter and his concubine. I will bring them out now. Humble them, and do with them what seems good to you. But to this man, don't do any such folly. But the man wouldn't listen to him. So the man laid hold of his concubine and brought her out to them, 
and they had sex with her and abused her all night until the morning. And when the day began to dawn, they let her go. Then came the woman in the dawning of the day and fell down at the door of the man's house where her Lord was until it was light. Her Lord rose up in the morning and opened the doors of the house and went out to go his way. And behold, the woman, his concubine, was fallen down at the door of the house with her hands on the threshold. He said to her, Get up and let us be going. But no one answered. Then he took her up on the donkey, and the man rose up and went to his place. When he was come into his house, he took a knife and laid hold on his concubine and divided her limb by limb into twelve pieces and sent her throughout all the borders of Israel. It was so that all who saw it said, there was no such deed done nor seen from the day that the children of Israel came up out of the land of Egypt to this day. Consider it, take counsel, and speak. End of section 22「The Decree of the Assembly」Then all the children of Israel went out, and the congregation was assembled as one man, from Dan even to Beersheba, with the land of Gilead, to Yahweh at Mizpah. The chiefs of all the people, even of all the tribes of Israel, presented themselves in the assembly of the people of God, four hundred thousand footmen who drew sword. Now the children of Benjamin heard that the children of Israel had gone up to Mizpah. The children of Israel said, Tell us, how did this wickedness happen? The Levite, the husband of the woman who was murdered, answered, I came into Gibeah that belongs to Benjamin, I and my concubine, to lodge. The men of Gibeah rose against me, and surrounded the house by night. They thought to have slain me, and they forced my concubine, and she is dead. I took my concubine, and cut her in pieces, and sent her throughout all the country of the inheritance of Israel, for they have committed lewdness and folly in Israel. Behold, you children of Israel, all of you, give here your advice and counsel. All the people arose as one man, saying, We will not any of us go to his tent, neither will we any of us turn to his house. But now this is the thing which we will do to Gibeah. We will go up against it by lot, and we will take ten men of one hundred throughout all the tribes of Israel, and one hundred of one thousand, and a thousand out of ten thousand, to get food for the people that they may do when they come to Gibeah of Benjamin, according to all the folly that they have worked in Israel. So all the men of Israel were gathered against the city, knit together as one man. The tribes of Israel sent men through all the tribe of Benjamin, saying, What wickedness is this that has happened among you? Now, therefore, deliver up the men, the base fellows who are in Gibeah, that we may put them to death and put away evil from Israel. But Benjamin would not listen to the voice of their brothers, the children of Israel. The children of Benjamin gathered themselves together out of the cities to Gibeah to go out to battle against the children of Israel. The children of Benjamin were numbered on that day out of the cities 26,000 men who drew the sword, besides the inhabitants of Gibeah who were numbered seven hundred chosen men. Among all this people, there were seven hundred chosen men left-handed. Everyone could sling stones at a hair breadth and not miss. The men of Israel, besides Benjamin, were numbered four hundred thousand men who drew sword. All these were men of war. Civil War Against Benjamin
the children of Israel arose and went up to Bethel and asked counsel of God. And they said, Who shall go up for us first to battle against the children of Benjamin? Yahweh said, Judah shall go up first. The children of Israel rose up in the morning and encamped against Gibeah. The men of Israel went out to battle against Benjamin, and the men of Israel set the battle in array against them at Gibeah. The children of Benjamin came forth out of Gibeah and destroyed down to the ground of the Israelites on that day 22,000 men. The people, the men of Israel, encouraged themselves and set the battle again in array in the place where they set themselves in array the first day. The children of Israel went up and wept before Yahweh until evening, and they asked of Yahweh, saying, Shall I again draw near to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother? Yahweh said, Go up against him. Defeat of the Benjamites The children of Israel came near against the children of Benjamin the second day. Benjamin went forth against them out of Gibeah the second day and destroyed down to the ground of the children of Israel again 18,000 men. All these drew the sword. Then all the children of Israel and all the people went up and came to Bethel and wept and sat there before Yahweh and fasted that day until evening. And they offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before Yahweh. The children of Israel asked of Yahweh, for the Ark of the Covenant of God was there in those days. And Phinehas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, stood before it in those days, saying, Shall I yet again go out to battle against the children of Benjamin, my brother, or shall I cease? Yahweh said, Go up, for tomorrow I will deliver him into your hand. Israel set ambushes all around Gibeah. The children of Israel went up against the children of Benjamin on the third day and set themselves in array against Gibeah as at other times. The children of Benjamin went out against the people and were drawn away from the city and they began to strike and kill of the people, as at other times, in the highways, of which one goes up to Bethel, and the other to Gibeah, in the field, about thirty men of Israel. The children of Benjamin said, They are struck down before us, as at the first. But the children of Israel said, Let us flee, and draw them away from the city, to the highways. All the men of Israel rose up out of their place and set themselves in array at Baal Tamer, and the ambushes of Israel broke forth out of their place, even out of Meareh Geba. There came over against Gibeah ten thousand chosen men out of all Israel, and the battle was severe, but they didn't know that evil was close on them. Yahweh struck Benjamin before Israel, and the children of Israel destroyed of Benjamin that day 25,100 men. All these drew the sword. So the children of Benjamin saw that they were struck, for the men of Israel gave place to Benjamin, because they trusted the ambushers whom they had set against Gibeah. The ambushers harried and rushed on Gibeah, and the ambushers drew themselves along and struck all the city with the edge of the sword. Now the appointed sign between the men of Israel and the ambushers was that they should make a great cloud of smoke rise up out of the city. The men of Israel turned in the battle, and Benjamin began to strike and kill of the men of Israel, about thirty persons. For they said, Surely they are struck down before us, as in the first battle. But when the cloud began to arise up out of the city in a pillar of smoke, the Benjamites looked behind them, and behold, the whole of the city went up in smoke to the sky. The men of Israel turned, and the men of Benjamin were dismayed, 
for they saw that evil had come on them. Therefore they turned their backs before the men of Israel to the way of the wilderness. But the battle followed hard after them, and those who came out of the cities destroyed them in its midst. They surrounded the Benjamites, chased them, and trod them down at their resting place, as far as over against Gibeah toward the sunrise. There fell of Benjamin eighteen thousand men. All these were men of valor. They turned and fled toward the wilderness, to the rock of Rimmon, and they gleaned of them in the highways five thousand men, and followed hard after them to get them, and struck of them two thousand men so that all who fell that day of Benjamin were twenty-five thousand men who drew the sword. All these were men of valor. But six hundred men turned and fled toward the wilderness to the rock of Rimmon, and stayed in the rock of Rimmon four months. The men of Israel turned again on the children of Benjamin and struck them with the edge of the sword, both the entire city and the livestock, and all that they found. Moreover, all the cities which they found, they set on fire. Chapter 21 Mourning the Tribe of Benjamin Now the men of Israel had sworn in Mizpah, saying, There shall not any of us give his daughter to Benjamin as wife. The people came to Bethel, and sat there until evening before God, and lifted up their voices, and wept severely. They said, Yahweh, the God of Israel, why has this happened in Israel, that there should be today one tribe lacking in Israel? It happened on the next day that the people rose early, and built there an altar, and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. The children of Israel said, Who is there among all the tribes of Israel who didn't come up in the assembly to Yahweh? For they had made a great oath concerning him who didn't come up to Yahweh to Mizpah, saying, He shall surely be put to death. The children of Israel grieved for Benjamin their brother, and said, There is one tribe cut off from Israel this day. How shall we provide wives for those who remain, since we have sworn by Yahweh that we will not give them of our daughters to wives? Provision for Benjamin's Survival They said, What one is there of the tribes of Israel who didn't come up to Yahweh to Mizpah? Behold, there came none to the camp from Jabesh-Gilead to the assembly. For when the people were numbered, behold, there were none of the inhabitants of Jabesh-Gilead there. The congregation sent there twelve thousand men of the most valiant, and commanded them, saying, Go, and strike the inhabitants of Jabesh-Gilead with the edge of the sword, with the women and the little ones. This is the thing that you shall do. You shall utterly destroy every male, and every woman who has lain with a man. They found among the inhabitants of Jabesh-Gilead four hundred young virgins who had not known man by lying with him, and they brought them to the camp to Shiloh, which is in the land of Canaan. The whole congregation sent and spoke to the children of Benjamin, who were in the rock of Rimmon, and proclaimed peace to them. Benjamin returned at that time, and they gave them the women whom they had saved alive of the women of Jabesh-Gilead. And yet so, they weren't enough for them. The people grieved for Benjamin, because that Yahweh had made a breach in the tribes of Israel. Then the elders of the congregation said, How shall we provide wives for those who remain, since the women are destroyed out of Benjamin? They said, there must be an inheritance for those who are escaped of Benjamin, that a tribe not be blotted out from Israel. However, we may not give them wives of our daughters, 
For the children of Israel had sworn, saying, Cursed is he who gives a wife to Benjamin. They said, Behold, there is a feast of Yahweh from year to year in Shiloh, which is on the north of Bethel, on the east side of the highway that goes up from Bethel to Shechem, and on the south of Lebona. They commanded the children of Benjamin, saying, Go and lie in wait in the vineyards, and see, and behold, if the daughters of Shiloh come out to dance in the dances, then come out of the vineyards, and each man catch his wife of the daughters of Shiloh, and go to the land of Benjamin. It shall be, when their fathers or their brothers come to complain to us, that we will say to them, Grant them graciously to us, because we didn't take for each man his wife in battle, neither did you give them to them, otherwise you would now be guilty. The children of Benjamin did so, and took them wives, according to their number, of those who danced, whom they carried off. They went and returned to their inheritance, built the cities, and lived in them. The children of Israel departed there at that time, every man to his tribe and to his family. And they went out from there, every man to his inheritance. In those days there was no king in Israel. Every man did that which was right in his own eyes. Ruth Chapter 1 Naomi widowed. It happened in the days when the judges judged that there was a famine in the land. A certain man of Bethlehem, Judah, went to live in the country of Moab, he and his wife and his two sons. The name of the man was Elimelech, and the name of his wife, Naomi, and the name of his two sons, Malan and Kilian, Ephrathites of Bethlehem, Judah. They came into the country of Moab and continued there. Elimelech, Naomi's husband, died, and she was left and her two sons. They took them wives of the women of Moab. The name of the one was Orpah, and the name of the other Ruth. And they lived there about ten years. Malan and Kilian both died, and the woman was bereaved of her two children and of her husband. Ruth's Loyalty to Naomi Then she arose with her daughters-in-law, that she might return from the country of Moab. For she had heard in the country of Moab how that Yahweh had visited his people in giving them bread. She went forth out of the place where she was, and her two daughters-in-law with her, and they went on the way to return to the land of Judah. Naomi said to her two daughters-in-law, Go, return each of you to her mother's house. Yahweh deal kindly with you, as you have dealt with the dead and with me. Yahweh grant you that you may find rest each of you in the house of her husband. Then she kissed them, and they lifted up their voice and wept. They said to her, No, but we will return with you to your people. Naomi said, Go back, my daughters. Why do you want to go with me? Do I still have sons in my womb, that they may be your husbands? Go back, my daughters. Go your way for I am too old to have a husband. If I should say, I have hope, if I should even have a husband tonight, and should also bear sons, would you then wait until they were grown? Would you then refrain from having husbands? No, my daughters, for it grieves me much for your sakes, for the hand of Yahweh has gone out against me. They lifted up their voice and wept again, and Orpah kissed her mother-in-law. But Ruth joined with her. She said, Behold, your sister-in-law has gone back to her people and to her God. Follow your sister-in-law. Ruth said, 
don't entreat me to leave you and to return from following after you, for where you go, I will go, and where you lodge, I will lodge. Your people shall be my people, and your God, my God. Where you die, will I die, and there will I be buried. Yahweh do so to me, and more also, if anything but death part you and me. When she saw that she was steadfastly minded to go with her, she left off speaking to her. Naomi and Ruth returned to Bethlehem. So they, too, went until they came to Bethlehem. It happened, when they were come to Bethlehem, that all the city was moved about them. And the women said, Is this Naomi? She said to them, Don't call me Naomi. Call me Mara, for the Almighty has dealt very bitterly with me. I went out full, and Yahweh has brought me home again, empty. Why do you call me Naomi, since Yahweh has testified against me, and the Almighty has afflicted me? So Naomi returned, and Ruth the Moabitess, her daughter-in-law, with her, who returned out of the country of Moab. And they came to Bethlehem in the beginning of barley harvest. Chapter 2 Ruth Meets Boaz Naomi had a kinsman of her husband's, a mighty man of wealth, of the family of Elimelech, and his name was Boaz. Ruth the Moabitess said to Naomi, Let me now go to the field and glean among the ears of grain after him in whose sight I shall find favor. She said to her, Go, my daughter. She went and came and gleaned in the field after the reapers. And she happened to come to the portion of the field belonging to Boaz, who was of the family of Elimelech. Behold, Boaz came from Bethlehem and said to the reapers, Yahweh be with you. They answered him, Yahweh bless you. Then Boaz said to his servant, who was set over the reapers, Whose young lady is this? The servant, who was set over the reapers, answered, It is the Moabite lady who came back with Naomi out of the country of Moab. She said, Please let me glean and gather after the reapers among the sheaves. So she came, and has continued even from the morning until now, except that she stayed a little in the house. Boaz shows favor to Ruth. Then Boaz said to Ruth, Listen, my daughter, don't go to glean in another field, and don't go from here, but stay here close to my maidens. Let your eyes be on the field that they reap, and go after them. Haven't I commanded the young men not to touch you? When you are thirsty, go to the vessels, and drink from that which the young men have drawn. Then she fell on her face, and bowed herself to the ground, and said to him, Why have I found favor in your sight, that you should take knowledge of me, since I am a foreigner? Boaz answered her, It has fully been shown me all that you have done to your mother-in-law since the death of your husband, and how you have left your father and your mother and the land of your birth, and have come to a people that you didn't know before. May Yahweh repay your work, and a full reward be given you from Yahweh, the God of Israel, under whose wings you have come to take refuge. Then she said, Let me find favor in your sight, my Lord, because you have comforted me, and because you have spoken kindly to your handmaid, though I am not as one of your handmaidens. At mealtime, Boaz said to her, Come here and eat of the bread and dip your morsel in the vinegar. She sat beside the reapers, and they reached her parched grain, and she ate, and was satisfied, and left some of it. When she had risen up to glean, Boaz commanded his young men, saying, Let her glean even among the sheaves, and don't reproach her. 
Also, pull out some for her from the bundles and leave it and let her glean and don't rebuke her. So she gleaned in the field until evening and she beat out that which she had gleaned and it was about an ephah of barley. She took it up and went into the city and her mother-in-law saw what she had gleaned and she brought forth and gave to her that which she had left after she was sufficed. Her mother-in-law said to her, where have you gleaned today? Where have you worked? Blessed be he who noticed you. She showed her mother-in-law with whom she had worked and said, The man's name with whom I work today is Boaz. Naomi said to her daughter-in-law, Blessed be he of Yahweh, who has not left off his kindness to the living and to the dead. Naomi said to her, the man is a close relative to us, one of our near kinsmen. Ruth the Moabitess said, Yes, he said to me, You shall stay close to my young men until they have ended all my harvest. Naomi said to Ruth, her daughter-in-law, It is good, my daughter, that you go out with his maidens and that they not meet you in any other field. So she stayed close to the maidens of Boaz, to glean to the end of barley harvest and of wheat harvest, and she lived with her mother-in-law. Chapter 3 Naomi Instructs Ruth Naomi, her mother-in-law, said to her, My daughter, shall I not seek rest for you, that it may be well with you? Now isn't Boaz our kinsman with whose maidens you were? Behold, he winnows barley tonight in the threshing floor. Therefore, wash yourself, anoint yourself, get dressed, and go down to the threshing floor. But don't make yourself known to the man until he has finished eating and drinking. It shall be, when he lies down, that you shall mark the place where he shall lie and you shall go in and uncover his feet and lay down. Then he will tell you what you shall do. She said to her, All that you say I will do. She went down to the threshing floor and did according to all that her mother-in-law told her. When Boaz had eaten and drunk and his heart was merry, he went to lie down at the end of the heap of grain. She came softly uncovered his feet, and laid down. Ruth claims Boaz as kinsman. It happened at midnight that the man was startled and turned himself, and behold, a woman lay at his feet. He said, Who are you? She answered, I am Ruth, your handmaid. Therefore spread your skirt over your handmaid for you are a near kinsman. He said, Blessed are you by Yahweh, my daughter. You have shown more kindness in the latter end than at the beginning, inasmuch as you didn't follow young men, whether poor or rich. Now, my daughter, don't be afraid. I will do to you all that you say, for all the city of my people does know that you are a worthy woman. Now it is true that I am a near kinsman. However, there is a kinsman nearer than I. Stay this night, and it shall be in the morning, that if he will perform for you the part of a kinsman, well, let him do the kinsman's part. But if he will not do the part of a kinsman for you, then will I do the part of a kinsman for you, as Yahweh lives. Lie down until the morning. She lay at his feet until the morning. She rose up before one could discern another. For he said, Let it not be known that the woman came to the threshing floor. He said, Bring the mantle that is on you and hold it. She held it, and he measured six measures of barley and laid it on her, and he went into the city. When she came to her mother-in-law, she said, How did it go, my daughter? 
she told her all that the man had done to her. She said, He gave me these six measures of barley, for he said, Don't go empty to your mother-in-law. Then she said, Sit still, my daughter, until you know how the matter will fall, for the man will not rest until he has finished the thing this day. Chapter 4 Boaz Redeems Ruth Now Boaz went up to the gate and sat down there. Behold, the near kinsman of whom Boaz spoke came by, to whom he said, Come over here, friend, and sit down. He turned aside and sat down. He took ten men of the elders of the city and said, Sit down here. They sat down. He said to the near kinsman, Naomi, who has come back out of the country of Moab, is selling the parcel of land, which was our brother Elimelech's. I thought to disclose it to you, saying, Buy it before those who sit here, and before the elders of my people. If you will redeem it, redeem it. But if you will not redeem it, then tell me, that I may know. For there is no one to redeem it besides you, and I am after you. He said, I will redeem it. Then Boaz said, On the day you buy the field from the hand of Naomi, you must buy it also from Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of the dead, to raise up the name of the dead on his inheritance. The near kinsman said, I can't redeem it for myself, lest I mar my own inheritance. Take my right of redemption for yourself, for I can't redeem it. Now this was the custom in former time in Israel, concerning redeeming and concerning exchanging, to confirm all things. A man took off his shoe and gave it to his neighbor, and this was the way of attestation in Israel. So the near kinsman said to Boaz, Buy it for yourself. He took off his shoe. Boaz said to the elders and to all the people, you are witnesses this day that I have bought all that was Elimelech's and all that was Kilion's and Malon's from the hand of Naomi. Moreover, Ruth the Moabitess, the wife of Malon, I have purchased to be my wife, to raise up the name of the dead on his inheritance, that the name of the dead not be cut off from among his brothers and from the gate of his place. You are witnesses this day. All the people who were in the gate and the elders said, We are witnesses. May Yahweh make the woman who has come into your house like Rachel and like Leah, which too built the house of Israel, and treat you worthily in Ephrathah and be famous in Bethlehem. Let your house be like the house of Perez, whom Tamar bore to Judah of the seed which Yahweh shall give you of this young woman. Boaz marries Ruth. So Boaz took Ruth, and she became his wife, and he went in to her. And Yahweh gave her conception, and she bore a son. The women said to Naomi, Blessed be Yahweh, who has not left you this day without a near kinsman, and let his name be famous in Israel. He shall be to you a restorer of life, and sustain you in your old age. For your daughter-in-law, who loves you, who is better to you than seven sons, has borne him. Naomi took the child and laid it in her bosom, and became nurse to it. The women, her neighbors, gave him a name, saying, there is a son born to Naomi, and they named him Obed. He is the father of Jesse, the father of David. The Line of David Now this is the history of the generations of Perez. Perez became the father of Hezron, and Hezron became the father of Ram. And Ram became the father of Amenadab, and Amenadab became the father of Nashon, 
and Nashon became the father of Salmon, and Salmon became the father of Boaz, and Boaz became the father of Obed, and Obed became the father of Jesse, and Jesse became the father of David. 1 Samuel Chapter 1 Elkanah and his wives Now there was a certain man of Ramathaim Zophim, of the hill country of Ephraim, and his name was Elkanah, the son of Jeroham, the son of Elihu, the son of Tohu, the son of Zuf, an Ephraimite. And he had two wives. The name of the one was Hannah, and the name of the other, Peninnah. And Peninnah had children, but Hannah had no children. This man went up out of his city from year to year to worship and to sacrifice to Yahweh of armies in Shiloh. The two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, priests to Yahweh, were there. When the day came that Elkanah sacrificed, he gave to Peninnah his wife and to all her sons and her daughters portions. But to Hannah he gave a double portion, for he loved Hannah. But Yahweh had shut up her womb. Her rival provoked her severely to make her fret, because Yahweh had shut up her womb. As he did so year by year, when she went up to the house of Yahweh, so she provoked her. Therefore she wept and did not eat. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Hannah, why do you weep? Why don't you eat? Why is your heart grieved? Am I not better to you than ten sons? Hannah prays for a son. So Hannah rose up after they had eaten in Shiloh, and after they had drunk. Now Eli the priest was sitting on his seat by the doorpost of the temple of Yahweh. She was in bitterness of soul, and prayed to Yahweh, and wept bitterly. She vowed a vow, and said, Yahweh of armies, if you will indeed look on the affliction of your handmaid, and remember me, and not forget your handmaid, but will give to your handmaid a boy. Then I will give him to Yahweh all the days of his life, and no razor shall come on his head. It happened, as she continued praying before Yahweh, that Eli saw her mouth. Now Hannah spoke in her heart. Only her lips moved, but her voice was not heard. Therefore Eli thought she had been drunken, Eli said to her, How long will you be drunken? Put away your wine from you. Hannah answered, No, my lord, I am a woman of a sorrowful spirit. I have drunk neither wine nor strong drink, but I poured out my soul before Yahweh. Don't count your handmaid for a wicked woman, for I have been speaking out of the abundance of my complaint and my provocation. Then Eli answered, Go in peace, and may the God of Israel grant your petition that you have asked of him. She said, Let your handmaid find favor in your sight. So the woman went her way and ate, and her facial expression wasn't sad any more. The Birth of Samuel They rose up in the morning early, and worshipped before Yahweh, and returned and came to their house to Ramah. And Elkanah knew Hannah his wife, and Yahweh remembered her. It happened, when the time had come, that Hannah conceived and bore a son, and she named him Samuel, saying, Because I have asked him of Yahweh. The man Elkanah and all his house went up to offer to Yahweh the yearly sacrifice and his vow. But Hannah didn't go up, for she said to her husband, Not until the child is weaned, then I will bring him, that he may appear before Yahweh and stay there forever. Elkanah, her husband, said to her, Do what seems good to you. 
Wait until you have weaned him. Only may Yahweh establish his word. So the woman waited and nursed her son until she weaned him. When she had weaned him, she took him up with her, with three bulls and one ephah of meal and a bottle of wine, and brought him to Yahweh's house in Shiloh. The child was young. They killed the bull and brought the child to Eli. She said, Oh, my Lord, as your soul lives, my Lord, I am the woman who stood by you here, praying to Yahweh. For this child I prayed, and Yahweh has given me my petition which I asked of him. Therefore also I have granted him to Yahweh. As long as he lives, he is granted to Yahweh. He worshipped Yahweh there. Chapter 2 Hannah's Prayer of Thanksgiving Hannah prayed and said, My heart exults in Yahweh. My horn is exalted in Yahweh. My mouth is enlarged over my enemies because I rejoice in your salvation. There is no one as holy as Yahweh, for there is no one besides you, nor is there any rock like our God. Talk no more so exceeding proudly. Don't let arrogance come out of your mouth, for Yahweh is a God of knowledge. By him actions are weighed. The bows of the mighty men are broken. Those who stumble are armed with strength. Those who were full have hired themselves out for bread. Those who were hungry have ceased to hunger. Yes, the barren has borne seven. She who has many children languishes. Yahweh kills and makes alive. He brings down to Sheol and brings up. Yahweh makes poor and makes rich. He brings low. He also lifts up. He raises up the poor out of the dust. He lifts up the needy from the dunghill to make them sit with princes and inherit the throne of glory. For the pillars of the earth are Yahweh's. He has set the world on them. He will keep the feet of his holy ones, but the wicked shall be put to silence in darkness, for no man shall prevail by strength. Those who strive with Yahweh shall be broken to pieces. He will thunder against them in the sky. Yahweh will judge the ends of the earth. He will give strength to his king and exalt the horn of his anointed. Elkanah went to Ramah to his house. The child did minister to Yahweh before Eli the priest. The Sins of Eli's Sons Now the sons of Eli were base men. They didn't know Yahweh. The custom of the priests with the people was that when any man offered sacrifice, the priest's servant came while the flesh was boiling with a fork of three teeth in his hand, and he struck it into the pan or kettle or cauldron or pot. All that the fork brought up, the priest took therewith. So they did in Shiloh to all the Israelites who came there. Yes, before they burnt the fat, the priest's servant came and said to the man who sacrificed, Give meat to roast for the priest, for he will not accept boiled meat from you, but raw. If the man said to him, Let the fat be burned first, and then take as much as your soul desires, then he would say, No, but you shall give it to me now, and if not, I will take it by force. The sin of the young men was very great before Yahweh, for the men despised the offering of Yahweh. But Samuel ministered before Yahweh, being a child, clothed with a linen ephod. Moreover, his mother made him a little robe and brought it to him from year to year when she came up with her husband to offer the yearly sacrifice. Eli blessed Elkanah and his wife and said, Yahweh give you seed of this woman for the petition which was asked of Yahweh. 
they went to their own home. Yahweh visited Hannah, and she conceived, and bore three sons and two daughters. The child Samuel grew before Yahweh. Eli reproves his sons. Now Eli was very old, and he heard all that his sons did to all Israel, and how that they lay with the women who served at the door of the tent of meeting. He said to them, Why do you do such things? For I hear of your evil dealings from all this people. No, my sons, for it is no good report that I hear. You make Yahweh's people disobey. If one man sin against another, God shall judge him. But if a man sin against Yahweh, who shall entreat for him? Notwithstanding, they didn't listen to the voice of their father, because Yahweh was minded to kill them. The child Samuel grew on and increased in favor both with Yahweh and also with men. A Prophecy Against Eli's House A man of God came to Eli and said to him, Thus says Yahweh, Did I reveal myself to the house of your father when they were in Egypt in bondage to Pharaoh's house? Did I choose him out of all the tribes of Israel to be my priest? to go up to my altar, to burn incense, to wear an ephod before me? Did I give to the house of your father all the offerings of the children of Israel made by fire? Why do you kick at my sacrifice and at my offering, which I have commanded in my habitation, and honor your sons above me, to make yourselves fat with the best of all the offerings of Israel, my people? Therefore, Yahweh, the God of Israel says, I said indeed that your house and the house of your father should walk before me forever. But now, Yahweh says, Be it far from me, for those who honor me I will honor, and those who despise me shall be lightly esteemed. Behold, the days come that I will cut off your arm and the arm of your father's house, that there shall not be an old man in your house. You shall see the affliction of my habitation, and all the wealth which God shall give Israel, and there shall not be an old man in your house forever. The man of yours, whom I shall not cut off from my altar, shall be to consume your eyes and to grieve your heart, and all the increase of your house shall die in the flower of their age. This shall be the sign to you that shall come on your two sons, on Hophni and Phinehas. In one day they shall both die. I will raise me up a faithful priest that shall do according to that which is in my heart and in my mind. I will build him a sure house, and he shall walk before my anointed forever. It shall happen that everyone who is left in your house shall come and bow down to him for a piece of silver and a loaf of bread, and shall say, Please put me into one of the priest's offices, that I may eat a morsel of bread. Chapter 3 The Lord Calls Samuel the child Samuel ministered to Yahweh before Eli. The word of Yahweh was precious in those days. There was no frequent vision. It happened at that time when Eli was laid down in his place. Now his eyes had begun to grow dim so that he could not see. And the lamp of God hadn't yet gone out. And Samuel had laid down to sleep in the temple of Yahweh where the ark of God was, that Yahweh called Samuel. And he said, Here I am. He ran to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. He said, I didn't call. Lie down again. He went and lay down. Yahweh called yet again, Samuel. Samuel arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am 
for you called me. He answered, I didn't call, my son. Lie down again. Now Samuel didn't yet know Yahweh. Neither was the word of Yahweh yet revealed to him. Yahweh called Samuel again the third time. He arose and went to Eli and said, Here I am, for you called me. Eli perceived that Yahweh had called the child. Therefore Eli said to Samuel, Go, lie down, and it shall be, if he calls you, that you shall say, Speak, Yahweh, for your servant hears. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. God's Judgment Against Eli Yahweh came and stood and called as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant hears. Yahweh said to Samuel, Behold, I will do a thing in Israel, at which both the ears of everyone who hears it shall tingle. In that day I will perform against Eli all that I have spoken concerning his house, from the beginning even to the end. For I have told him that I will judge his house forever, for the iniquity which he knew, because his sons brought a curse on themselves, and he didn't restrain them. Therefore I have sworn to the house of Eli that the iniquity of Eli's house shall not be removed with sacrifice nor offering forever. Samuel shares his vision. Samuel lay until the morning and opened the doors of the house of Yahweh. Samuel feared to show Eli the vision. Then Eli called Samuel and said, Samuel, my son. He said, Here I am. He said, What is the thing that Yahweh has spoken to you? Please don't hide it from me. God do so to you, and more also, if you hide anything from me of all the things that he spoke to you. Samuel told him every bit and hid nothing from him. He said, It is Yahweh. Let him do what seems good to him. Samuel grew, and Yahweh was with him, and let none of his words fall to the ground. All Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, knew that Samuel was established to be a prophet of Yahweh. Yahweh appeared again in Shiloh, for Yahweh revealed himself to Samuel in Shiloh by the word of Yahweh. Chapter 4 The Philistines Capture the Ark The word of Samuel came to all Israel. Now Israel went out against the Philistines to battle, and encamped beside Ebenezer, and the Philistines encamped in Aphek. The Philistines put themselves in array against Israel, and when they joined battle, Israel was struck before the Philistines, and they killed of the army in the field about four thousand men. When the people were come into the camp, the elders of Israel said, Why has Yahweh struck us today before the Philistines? Let us get the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh out of Shiloh to us, that it may come among us and save us out of the hand of our enemies. So the people sent to Shiloh, and they brought from there the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh of Armies, who sits above the cherubim. And the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. When the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh came into the camp, all Israel shouted with a great shout, so that the earth rang again. When the Philistines heard the noise of the shout, they said, what does the noise of this great shout in the camp of the Hebrews mean? 
they understood that the ark of Yahweh had come into the camp. The Philistines were afraid, for they said, God has come into the camp. They said, Woe to us, for there has not been such a thing before. Woe to us! Who shall deliver us out of the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods that struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the wilderness. Be strong and behave like men, O you Philistines, that you not be servants to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Strengthen yourselves like men and fight. The Philistines fought, and Israel was struck, and they fled, every man to his tent. And there was a very great slaughter, for there fell of Israel thirty thousand footmen. The ark of God was taken, and the two sons of Eli, Hophni and Phinehas, were slain. The Death of Eli There ran a man of Benjamin out of the army, and came to Shiloh the same day with his clothes torn, and with earth on his head. When he came, behold, Eli was sitting on his seat by the road, watching, for his heart trembled for the ark of God. When the man came into the city and told it, all the city cried out. When Eli heard the noise of the crying, he said, What does the noise of this tumult mean? The man hurried and came and told Eli. Now Eli was ninety-eight years old, and his eyes were set, so that he could not see. The man said to Eli, I am he who came out of the army, and I fled today out of the army. He said, How did the matter go, my son? He who brought the news answered, Israel has fled before the Philistines, and there has been also a great slaughter among the people. Your two sons also, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. It happened when he made mention of the ark of God that Eli fell from off his seat, backward, by the side of the gate, and his neck broke, and he died. For he was an old man and heavy. He had judged Israel forty years. His daughter-in-law, Phineas' wife, was with child, near to be delivered. When she heard the news that the ark of God was taken, and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she bowed herself and brought forth, for her pains came on her. About the time of her death, the women who stood by her said to her, Don't be afraid, for you have brought forth a son. But she didn't answer neither did she regard it. She named the child Ichabod, saying, The glory has departed from Israel, because the ark of God was taken, and because of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, The glory has departed from Israel, for the ark of God is taken. Chapter 5 the Ark Among the Philistines Now the Philistines had taken the Ark of God, and they brought it from Ebenezer to Ashdod. The Philistines took the Ark of God and brought it into the house of Dagon, and set it by Dagon. When they of Ashdod arose early on the next day, behold, Dagon was fallen on his face to the ground, before the ark of Yahweh. They took Dagon and set him in his place again. When they arose early on the next day morning, behold, Dagon was fallen on his face to the ground before the ark of Yahweh, and the head of Dagon and both the palms of his hands lay cut off on the threshold. Only the stump of Dagon was left to him. Therefore, neither the priests of Dagon, nor any who come into Dagon's house, tread on the threshold of Dagon in Ashdod to this day. But the hand of Yahweh was heavy on them of Ashdod, 
and he destroyed them and struck them with tumors, even Ashdod and its borders. When the men of Ashdod saw that it was so, they said, The ark of the God of Israel shall not stay with us, for his hand is severe on us and on Dagon our God. They sent, therefore, and gathered all the lords of the Philistines to them, and said, What shall we do with the ark of the God of Israel? They answered, Let the ark of the God of Israel be carried over to Gath. They carried the ark of the God of Israel there. It was so that after they had carried it about, the hand of Yahweh was against the city with a very great confusion. And he struck the men of the city, both small and great, and tumors broke out on them. So they sent the ark of God to Ekron. It happened, as the ark of God came to Ekron, that the Ekronites cried out, saying, They have brought about the ark of the God of Israel to us, to kill us and our people. They sent, therefore, and gathered together all the lords of the Philistines, and they said, Send away the ark of the God of Israel, and let it go again to its own place, that it not kill us and our people. For there was a deadly confusion throughout all the city. The hand of God was very heavy there. The men who didn't die were struck with the tumors, and the cry of the city went up to heaven. Chapter 6 The Ark Returned to Israel the ark of Yahweh was in the country of the Philistines seven months. The Philistines called for the priests and the diviners, saying, What shall we do with the ark of Yahweh? Show us with which we shall send it to its place. They said, If you send away the ark of the God of Israel, don't send it empty, but by all means return him a trespass offering. Then you shall be healed, and it shall be known to you why his hand is not removed from you. Then they said, What shall be the trespass offering which we shall return to him? They said, Five golden tumors and five golden mice, according to the number of the lords of the Philistines. For one plague was on you all, and on your lords. Therefore, you shall make images of your tumors and images of your mice that mar the land, and you shall give glory to the God of Israel. Perhaps he will lighten his hand from off you and from off your gods and from off your land. Why then do you harden your hearts as the Egyptians and Pharaoh hardened their hearts? When he had worked wonderfully among them, didn't they let the people go and they departed? Now, therefore, take and prepare yourselves a new cart and two milk cows, on which there has come no yoke, and tie the cows to the cart, and bring their calves home from them, and take the ark of Yahweh, and lay it on the cart, and put the jewels of gold, which you return him for a trespass offering, in a coffer by its side, and send it away, that it may go. Behold, if it goes up by the way of its own border to Beth Shemesh, then he has done us this great evil. But if not, then we shall know that it is not his hand that struck us. It was a chance that happened to us. The men did so, and took two milk cows, and tied them to the cart, and shut up their calves at home. And they put the ark of Yahweh on the cart, and the coffer with the mice of gold and the images of their tumors. The cows took the straight way by the way to Beth Shemesh. They went along the highway, lowing as they went, and didn't turn aside to the right hand or to the left. And the lords of the Philistines went after them to the border of Beth Shemesh. They of Beth Shemesh were reaping their wheat harvest in the valley. And they lifted up their eyes, and saw the ark, and rejoiced to see it. The cart came into the field of Joshua, of Beth Shemesh, 
and stood there where there was a great stone and they split the wood of the cart and offered up the cows for a burnt offering to yahweh the levites took down the ark of yahweh and the coffer that was with it in which the jewels of gold were and put them on the great stone and the men of beth shemesh offered burnt offerings and sacrificed sacrifices the same day to Yahweh. When the five lords of the Philistines had seen it, they returned to Ekron the same day. These are the golden tumors which the Philistines returned for a trespass offering to Yahweh. For Ashdod, one. For Gaza, one. For Ashkelon, one. For Gath, one. For Ekron one and the golden mice according to the number of all the cities of the philistines belonging to the five lords both of fortified cities and of country villages even to the great stone whereon they set down the ark of yahweh which stone remains to this day in the field of joshua of beth shemesh he struck of the men of beth shemesh because they had looked into the ark of Yahweh. He struck of the people fifty thousand seventy men. And the people mourned, because Yahweh had struck the people with a great slaughter. The men of Beth Shemesh said, Who is able to stand before Yahweh, this holy God? To whom shall he go up from us? They sent messengers to the inhabitants of kiriath Jerim saying the philistines have brought back the ark of yahweh come down and bring it up to yourselves end of section 23chapter 7 samuel subdues the philistines the men of kiriath jerim came and fetched up the ark of yahweh and brought it into the house of abinadab in the hill and sanctified eleazar his son to keep the ark of yahweh it happened from the day that the ark stayed in kiriath jerim that the time was long for it was twenty years and all the house of israel lamented after yahweh Samuel spoke to all the house of Israel, saying, If you do return to Yahweh with all your heart, then put away the foreign gods and the Ashtaroth from among you, and direct your hearts to Yahweh, and serve him only, and he will deliver you out of the hand of the Philistines then the children of israel did put away the baals and the ashtaroth and served yahweh only samuel said gather all the israel to mizpah and i will pray for you to yahweh they gathered together to mizpah and drew water and poured it out before yahweh and fasted on that day and said there we have sinned against yahweh Samuel judged the children of Israel in Mizpah. When the Philistines heard that the children of Israel were gathered together at Mizpah, the lords of the Philistines went up against Israel. When the children of Israel heard it, they were afraid of the Philistines. The children of Israel said to Samuel, Don't cease to cry to Yahweh our God for us, that he will save us out of the hand of the Philistines. Samuel took a suckling lamb and offered it for a whole burnt offering to Yahweh. And Samuel cried to Yahweh for Israel, and Yahweh answered him. As Samuel was offering up the burnt offering, the Philistines drew near to battle against Israel. But Yahweh thundered with a great thunder on that day on the Philistines and confused them and they were struck down before Israel. The men of Israel went out of Mizpah and pursued the Philistines and struck them until they came under Bethkar. 
Then Samuel took a stone and set it between Mizpah and Shin, and called its name Ebenezer, saying, Yahweh helped us until now. So the Philistines were subdued, and they came no more within the border of Israel. The hand of Yahweh was against the Philistines all the days of Samuel. The cities which the Philistines had taken from Israel were restored to Israel, from Ekron even to Gath, and its border did Israel deliver out of the hand of the Philistines. There was peace between Israel and the Amorites. Samuel Judges Israel Samuel judged Israel all the days of his life. He went from year to year in circuit to Bethel and Gilgal and Mizpah, and he judged Israel in all those places. His return was to Ramah, for there was his house, and there he judged Israel, and he built there an altar to Yahweh. Chapter 8 Israel Demands a King it happened, when Samuel was old, that he made his sons judges over Israel. Now the name of his firstborn was Joel, and the name of his second, Abijah. They were judges in Beersheba. His sons didn't walk in his ways, but turned aside after lucre, and took bribes, and perverted justice. Then all the elders of Israel, gathered themselves together, and came to Samuel, to Ramah. And they said to him, Behold, you are old, and your sons don't walk in your ways. Now make us a king to judge us, like all the nations. But the thing displeased Samuel, when they said, Give us a king to judge us. Samuel prayed to Yahweh. Yahweh said to Samuel, Listen to the voice of the people in all that they tell you, for they have not rejected you, but they have rejected me, that I should not be king over them, according to all the works which they have done since the day that I brought them up out of Egypt, even to this day, in that they have forsaken me and served other gods so do they also to you. Now, therefore, listen to their voice. However, you shall protest solemnly to them, and shall show them the way of the king who shall reign over them. Samuel's Warning About Kings Samuel told all the words of Yahweh to the people, who asked of him a king. He said, This will be the way of the king who shall reign over you. He will take your sons and appoint them to him for his chariots and to be his horsemen, and they shall run before his chariots, and he will appoint them to him for captains of thousands and captains of fifties, and he will set some to plow his ground, and to reap his harvest, and to make his instruments of war, and the instruments of his chariots. He will take your daughters to be perfumers, and to be cooks, and to be bakers. He will take your fields, and your vineyards, and your olive groves, even the best of them, and give them to his servants. He will take the tenth of your seed and of your vineyards and give to his officers and to his servants. He will take your male servants and your female servants and your best young men and your donkeys and put them to his work. He will take the tenth of your flocks, and you shall be his servants. You shall cry out in that day,
because of your king, whom you shall have chosen you. And Yahweh will not answer you in that day. God grants the request. But the people refused to listen to the voice of Samuel, and they said, No, but we will have a king over us, that we also may be like all the nations, and that our king may judge us, and go out before us, and fight our battles. Samuel heard all the words of the people, and he rehearsed them in the ears of Yahweh. Yahweh said to Samuel, Listen to their voice and make them a king. Samuel said to the men of Israel, Every man go to his city. Chapter 9 Saul Chosen as King Now there was a man of Benjamin whose name was Kish the son of Abiel, the son of Zeror, the son of Bichorath, the son of Aphiah, the son of a Benjamite, a mighty man of valor. He had a son whose name was Saul, an impressive young man, and there was not among the children of Israel a better person than he. From his shoulders and upward he was higher than any of the people. The donkeys of Kish, Saul's father, were lost. Kish said to Saul, his son, Take now one of the servants with you, and arise. Go, seek the donkeys. He passed through the hill country of Ephraim, and passed through the land of Shalisha, but they didn't find them. Then they passed through the land of Shealim, and there they weren't there and he passed through the land of the Benjamites, but they didn't find them. When they had come to the land of Zuf, Saul said to his servant who was with him, Come, and let us return, lest my father stop caring about the donkeys and be anxious for us. He said to him, See now, there is in this city a man of God, and he is a man who is held in honor. All that he says comes surely to pass. Now let us go there. Perhaps he can tell us concerning our journey whereon we go. Then Saul said to his servant, But behold, if we go, what shall we bring the man? For the bread is spent in our vessels, and there is not a present to bring to the man of God. What do we have? The servant answered Saul again and said, Behold, I have in my hand the fourth part of a shekel of silver. I will give that to the man of God to tell us our way. In earlier times in Israel, when a man went to inquire of God, thus he said, Come and let us go to the seer. For he who is now called a prophet was before called a seer. Then Saul said to his servant, Well said, Come, let us go. So they went to the city where the man of God was. As they went up the ascent to the city, they found young maidens going out to draw water, and said to them, Is the seer here? They answered them, and said, He is. Behold, he is before you. Hurry now, for he has come today into the city. For the people have a sacrifice today in the high place. As soon as you have come into the city, you shall immediately find him, before he goes up to the high place to eat. For the people would not eat until he come, because he blesses the sacrifice. Afterwards, those who are invited eat. Now therefore go up, for at this time you shall find him. They went up to the city, and as they came within the city, behold, Samuel came out toward them to go up to the high place. Now Yahweh had revealed to Samuel a day before Saul came, saying, Tomorrow. About this time, I will send you a man out of the land of Benjamin, and you shall anoint him to be prince over my people Israel, and he shall save my people out of the hand of the Philistines. For I have looked on my people, because their cry has come to me. When Samuel saw Saul, Yahweh said to him, 
Behold, the man of whom I spoke to you, this same shall have authority over my people. Then Saul drew near to Samuel in the gate and said, Please tell me where the seer's house is. Samuel answered Saul and said, I am the seer. Go up before me to the high place, for you shall eat with me today. In the morning I will let you go, and will tell you all that is in your heart. As for your donkeys who were lost three days ago, don't set your mind on them, for they are found. For whom is all that is desirable in Israel? Is it not for you and for all your father's house? Saul answered, Am I not a Benjamite of the smallest of the tribes of Israel, and my family the least of all the families of the tribe of Benjamin? Why then do you speak to me like this? Samuel took Saul and his servant and brought them into the guest room and made them sit in the best place among those who were invited, who were about thirty persons. Samuel said to the cook, Bring the portion which I gave you, of which I said to you, set it aside. The cook took up the thigh and that which was on it and set it before Saul. Samuel said, Behold, that which has been reserved, set it before yourself and eat, because for the appointed time has it been kept for you. For I said, I have invited the people. So Saul ate with Samuel that day. When they had come down from the high place into the city, he talked with Saul on the housetop. They arose early, and it happened about the spring of the day that Samuel called to Saul on the housetop, saying, Get up, that I may send you away. Saul arose, and they went out both of them, he and Samuel, abroad. As they were going down at the end of the city, Samuel said to Saul, Tell the servant, Pass on before us. And he passed on. But stand still first, that I may cause you to hear the word of God. Chapter 10 Samuel anoints Saul. Then Samuel took the vial of oil and poured it on his head and kissed him and said, Isn't it that Yahweh has anointed you to be prince over his inheritance? When you have departed from me today, then you shall find two men by Rachel's tomb in the border of Benjamin at Zelza, and they will tell you, The donkeys which you went to seek have been found, and behold, your father has stopped caring about the donkeys, and is anxious for you, saying, What shall I do for my son? Then you shall go on forward from there, and you shall come to the oak of Tabor, and three men shall meet you there, going up to God, to Bethel, one carrying three young goats, and another carrying three loaves of bread, and another carrying a bottle of wine, and they will greet you, and give you two loaves of bread, which you shall receive of their hand. After that, you shall come to the hill of God, where is the garrison of the Philistines. And it shall happen, when you have come there to the city, that you shall meet a band of prophets coming down from the high place with a psaltery and a tambourine and a pipe and a harp before them. And they will be prophesying and the Spirit of Yahweh will come mightily on you, and you shall prophesy with them, and shall be turned into another man. 
Let it be, when these signs have come to you, that you do as occasion shall serve you, for God is with you. You shall go down before me to Gilgal, and behold, I will come down to you to offer burnt offerings and to sacrifice sacrifices of peace offerings. You shall wait seven days until I come to you and show you what you shall do. Samuel's Signs Fulfilled It was so that when he had turned his back to go from Samuel, God gave him another heart. And all those signs happened that day. When they came there to the hill, behold, a band of prophets met him, and the Spirit of God came mightily on him, and he prophesied among them. It happened, when all who knew him before saw that, behold, he prophesied with the prophets, then the people said one to another, what is this that is come to the son of Kish? Is Saul also among the prophets? One of the same place answered, Who is their father? Therefore it became a proverb. Is Saul also among the prophets? When he had made an end of prophesying, he came to the high place. Saul's uncle said to him and to his servant, Where did you go? He said to seek the donkeys. When we saw that they were not found, we came to Samuel. Saul's uncle said, Please tell me what Samuel said to you. Saul said to his uncle, He told us plainly that the donkeys were found. But concerning the matter of the kingdom of which Samuel spoke, he didn't tell him. Saul proclaimed king. Samuel called the people together to Yahweh, to Mizpah, and he said to the children of Israel, Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, I brought up Israel out of Egypt, and I delivered you out of the hand of the Egyptians, and out of the hand of all the kingdoms that oppressed you. But you have this day rejected your God who himself saves you out of all your calamities and your distresses. And you have said to him, No, but set a king over us. Now, therefore, present yourselves before Yahweh by your tribes and by your thousands. So Samuel brought all the tribes of Israel near, and the tribe of Benjamin was taken. He brought the tribe of Benjamin near by their families, and the family of the Matrites was taken, and Saul, the son of Kish, was taken. But when they sought him, he could not be found. Therefore they asked of Yahweh further, Is there yet a man to come here? Yahweh answered, Behold, he has hidden himself among the baggage. They ran and fetched him there, and when he stood among the people, he was higher than any of the people from his shoulders and upward. Samuel said to all the people, You see him whom Yahweh has chosen, that there is none like him among all the people? All the people shouted and said, Long live the king! Then Samuel told the people the regulations of the kingdom, and wrote it in a book, and laid it up before Yahweh. Samuel sent all the people away, every man to his house. Saul also went to his house, to Gibeah, and there went with him the army, whose hearts God had touched. But certain worthless fellows said, How shall this man save us? They despised him, and brought him no present but he held his peace. Chapter 11 Saul Defeats the Ammonites 
Then Nahash the Ammonite came up and encamped against Jabesh Gilead. And all the men of Jabesh said to Nahash, Make a covenant with us, and we will serve you. Nahash the Ammonite said to them, On this condition I will make it with you, that all your right eyes be put out, and I will lay it for a reproach on all Israel. The elders of Jabesh said to him, Give us seven days, that we may send messengers to all the borders of Israel, and then, if there is no one to save us, we will come out to you. Then the messengers came to Gibeah of Saul, and spoke these words in the ears of the people. And all the people lifted up their voice and wept. Behold, Saul came following the oxen out of the field, and Saul said, What ails the people that they weep? They told him the words of the men of Jabesh. The Spirit of God came mightily on Saul when he heard those words, and his anger was kindled greatly. He took a yoke of oxen and cut them in pieces and sent them throughout all the borders of Israel by the hand of messengers, saying, Whoever doesn't come forth after Saul and after Samuel, so shall it be done to his oxen. The dread of Yahweh fell on the people, and they came out as one man. He numbered them in Bezek, and the children of Israel were three hundred thousand, and the men of Judah thirty thousand. They said to the messengers who came, Thus you shall tell the men of Jabesh Gilead, Tomorrow, by the time the sun is hot, you shall have deliverance. The messengers came and told the men of Jabesh, and they were glad. Therefore the men of Jabesh said, Tomorrow we will come out to you, and you shall do with us all that seems good to you. It was so on the next day that Saul put the people in three companies, and they came into the midst of the camp in the morning watch, and struck the Ammonites until the heat of the day. And it happened that those who remained were scattered so that no two of them were left together. Saul confirmed as king. The people said to Samuel, Who is he who said, Shall Saul reign over us? Bring those men, that we may put them to death. Saul said, There shall not a man be put to death this day, for today Yahweh has worked deliverance in Israel. Then Samuel said to the people, Come, and let us go to Gilgal, and renew the kingdom there. All the people went to Gilgal, and there they made Saul king before Yahweh in Gilgal. And there they offered sacrifices of peace offerings before Yahweh. And there Saul and all the men of Israel rejoiced greatly. Chapter 12 Samuel's Farewell Address Samuel said to all Israel, Behold, I have listened to your voice in all that you said to me, and have made a king over you. Now, behold, the king walks before you, and I am old and gray-headed. And behold, my sons are with you, and I have walked before you from my youth to this day. Here I am. Witness against me before Yahweh and before his anointed. Whose ox have I taken? Whose donkey have I taken? Whom have I defrauded? Whom have I oppressed? Of whose hand have I taken a ransom to blind my eyes therewith? I will restore it to you. They said, You have not defrauded us, nor oppressed us, neither have you taken anything of any man's hand. He said to them, Yahweh is witness against you, and his anointed is witness this day that you have not found anything in my hand. 
they said. He is witness. Samuel said to the people, It is Yahweh who appointed Moses and Aaron, and that brought your fathers up out of the land of Egypt. Now, therefore, stand still, that I may plead with you before Yahweh concerning all the righteous acts of Yahweh, which he did to you and to your fathers. When Jacob was come into Egypt, and your fathers cried to Yahweh, then Yahweh sent Moses and Aaron, who brought forth your fathers out of Egypt, and made them to dwell in this place. But they forgot Yahweh their God, and he sold them into the hand of Sisera, captain of the army of Hazor, and into the hand of the Philistines, and into the hand of the king of Moab, and they fought against them. They cried to Yahweh and said, We have sinned because we have forsaken Yahweh and have served the Baals and the Ashtaroth. But now deliver us out of the hand of our enemies and we will serve you. Yahweh sent Jeroboam and Bedan and Jephthah and Samuel and delivered you out of the hand of your enemies on every side, and you lived in safety. When you saw that Nahash, the king of the children of Ammon, came against you, you said to me, No, but a king shall reign over us, when Yahweh your God was your king. See the king whom you have chosen and whom you have asked for. And behold, Yahweh has set a king over you, if you will fear Yahweh and serve him, and listen to his voice, and not rebel against the commandment of Yahweh. And both you and also the king who reigns over you are followers of Yahweh your God. Well, but if you will not listen to the voice of Yahweh, but rebel against the commandment of Yahweh, then will the hand of Yahweh be against you, as it was against your fathers. Now, therefore, stand still and see this great thing, which Yahweh will do before your eyes. Isn't it wheat harvest today? I will call to Yahweh, that he may send thunder and rain, and you shall know and see that your wickedness is great, which you have done in the sight of Yahweh, in asking for a king. So Samuel called to Yahweh, and Yahweh sent thunder and rain that day, and all the people greatly feared Yahweh and Samuel. All the people said to Samuel, Pray for your servants to Yahweh your God, that we not die, for we have added to all our sins this evil to ask us a king. Samuel said to the people, Don't be afraid. You have indeed done all this evil. Yet don't turn aside from following Yahweh. But serve Yahweh with all your heart. Don't turn aside, for then you would go after vain things which can't profit nor deliver, for they are vain. But Yahweh will not forsake his people for his great name's sake, because it has pleased Yahweh to make you a people to himself. Moreover, as for me, Far be it from me that I should sin against Yahweh in ceasing to pray for you, but I will instruct you in the good and the right way. Only fear Yahweh and serve him in truth with all your heart, for consider how great things he has done for you. 
but if you shall still do wickedly, you shall be consumed, both you and your king. Chapter 13 War with the Philistines Saul was forty years old when he began to reign. And when he had reigned two years over Israel, Saul chose him three thousand men of Israel, of which two thousand were with Saul in Michmash and in the Mount of Bethel, and one thousand were with Jonathan in Gibeah of Benjamin, and the rest of the people he sent every man to his tent. Jonathan struck the garrison of the Philistines that was in Geba, and the Philistines heard of it. Saul blew the trumpet throughout all the land, saying, Let the Hebrews hear. All Israel heard that Saul had struck the garrison of the Philistines, and also that Israel was had in abomination with the Philistines. The people were gathered together after Saul to Gilgal. The Philistines assembled themselves together to fight with Israel, 30,000 chariots and 6,000 horsemen, and people as the sand which is on the seashore in multitude. And they came up and encamped in Michmash, eastward of beth -Avon. When the men of Israel saw that they were in a strait, for the people were distressed, then the people did hide themselves in caves and in thickets and in rocks and in coverts and in pits. Now some of the Hebrews had gone over the Jordan to the land of Gad in Gilead, but as for Saul, he was yet in Gilgal, and all the people followed him, trembling. Saul's Unlawful Sacrifice He stayed seven days, according to the set time that Samuel had appointed. But Samuel didn't come to Gilgal, and the people were scattered from him. Saul said, Bring here the burnt offering to me and the peace offerings. He offered the burnt offering. Samuel rebukes Saul. It came to pass that as soon as he had made an end of offering the burnt offering, behold, Samuel came. And Saul went out to meet him, that he might greet him. Samuel said, What have you done? Saul said, because I saw that the people were scattered from me, and that you didn't come within the days appointed, and that the Philistines assembled themselves together at Michmash. Therefore I said, Now the Philistines will come down on me to Gilgal, and I haven't entreated the favor of Yahweh. I forced myself, therefore, and offered the burnt offering. Samuel said to Saul, You have done foolishly. You have not kept the commandment of Yahweh your God, which he commanded you. For now Yahweh would have established your kingdom on Israel forever. But now your kingdom shall not continue. Yahweh has sought for himself a man after his own heart. And Yahweh has appointed him to be prince over his people because you have not kept that which Yahweh commanded you. Samuel arose and went from Gilgal to Gibeah of Benjamin. Saul numbered the people who were present with him, about 600 men. Philistines raid Israel. Saul and Jonathan his son and the people who were present with them stayed in Geba of Benjamin. But the Philistines encamped in Michmash. The spoilers came out of the camp of the Philistines in three companies. One company turned to the way that leads to Ophrah, to the land of Shual, and another company turned the way to Beth Horon, and another company turned the way of the border that looks down on the valley of Zeboim toward the wilderness. Israel without weapons. Now there was no smith found throughout all the land of Israel. For the Philistines said, 
lest the Hebrews make them swords or spears. But all the Israelites went down to the Philistines to sharpen every man his plowshare, mattock, axe, and sickle. Yet they had a file for the mattocks, and for the plowshares, and for the forks, and for the axes, and to set the goads. So it came to pass in the day of battle that there was neither sword nor spear found in the hand of any of the people who were with Saul and Jonathan. But with Saul and with Jonathan his son was there found. The garrison of the Philistines went out to the pass of Michmash. Chapter 14 Jonathan's Plan Now it fell on a day that Jonathan, the son of Saul, said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, and let us go over to the Philistines' garrison that is on the other side. But he didn't tell his father. Saul stayed in the uttermost part of Gibeah, under the pomegranate tree, which is in Migron, and the people who were with him were about six hundred men. And Ahijah, the son of Ahitub, Ichabod's brother, the son of Phinehas, the son of Eli, the priest of Yahweh in Shiloh, wearing an ephod. The people didn't know that Jonathan was gone. Between the passes by which Jonathan sought to go over to the Philistines' garrison, there was a rocky crag on the one side and a rocky crag on the other side. And the name of the one was Boses, and the name of the other Sina. The one crag rose up on the north in front of Michmash, and the other on the south in front of Geba. Jonathan said to the young man who bore his armor, Come, and let us go over to the garrison of these uncircumcised. It may be that Yahweh will work for us, for there is no restraint on Yahweh to save by many or by few. His armor-bearer said to him, Do all that is in your heart. Turn, and behold, I am with you according to your heart. Then Jonathan said, Behold, we will pass over to the men, and we will reveal ourselves to them. If they say thus to us, Wait until we come to you, then we will stand still in our place and will not go up to them. But if they say this, Come up to us, then we will go up, for Yahweh has delivered them into our hand. This shall be the sign to us. Both of them revealed themselves to the garrison of the Philistines. And the Philistines said, Behold, the Hebrews are coming out of the holes where they had hidden themselves. The men of the garrison answered Jonathan and his armor-bearer, and said, Come up to us, and we will show you something. Jonathan said to his armor-bearer, Come up after me, for Yahweh has delivered them into the hand of Israel. Jonathan climbed up on his hands and on his feet, and his armor-bearer after him. And they fell before Jonathan, and his armor-bearer killed them after him. That first slaughter, which Jonathan and his armor-bearer made, was about twenty men, within, as it were, half a pharaoh's length in an acre of land. Israel defeats the Philistines. There was a trembling in the camp, in the field, and among all the people. The garrison and the spoilers, they also trembled, and the earth quaked, so there was an exceeding great trembling. The watchmen of Saul in Gibeah of Benjamin looked, and behold, the multitude melted away, and they went here and there. Then Saul said to the people who were with him, Count now, and see who is missing from us. When they had counted, behold, Jonathan and his armor-bearer were not there. Saul said to Ahijah, Bring the ark of God here for the ark of God was there at that time with the children of Israel. It happened, while Saul talked to the priest, that the tumult that was in the camp of the Philistines went on and increased. And Saul said to the priest, Withdraw your hand. Saul and all the people who were with him were gathered together 
and came to the battle, and behold, every man's sword was against his fellow, and there was a very great confusion. Now the Hebrews who were with the Philistines as before, and who went up with them into the camp from the country all around, even they also turned to be with the Israelites who were with Saul and Jonathan. Likewise all the men of Israel who had hidden themselves in the hill country of Ephraim, when they heard that the Philistines fled, even they also followed hard after them in the battle. So Yahweh saved Israel that day, and the battle passed over by beth -Avon. Jonathan Eats the Honey The men of Israel were distressed that day, for Saul had adjured the people, saying, Cursed is the man who eats any food until it is evening, and I am avenged of my enemies. So none of the people tasted food. All the people came into the forest, and there was honey on the ground. When the people were come to the forest, behold, the honey dropped, but no man put his hand to his mouth, for the people feared the oath. But Jonathan didn't hear when his father commanded the people with the oath. Therefore he put forth the end of the rod who was in his hand, and dipped it in the honeycomb, and put his hand to his mouth, and his eyes were enlightened. Then one of the people answered and said, Your father directly commanded the people with an oath, saying, Cursed is the man who eats food this day. The people were faint. Then Jonathan said, My father has troubled the land. Please, look how my eyes have been enlightened, because I tasted a little of this honey. How much more, if perhaps the people had eaten freely today of the spoil of their enemies which they found? For now has there been no great slaughter among the Philistines. They struck of the Philistines that day from Michmash to Ajalon. The people were very faint, and the people flew on the spoil, and took sheep, and cattle, and calves, and killed them on the ground, and the people ate them with the blood. Then they told Saul, saying, Behold, the people are sinning against Yahweh, in that they eat meat with the blood. He said, you have dealt treacherously. Roll a large stone to me this day. Saul said, Disperse yourselves among the people, and tell them, Bring me here every man his ox, and every man his sheep, and kill them here, and eat, and don't sin against Yahweh in eating meat with the blood. All the people brought every man his ox with him that night, and killed them there. Saul built an altar to Yahweh. This was the first altar that he built to Yahweh. Saul said, Let us go down after the Philistines by night, and take spoil among them until the morning light, and let us not leave a man of them. They said, Do whatever seems good to you. Then the priest said, Let us draw near here to God. The people save Jonathan. Saul asked counsel of God, Shall I go down after the Philistines? Will you deliver them into the hand of Israel? But he didn't answer him that day. Saul said, Draw near here, all you chiefs of the people, and know and see in which this sin has been this day. For as Yahweh lives, who saves Israel, though it is in Jonathan my son, he shall surely die. But there was not a man among all the people who answered him. Then he said to all Israel, You be on one side, and I and Jonathan my son will be on the other side. The people said to Saul, Do what seems good to you. Therefore Saul said to Yahweh, the God of Israel, show the right. Jonathan and Saul were chosen, but the people escaped. Saul said, Cast lots between me and Jonathan, my son. Jonathan was selected. Then Saul said to Jonathan, Tell me what you have done. Jonathan told him and said, 
I certainly did taste a little honey with the end of the rod that was in my hand, and behold, I must die, Saul said. God do so, and more also, for you shall surely die, Jonathan. The people said to Saul, Shall Jonathan die, who has worked this great salvation in Israel? Far from it. As Yahweh lives, there shall not one hair of his head fall to the ground, for he has worked with God this day. So the people rescued Jonathan, that he didn't die. Then Saul went up from following the Philistines, and the Philistines went to their own place. Saul's Victories Now when Saul had taken the kingdom over Israel, he fought against all his enemies on every side, against Moab, and against the children of Ammon, and against Edom, and against the kings of Zobah, and against the Philistines. And wherever he turned himself, he put them to the worse. He did valiantly, and struck the Amalekites, and delivered Israel out of the hands of those who despoiled them. Saul's Family Now the sons of Saul were Jonathan, and Ishvi, and Malkishua, and the names of his two daughters were these, the name of the firstborn, Merab, and the name of the younger, Michael. And the name of Saul's wife was Ahinoam, the daughter of Ahimaaz. The name of the captain of his army was Abner, the son of Ner, Saul's uncle. Kish was the father of Saul, and Ner, the father of Abner, was the son of Abiel. There was severe war against the Philistines all the days of Saul. And when Saul saw any mighty man or any valiant man, he took him to him. Chapter 15 Saul's Disobedience Samuel said to Saul, Yahweh sent me to anoint you to be king over his people, over Israel. Now therefore, Listen to the voice of the words of Yahweh. Thus says Yahweh of armies, I have marked that which Amalek did to Israel, how he set himself against him in the way when he came up out of Egypt. Now go and strike Amalek and utterly destroy all that they have and don't spare them but kill both man and woman, infant and nursing baby, ox and sheep, camel and donkey. Saul summoned the people and numbered them into Laam, 200,000 footmen and 10,000 men of Judah. Saul came to the city of Amalek and laid wait in the valley. Saul said to the Kenites, Go, depart, go down from among the Amalekites, lest I destroy you with them. For you showed kindness to all the children of Israel when they came up out of Egypt. So the Kenites departed from among the Amalekites. Saul struck the Amalekites from Havilah as you go to Shur, that is before Egypt. He took Agag, the king of the Amalekites, alive, and utterly destroyed all the people with the edge of the sword. But Saul and the people spared Agag, and the best of the sheep, and of the cattle, and of the fatlings, and the lambs, and all that was good, and wouldn't utterly destroy them, but everything that was vile and refuse, that they destroyed utterly. Samuel denounces Saul. Then the word of Yahweh came to Samuel, saying, It grieves me that I have set up Saul to be king, for he is turned back from following me and has not performed my commandments. Samuel was angry 
and he cried to Yahweh all night. Samuel rose early to meet Saul in the morning, and it was told Samuel, saying, Saul came to Carmel, and behold, he set up a monument for himself, and turned and passed on, and went down to Gilgal. Samuel came to Saul, and Saul said to him, You are blessed by Yahweh. I have performed the commandment of Yahweh. Samuel said, Then what does this bleeding of the sheep in my ears and the lowing of the cattle which I hear mean. Saul said, They have brought them from the Amalekites, for the people spared the best of the sheep and of the cattle to sacrifice to Yahweh your God. We have utterly destroyed the rest. Then Samuel said to Saul, Stay, and I will tell you what Yahweh has said to me last night. He said to him, Say on. Samuel said, Though you were little in your own sight, weren't you made the head of the tribes of Israel? Yahweh anointed you king over Israel, and Yahweh sent you on a journey and said, Go and utterly destroy the sinners, the Amalekites, and fight against them until they are consumed. Why then didn't you obey the voice of Yahweh, but took the spoils, and did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh? Saul said to Samuel, But I have obeyed the voice of Yahweh, and have gone the way which Yahweh sent me. I have brought Agag, the king of Amalek, and have utterly destroyed the Amalekites. But the people took of the spoil, sheep and cattle, the chief of the devoted things, to sacrifice to Yahweh your God in Gilgal. Samuel said, Has Yahweh as great delight in burnt offerings and sacrifices as in obeying the voice of Yahweh? Behold, to obey is better than sacrifice, and to listen than the fat of rams. For rebellion is as the sin of witchcraft, and stubbornness is as idolatry and teraphim. Because you have rejected the word of Yahweh, he has also rejected you from being king. Saul's Confession Saul said to Samuel, I have sinned. For I have transgressed the commandment of Yahweh and your words, because I feared the people and obeyed their voice. Now, therefore, please pardon my sin and turn again with me, that I may worship Yahweh. Samuel said to Saul, I will not return with you, for you have rejected the word of Yahweh and Yahweh has rejected you from being king over Israel. As Samuel turned about to go away, Saul grabbed the skirt of his robe, and it tore. Samuel said to him, Yahweh has torn the kingdom of Israel from you this day, and has given it to a neighbor of yours who is better than you. Also, the strength of Israel will not lie nor repent, for he is not a man that he should repent. Then he said, I have sinned, yet please honor me now before the elders of my people and before Israel, and come back with me that I may worship Yahweh your God. So Samuel went back with Saul, and Saul worshipped Yahweh. Then Samuel said, Bring here to me Agag, the king of the Amalekites. Agag came to him cheerfully. Agag said, Surely the bitterness of death is past. Samuel said, As your sword has made women childless, so your mother will be childless among women. 
Samuel cut Agag in pieces before Yahweh in Gilgal. Then Samuel went to Ramah, and Saul went up to his house, to Gibeah of Saul. Samuel came no more to see Saul until the day of his death, for Samuel mourned for Saul, and Yahweh grieved that he had made Saul king over Israel. Chapter 16 Samuel anoints David as king. Yahweh said to Samuel, How long will you mourn for Saul, since I have rejected him from being king over Israel? Fill your horn with oil and go. I will send you to Jesse, the Bethlehemite, for I have provided a king for myself among his sons. Samuel said, How can I go? If Saul hears it, he will kill me. Yahweh said, Take a heifer with you and say, I have come to sacrifice to Yahweh. Call Jesse to the sacrifice, and I will show you what you shall do. You shall anoint to me him whom I name to you. Samuel did that which Yahweh spoke and came to Bethlehem. The elders of the city came to meet him, trembling, and said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably, I have come to sacrifice to Yahweh. Sanctify yourselves, and come with me to the sacrifice. He sanctified Jesse and his sons, and called them to the sacrifice. It happened, when they had come, that he looked at Eliab and said, Surely Yahweh's anointed is before him. But Yahweh said to Samuel, Don't look on his face or on the height of his stature, because I have rejected him, for Yahweh sees not as man sees. For man looks at the outward appearance, but Yahweh looks at the heart. Then Jesse called Abinadab and made him pass before Samuel. He said, Neither has Yahweh chosen this one. Then Jesse made Shammah to pass by. He said, Neither has Yahweh chosen this one. Jesse made seven of his sons to pass before Samuel. Samuel said to Jesse, Yahweh has not chosen these. Samuel said to Jesse, Are all your children here? He said, There remains yet the youngest, and behold, he is keeping the sheep. Samuel said to Jesse, Send and get him for we will not sit down until he comes here. He sent and brought him in. Now he was ruddy, and withal of a beautiful face, and goodly to look on. Yahweh said, Arise, anoint him, for this is he. Then Samuel took the horn of oil, and anointed him in the midst of his brothers. And the Spirit of Yahweh came mightily on David from that day forward. So Samuel rose up and went to Ramah. David serves Saul. Now the Spirit of Yahweh departed from Saul, and an evil spirit from Yahweh troubled him. Saul's servants said to him, See now, an evil spirit from God troubles you. Let our Lord now command your servants who are before you to seek out a man who is a skillful player on the harp. It shall happen, when the evil spirit from God is on you, that he shall play with his hand, and you shall be well. Saul said to his servants, Provide me now a man who can play well, and bring him to me. Then one of the young men answered and said, Behold, I have seen a son of Jesse, the Bethlehemite, who is skillful in playing, 
a mighty man of valor, a man of war, prudent in speech, and a comely person, and Yahweh is with him. Therefore Saul sent messengers to Jesse and said, Send me David, your son, who is with the sheep. Jesse took a donkey loaded with bread and a bottle of wine and a young goat and sent them by David his son to Saul. David came to Saul and stood before him. He loved him greatly, and he became his armor-bearer. Saul sent to Jesse, saying, Please let David stand before me, for he has found favor in my sight. It happened, when the evil spirit from God was on Saul, that David took the harp and played with his hand. So Saul was refreshed and was well, and the evil spirit departed from him. End of section 24Chapter 17 Goliath's Challenge Now the Philistines gathered together their armies to battle, and they were gathered together at Soko, which belongs to Judah, and encamped between Soko and Azekah, and Ephes Damim. Saul and the men of Israel were gathered together and encamped in the valley of Elah, and set the battle in array against the Philistines. The Philistines stood on the mountain on the one side, and Israel stood on the mountain on the other side, and there was a valley between them. There went out a champion out of the camp of the Philistines, named Goliath of Gath, whose height was six cubits and a span. He had a helmet of brass on his head, and he was clad with a coat of mail, and the weight of the coat was five thousand shekels of brass. He had brass shin armor on his legs, and a javelin of brass between his shoulders. The staff of his spear was like a weaver's beam, and his spear's head weighed six hundred shekels of iron, and his shield-bearer went before him. He stood and cried to the armies of Israel, and said to them, Why have you come out to set your battle in array? Am I not a Philistine, and you servants to Saul? Choose a man for yourselves, and let him come down to me. If he be able to fight with me and kill me, then will we be your servants. But if I prevail against him, and kill him, then you will be our servants and serve us. The Philistine said, I defy the armies of Israel this day. Give me a man that we may fight together. When Saul and all Israel heard those words of the Philistine, they were dismayed and greatly afraid. Jesse sends David. Now David was the son of that Ephrathite of Bethlehem, Judah, whose name was Jesse, and he had eight sons. And the man was an old man in the days of Saul, stricken in years among men. The three eldest sons of Jesse had gone after Saul to the battle, and the names of his three sons who went to the battle were Eliab, the firstborn, and next to him Abinadab, and the third Shama, David was the youngest, and the three eldest followed Saul. Now David went back and forth from Saul to feed his father's sheep at Bethlehem. The Philistine drew near, morning and evening, and presented himself forty days. Jesse said to David, his son, Now take for your brothers an ephah of this parched grain, and these ten loaves, and carry them quickly to the camp to your brothers, and bring these ten cheeses to the captain of their thousand, and see how your brothers are doing, and bring back news. Now Saul, and they, and all the men of Israel, 
were in the valley of Elah, fighting with the Philistines. David accepts the challenge. David rose up early in the morning and left the sheep with a keeper and took and went as Jesse had commanded him. And he came to the place of the wagons as the army which was going forth to the fight shouted for the battle. Israel and the Philistines put the battle in array, army against army. David left his baggage in the hand of the keeper of the baggage and ran to the army and came and greeted his brothers. As he talked with them, behold, there came up the champion, the Philistine of Gath, Goliath by name, out of the ranks of the Philistines, and spoke according to the same words. And David heard them. All the men of Israel, when they saw the man, fled from him and were terrified. The men of Israel said, Have you seen this man who has come up? He has surely come up to defy Israel. It shall be that the man who kills him, the king will enrich him with great riches, and will give him his daughter, and make his father's house free in Israel. David spoke to the men who stood by him, saying, what shall be done to the man who kills this Philistine and takes away the reproach from Israel? For who is this uncircumcised Philistine that he should defy the armies of the living God? The people answered him in this way, saying, So shall it be done to the man who kills him. Eliab, his eldest brother, heard when he spoke to the men, and Eliab's anger was kindled against David. And he said, Why have you come down? With whom have you left those few sheep in the wilderness? I know your pride and the naughtiness of your heart, for you have come down that you might see the battle. David said, What have I now done? Is there not a cause? He turned away from him toward another and spoke like that again. And the people answered him again the same way. David slays Goliath. When the words were heard which David spoke, they rehearsed them before Saul, and he sent for him. David said to Saul, Let no man's heart fail because of him. Your servant will go and fight with this Philistine. Saul said to David, You are not able to go against this Philistine to fight with him, for you are but a youth and he a man of war from his youth. David said to Saul, Your servant was keeping his father's sheep, and when the lion or bear came and took a lamb out of the flock, I went out after him and struck him and rescued it out of his mouth. When he arose against me, I caught him by his beard and struck him and killed him. Your servant struck both the lion and the bear, this uncircumcised Philistine shall be as one of them, since he has defied the armies of the living God. David said, Yahweh, who delivered me out of the paw of the lion and out of the paw of the bear, he will deliver me out of the hand of this Philistine. Saul said to David, Go, and Yahweh shall be with you. Saul dressed David with his clothing. He put a helmet of brass on his head, and he clad him with a coat of mail. David strapped his sword on his clothing, and he tried to move, for he had not tested it. David said to Saul, I can't go with these, for I have not tested them. David took them off. He took his staff in his hand and chose for himself five smooth stones out of the brook and put them in the shepherd's bag which he had, even in his wallet. His sling was in his hand, and he drew near to the Philistine. The Philistine came on and drew near to David, and the man who bore the shield went before him. When the Philistine looked about and saw David, he disdained him, for he was but a youth and ruddy, and withal of a fair face. The Philistine said to David, Am I a dog that you come to me with sticks? 
the Philistine cursed David by his gods. The Philistine said to David, Come to me, and I will give your flesh to the birds of the sky and to the animals of the field. Then David said to the Philistine, You come to me with a sword and with a spear and with a javelin, but I come to you in the name of Yahweh of armies, the God of the armies of Israel, whom you have defied. Today, Yahweh will deliver you into my hand. I will strike you and take your head from off you. I will give the dead bodies of the army of the Philistines this day to the birds of the sky and to the wild animals of the earth, that all the earth may know that there is a God in Israel, and that all this assembly may know that Yahweh doesn't save with sword and spear, for the battle is Yahweh's, and he will give you into our hand. It happened when the Philistine arose and came and drew near to meet David, that David hurried and ran toward the army to meet the Philistine. David put his hand in his bag, took a stone and slung it, and struck the Philistine in his forehead. And the stone sank into his forehead, and he fell on his face to the earth. So David prevailed over the Philistine with a sling and a stone, and struck the Philistine, and killed him. But there was no sword in the hand of David. Then David ran and stood over the Philistine, and took his sword, and drew it out of its sheath, and killed him, and cut off his head therewith. When the Philistines saw that their champion was dead, they fled. The men of Israel and of Judah arose and shouted and pursued the Philistines until you come to Gai and to the gates of Ekron. The wounded of the Philistines fell down by the way to Shearaim, even to Gath and to Ekron. The children of Israel returned from chasing after the Philistines, and they plundered their camp. David took the head of the Philistine and brought it to Jerusalem, but he put his armor in his tent. Saul notices David. When Saul saw David go forth against the Philistine, he said to Abner, the captain of the army, Abner, whose son is this youth? Abner said, As your soul lives, O king, I can't tell. The king said, Inquire whose son the young man is. As David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, Abner took him and brought him before Saul with the head of the Philistine in his hand. Saul said to him, Whose son are you, you young man? David answered, I am the son of your servant Jesse, the Bethlehemite. Chapter 18 Jonathan Befriends David It happened, when he had made an end of speaking to Saul, that the soul of Jonathan was knit with the soul of David, and Jonathan loved him as his own soul. Saul took him that day, and would let him go no more home to his father's house. Then Jonathan and David made a covenant, because he loved him as his own soul. Jonathan stripped himself of the robe that was on him, and gave it to David, and his clothing, even to his sword, and to his bow, and to his sash. Saul envies David. David went out wherever Saul sent him, and behaved himself wisely. And Saul set him over the men of war, and it was good in the sight of all the people, and also in the sight of Saul's servants. It happened as they came, when David returned from the slaughter of the Philistine, that the women came out of all the cities of Israel, singing and dancing, to meet King Saul, with tambourines, with joy, and with instruments of music. The women sang one to another as they played, and said, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands. Saul was very angry, 
and this saying displeased him. And he said, They have ascribed to David ten thousands, and to me they have ascribed but thousands. What can he have more but the kingdom? Saul eyed David from that day and forward. It happened on the next day that an evil spirit from God came mightily on Saul, and he prophesied in the midst of the house. David played with his hand, as he did day by day. Saul had his spear in his hand, and Saul threw the spear, for he said, I will pin David even to the wall. David escaped from his presence twice. Saul was afraid of David, because Yahweh was with him and was departed from Saul. Therefore Saul removed him from him, and made him his captain over a thousand. And he went out and came in before the people. David behaved himself wisely in all his ways, and Yahweh was with him. When Saul saw that he behaved himself very wisely, he stood in awe of him. But all Israel and Judah loved David, for he went out and came in before them. David marries Michael. Saul said to David, Behold, my elder daughter, Merath, I will give her to you as wife. Only be valiant for me and fight Yahweh's battles. For Saul said, Don't let my hand be on him, but let the hand of the Philistines be on him. David said to Saul, Who am I? And what is my life or my father's family in Israel, that I should be son-in-law to the king? But it happened at the time when Merab, Saul's daughter, should have been given to David, that she was given to Adriel, the Maholothite, as wife. Michael, Saul's daughter, loved David, and they told Saul, and the thing pleased him. Saul said, I will give her to him that she may be a snare to him, and that the hand of the Philistines may be against him. Therefore Saul said to David, You shall this day be my son-in-law a second time. Saul commanded his servants, Talk with David secretly, and say, Behold, the king has delight in you, and all his servants love you. Now therefore be the king's son-in-law. Saul's servants, spoke those words in the ears of David. David said, Does it seem to you a light thing to be the king's son-in-law, since I am a poor man and lightly esteemed? The servants of Saul told him, saying, David spoke like this. Saul said, You shall tell David, The king desires no dowry except one hundred foreskins of the Philistines to be avenged of the king's enemies. Now Saul thought to make David fall by the hand of the Philistines. When his servants told David these words, it pleased David well to be the king's son-in-law. The days were not expired, and David arose and went, he and his men, and killed of the Philistines two hundred men. And David brought their foreskins, and they gave them in full number to the king, that he might be the king's son-in-law. Saul gave him Michael, his daughter, as wife. Saul saw and knew that Yahweh was with David, and Michael, Saul's daughter, loved him. Saul was yet the more afraid of David, and Saul was David's enemy continually. Then the princes of the Philistines went forth, and it happened, as often as they went forth, that David behaved himself more wisely than all the servants of Saul, so that his name was highly esteemed. Chapter 19 Jonathan Warns David Saul spoke to Jonathan, his son, and to all his servants, that they should kill David. But Jonathan... Saul's son, delighted much in David. Jonathan told David, saying, Saul, my father, seeks to kill you. Now therefore,
please take care of yourself in the morning and live in a secret place and hide yourself. I will go out and stand beside my father in the field where you are, and I will talk with my father about you, and if I see anything, I will tell you. Jonathan spoke good of David to Saul his father and said to him, Don't let the king sin against his servant, against David, because he has not sinned against you, and because his works have been very good toward you. For he put his life in his hand and struck the Philistine, and Yahweh worked a great victory for all Israel. You saw it and rejoiced. Why then will you sin against innocent blood to kill David without a cause? Saul listened to the voice of Jonathan, and Saul swore, As Yahweh lives, he shall not be put to death. Jonathan called David, and Jonathan showed him all those things. Jonathan brought David to Saul, and he was in his presence as before. Saul seeks to kill David. There was war again. David went out and fought with the Philistines and killed them with a great slaughter, and they fled before him. An evil spirit from Yahweh was on Saul, as he sat in his house with his spear in his hand, and David was playing with his hand. Saul sought to pin David even to the wall with the spear, but he slipped away out of Saul's presence, and he stuck the spear into the wall. David fled and escaped that night. Michael saves David. Saul sent messengers to David's house to watch him and to kill him in the morning. Michael, David's wife, told him, saying, If you don't save your life tonight, tomorrow you will be killed. So Michael let David down through the window. He went, fled, and escaped. Michael took the teraphim and laid it in the bed and put a pillow of goat's hair at its head and covered it with clothes. When Saul sent messengers to take David, she said, He is sick. Saul sent the messengers to see David, saying, Bring him up to me in the bed, that I may kill him. When the messengers came in, behold, the teraphim was in the bed, with the pillow of goat's hair at its head. Saul said to Michael, Why have you deceived me thus? and let my enemy go, so that he is escaped. Michael answered Saul. He said to me, Let me go. Why should I kill you? Now David fled and escaped, and came to Samuel to Ramah, and told him all that Saul had done to him. He and Samuel went and lived in Naoth. It was told Saul, saying, Behold, David is at Naoth in Ramah. Saul sent messengers to take David. And when they saw the company of the prophets prophesying and Samuel standing as head over them, the Spirit of God came on the messengers of Saul. And they also prophesied. When it was told Saul, he sent other messengers, and they also prophesied. Saul sent messengers again the third time, and they also prophesied. Then went he also to Ramah, and came to the great well that is in Sikhu. And he asked, Where are Samuel and David? One said, Behold, they are at Naoth and Ramah. He went there to Naoth in Ramah. Then the Spirit of God came on him also, and he went on and prophesied until he came to Naoth in Ramah. He also stripped off his clothes, and he also prophesied before Samuel, and lay down naked all that day and all that night. Therefore they say, Is Saul also among the prophets? Chapter 20 Jonathan Helps David
David fled from Naoth in Ramah, and came and said before Jonathan, What have I done? What is my iniquity? What is my sin before your father, that he seeks my life? He said to him, Far from it, you shall not die. Behold, my father does nothing, either great or small, but that he discloses it to me. And why should my father hide this thing from me? It is not so. David swore moreover and said, Your father knows well that I have found favor in your eyes. And he says, Don't let Jonathan know this, lest he be grieved. But truly, as Yahweh lives, and as your soul lives, there is but a step between me and death. Then Jonathan said to David, Whatever your soul desires, I will even do it for you. David said to Jonathan, Behold, tomorrow is the new moon, and I should not fail to dine with the king. But let me go, that I may hide myself in the field to the third day at evening. If your father miss me at all, then say, David earnestly asked leave of me, that he might run to Bethlehem, his city. For it is the yearly sacrifice there for all the family. If he says, It is well, your servant shall have peace. But if he be angry, then know that evil is determined by him. Therefore deal kindly with your servant, for you have brought your servant into a covenant of Yahweh with you. But if there be in me iniquity, kill me yourself, for why should you bring me to your father? Jonathan said, Far be it from you, for if I should at all know that evil were determined by my father to come on you, then wouldn't I tell you that? Then David said to Jonathan, Who shall tell me if perchance your father answers you roughly? Jonathan and David Renew Covenant Jonathan said to David, Come, and let us go out into the field. They both went out into the field. Jonathan said to David, Yahweh, the God of Israel, be witness. When I have sounded my father about this time tomorrow, or the third day, behold, if there be good toward David, shall I not then send to you and disclose it to you? Yahweh do so to Jonathan, and more also, should it please my father to do you evil, if I don't disclose it to you, and send you away, that you may go in peace, and Yahweh be with you, as he has been with my father. You shall not only, while yet I live, show me the loving kindness of Yahweh, that I not die, but also you shall not cut off your kindness from my house forever. No, not when Yahweh has cut off the enemies of David, every one, from the surface of the earth. So Jonathan made a covenant with the house of David, saying, Yahweh will require it at the hand of David's enemies. Jonathan caused David to swear again, for the love that he had to him, for he loved him as he loved his own soul. Then Jonathan said to him, Tomorrow is the new moon, and you will be missed, because your seat will be empty. When you have stayed three days, you shall go down quickly, and come to the place where you did hide yourself when the business was in hand, and shall remain by the stone easel. I will shoot three hours on its side, as though I shot at a mark. Behold, I will send the boy, saying, Go find the arrows. If I tell the boy, Behold, the arrows are on this side of you, take them. Then come, for there is peace to you and no hurt, as Yahweh lives. But if I say this to the boy, Behold, the arrows are beyond you, then go your way for Yahweh has sent you away. Concerning the matter which you and I have spoken of, behold, Yahweh is between you and me forever. So David hid himself in the field, and when the new moon was come, the king sat him down to eat food. The king sat on his seat, as at other times, even on the seat by the wall. And Jonathan stood up, and Abner sat by Saul's side, but David's place was empty. Nevertheless, Saul didn't say anything that day, 
for he thought, Something has happened to him. He is not clean. Surely he is not clean. It happened on the next day after the new moon, the second day that David's place was empty. Saul said to Jonathan his son, Why doesn't the son of Jesse come to eat, neither yesterday nor today? Jonathan answered Saul, David earnestly asked leave of me to go to Bethlehem. He said, Please let me go, for our family has a sacrifice in the city. My brother has commanded me to be there. Now if I have found favor in your eyes, please let me go away and see my brothers. Therefore he has not come to the king's table. Saul seeks to kill Jonathan. Then Saul's anger was kindled against Jonathan, and he said to him, You son of a perverse, rebellious woman, don't I know that you have chosen the son of Jesse to your own shame and to the shame of your mother's nakedness? For as long as the son of Jesse lives on the earth, you shall not be established, nor your kingdom. Therefore now, send and bring him to me, for he shall surely die. Jonathan answered Saul his father, and said to him, Why should he be put to death? What has he done? Saul cast his spear at him to strike him. By this, Jonathan knew that his father was determined to put David to death. So Jonathan arose from the table in fierce anger and ate no food the second day of the month, for he was grieved for David, because his father had done him shame. It happened in the morning that Jonathan went out into the field at the time appointed with David and a little boy with him. He said to his boy, Run, find now the arrows which I shoot. As the boy ran, he shot an arrow beyond him. When the boy was come to the place of the arrow which Jonathan had shot, Jonathan cried after the boy and said, Isn't the arrow beyond you? Jonathan cried after the boy, Go fast! Hurry, don't delay. Jonathan's boy gathered up the arrows and came to his master. But the boy didn't know anything. Only Jonathan and David knew the matter. Jonathan gave his weapons to his boy and said to him, Go, carry them to the city. As soon as the boy was gone, David arose out of a place toward the south and fell on his face to the ground and bowed himself three times. They kissed one another, and wept one with another, and David wept the most. Jonathan said to David, Go in peace, because we have both sworn in the name of Yahweh, saying, Yahweh shall be between me and you, and between my seed and your seed forever. He arose and departed, and Jonathan went into the city. Chapter 21 David takes the consecrated bread. Then came David to Nob, to Ahimelech the priest. Ahimelech came to meet David trembling, and said to him, Why are you alone, and no man with you? David said to Ahimelech the priest, The king has commanded me a business, and has said to me, Let no man know anything of the business about which I send you and what I have commanded you. And I have appointed the young men to such and such a place. Now therefore, what is under your hand? Give me five loaves of bread in my hand, or whatever there is present. The priest answered David and said, There is no common bread under my hand, but there is holy bread, if only the young men have kept themselves from women. David answered the priest and said to him, Truly, Women have been kept from us about these three days. When I came out, the vessels of the young men were holy, though it was but a common journey. How much more, then, today shall their vessels be holy? So the priest gave him holy bread, for there was no bread there but the showbread that was taken from before Yahweh to put hot bread in the day when it was taken away. Now a certain man of the servants of Saul was there that day, detained before Yahweh, and his name was Doeg the Edomite, the best of the herdsmen who belonged to Saul. David said to Ahimelech, 
isn't there here under your hand spear or a sword? For I have neither brought my sword nor my weapons with me, because the king's business required haste. The priest said, The sword of Goliath the Philistine, whom you killed in the valley of Elah, behold, it is here wrapped in a cloth behind the ephod. If you will take that, take it, for there is no other except that here. David said, There is none like that. Give it to me. David flees to Gath. David arose and fled that day for fear of Saul and went to Achish, the king of Gath. The servants of Achish said to him, Isn't this David, the king of the land? Didn't they sing one to another about him in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands? David laid up these words in his heart and was very afraid of Achish, the king of Gath. He changed his behavior before them and pretended to be mad in their hands and scrabbled on the doors of the gate and let his spittle fall down on his beard. Then Achish said to his servants, Look, you see the man is mad. Why then have you brought him to me? Do I lack madmen that you have brought this fellow to play the madman in my presence? Shall this fellow come into my house? Chapter 22 David flees to Adullam and Mespeh. David therefore departed there and escaped to the cave of Adullam. When his brothers and all his father's house heard it, they went down there to him. Everyone who was in distress and everyone who was in debt and everyone who was discontented gathered themselves to him and he became captain over them. And there were with him about 400 men. David went there to Mizpeh of Moab, and he said to the king of Moab, Please, let my father and my mother come out with you until I know what God will do for me. He brought them before the king of Moab, and they lived with him all the while that David was in the stronghold. The prophet Gad said to David, don't stay in the stronghold. Depart and go into the land of Judah. Then David departed and came into the forest of Hereth. Saul slays the priests of Nob. Saul heard that David was discovered and the men who were with him. Now Saul was sitting in Gibeah under the tamarisk tree in Ramah with his spear in his hand and all his servants were standing about him. Saul said to his servants who stood about him, Hear now, you Benjamites! Will the son of Jesse give every one of you fields and vineyards? Will he make you all captains of thousands and captains of hundreds, that all of you have conspired against me, and there is none who discloses to me when my son makes a treaty with the son of Jesse? And there is none of you who is sorry for me or discloses to me that my son has stirred up my servant against me to lie in wait as at this day. Then Doeg the Edomite, who stood by the servants of Saul, answered and said, I saw the son of Jesse coming to Nob, to Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub. He inquired of Yahweh for him, gave him food, and gave him the sword of Goliath the Philistine. Then the king sent to call Ahimelech the priest, the son of Ahitub, and all his father's house, the priests who were in Nob. And they came, all of them, to the king. Saul said, Here now, you son of Ahitub, he answered. Here I am, my lord. Saul said to him, Why have you conspired against me, you and the son of Jesse, in that you have given him bread? and a sword, and have inquired of God for him, that he should rise against me to lie in wait, as at this day. Then Ahimelech answered the king and said, Who among all your servants is so faithful as David, who is the king's son-in-law, and is taken into your counsel, 
and is honorable in your house. Have I today begun to inquire of God for him? Be it far from me. Don't let the king impute anything to his servant, nor to all the house of my father. For your servant knows nothing of all this, less or more. The king said, You shall surely die, Ahimelech, you and all your father's house. The king said to the guard who stood about him, Turn and kill the priests of Yahweh, because their hand also is with David, and because they knew that he fled and didn't disclose it to me. But the servants of the king wouldn't put forth their hand to fall on the priests of Yahweh. The king said to Doeg, Turn and attack the priests. Doeg the Edomite turned, and he attacked the priests, and he killed on that day eighty-five people who wore a linen ephod. He struck Nob, the city of the priests, with the edge of the sword, both men and women, children and nursing babies, and cattle and donkeys and sheep, with the edge of the sword. One of the sons of Ahimelech, the son of Ahitub, named Abiathar, escaped and fled after David. Abiathar told David that Saul had slain Yahweh's priests. David said to Abiathar, I knew on that day, when Doeg the Edomite was there, that he would surely tell Saul, I am responsible for the death of all the persons of your father's house. Stay with me, don't be afraid, for he who seeks my life seeks your life, for with me you shall be in safeguard. Chapter 23 David Delivers Keilah David was told, Behold, the Philistines are fighting against Keilah and are robbing the threshing floors. Therefore David inquired of Yahweh, saying, Shall I go and strike these Philistines? Yahweh said to David, Go, strike the Philistines and save Keilah. David's men said to him, Behold, we are afraid here in Judah. How much more then if we go to Keilah against the armies of the Philistines? Then David inquired of Yahweh yet again. Yahweh answered him and said, Arise, go down to Keilah, for I will deliver the Philistines into your hand. David and his men went to Keilah and fought with the Philistines and brought away their livestock and killed them with a great slaughter. So David saved the inhabitants of Keilah. It happened when Abiathar, the son of Ahimelech, fled to David to Keilah, that he came down with an ephod in his hand. Saul Pursues David it was told Saul that David had come to Keilah. Saul said, God has delivered him into my hand, for he is shut in by entering into a town that has gates and bars. Saul summoned all the people to war, to go down to Keilah, to besiege David and his men. David knew that Saul was devising mischief against him, and he said to Abiathar the priest, Bring the ephod here. Then David said, O Yahweh, the God of Israel, your servant has surely heard that Saul seeks to come to Keilah to destroy the city for my sake. Will the men of Keilah deliver me up into his hand? Will Saul come down as your servant has heard? Yahweh, the God of Israel, I beg you, tell your servant. Yahweh said, he will come down. Then David said, Will the men of Keilah deliver me and my men into the hand of Saul? Yahweh said, They will deliver you up. Then David and his men, who were about six hundred, arose and departed out of Keilah, and went wherever they could go. It was told Saul that David was escaped from Keilah, and he gave up going there. David stayed in the wilderness, in the strongholds, and remained in the hill country, in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul sought him every day, 
but God didn't deliver him into his hand. David saw that Saul had come out to seek his life. David was in the wilderness of Ziph, in the wood. Jonathan, Saul's son, arose and went to David in the woods and strengthened his hand in God. He said to him, Don't be afraid, for the hand of Saul my father shall not find you, and you shall be king over Israel, and I shall be next to you, and that also Saul my father knows. They both made a covenant before Yahweh, and David stayed in the woods, and Jonathan went to his house. Then the Ziphites came up to Saul, to Gibeah, saying, Doesn't David hide himself with us in the strongholds in the wood, in the hill of Hekilah, which is on the south of the desert? Now therefore, O king, come down, according to all the desire of your soul to come down, and our part shall be to deliver him up into the king's hand. Saul said, You are blessed by Yahweh, for you have had compassion on me. Please go, make yet more sure, and know and see his place where his haunt is, and who has seen him there. For it is told me that he deals very subtly. See therefore, and take knowledge of all the lurking places where he hides himself, and come again to me with certainty, and I will go with you, and it shall happen, if he is in the land, that I will search him out among all the thousands of Judah. They arose and went to Ziph before Saul. But David and his men were in the wilderness of Maon, in the Arabah, on the south of the desert. Saul and his men went to seek him. When David was told, he went down to the rock and stayed in the wilderness of Maon. When Saul heard that, he pursued after David in the wilderness of Maon. Saul went on this side of the mountain, and David and his men on that side of the mountain. And David made haste to get away for fear of Saul. For Saul and his men surrounded David and his men to take them. But a messenger came to Saul, saying, Hurry and come, for the Philistines have made a raid on the land. So Saul returned from pursuing after David and went against the Philistines. Therefore they called that place Selah Hamalakoth. David went up from there and lived in the strongholds of En Gedi. Chapter 24 David Spares Saul It happened, when Saul was returned from following the Philistines, that it was told him, saying, Behold, David is in the wilderness of En Gedi. Then Saul took three thousand chosen men out of all Israel and went to seek David and his men on the rocks of the wild goats. He came to the sheep pens by the way, where there was a cave, and Saul went in to relieve himself. Now David and his men were abiding in the innermost parts of the cave. The men of David said to him, Behold, the day of which Yahweh said to you, Behold, I will deliver your enemy into your hand, and you shall do to him as it shall seem good to you. Then David arose and cut off the skirt of Saul's robe secretly. It happened afterward that David's heart struck him because he had cut off Saul's skirt. He said to his men, Yahweh forbid that I should do this thing to my Lord, Yahweh's anointed to put forth my hand against him, since he is Yahweh's anointed. So David checked his men with these words and didn't allow them to rise against Saul. Saul rose up out of the cave and went on his way. David also arose afterward and went out of the cave and cried after Saul, saying, My lord the king! When Saul looked behind him, David bowed with his face to the earth, and did obeisance. David said to Saul, Why do you listen to men's words, saying, Behold, David seeks your hurt? Behold, this day your eyes have seen how that Yahweh had delivered you today into my hand in the cave. Some urged me to kill you, but I spared you, and I said, 
I will not put forth my hand against my Lord, for he is Yahweh's anointed. Moreover, my father, behold, yes, see the skirt of your robe in my hand? For in that I cut off the skirt of your robe and didn't kill you. Know and see that there is neither evil nor disobedience in my hand, and I have not sinned against you, though you hunt for my life to take it. May Yahweh judge between me and you, and may Yahweh avenge me of you, but my hand shall not be on you. As the proverb of the ancients says, Out of the wicked comes forth wickedness, but my hand shall not be on you. Against whom has the king of Israel come out? Whom do you pursue? A dead dog? A flea? May Yahweh therefore be judge, and give sentence between me and you, and see, and plead my cause, and deliver me out of your hand. David's Oath to Saul It came to pass, when David had made an end of speaking these words to Saul, that Saul said, Is this your voice, my son David? Saul lifted up his voice and wept. He said to David, you are more righteous than I, for you have done good to me, whereas I have done evil to you. You have declared this day how you have dealt well with me, because when Yahweh had delivered me up into your hand, you didn't kill me. For if a man finds his enemy, will he let him go away unharmed? Therefore, may Yahweh reward you good for that which you have done to me this day. Now, behold, I know that you shall surely be king, and that the kingdom of Israel shall be established in your hand. Swear now, therefore, to me by Yahweh, that you will not cut off my seed after me, and that you will not destroy my name out of my father's house. David swore to Saul. Saul went home. But David and his men went up to the stronghold. Chapter 25 The Death of Samuel Samuel died, and all Israel gathered themselves together and lamented him, and buried him in his house at Ramah. David arose and went down to the wilderness of Paran. David and Nabal There was a man in Maon whose possessions were in Carmel. And the man was very great, and he had three thousand sheep and a thousand goats, and he was shearing his sheep in Carmel. Now the name of the man was Nabal, and the name of his wife Abigail. And the woman was of good understanding and of a beautiful face. But the man was churlish and evil in his doings, and he was of the house of Caleb. David heard in the wilderness that Nabal was shearing his sheep. David sent ten young men, and David said to the young men, Go up to Carmel, and go to Nabal, and greet him in my name. You shall tell him, Long life to you, peace be to you, and peace be to your house, and peace be to all that you have. Now I have heard that you have shearers. Your shepherds have now been with us. And we did them no hurt, neither was there anything missing to them, all the while they were in Carmel. Ask your young men, and they will tell you. Therefore let the young men find favor in your eyes, for we come in a good day. Please give whatever comes to your hand to your servants and to your son David. When David's young men came, they spoke to Nabal according to all those words in the name of David, and ceased. Nabal answered David's servants and said, Who is David? Who is the son of Jesse? There are many servants who break away from their masters these days. Shall I then take my bread and my water and my meat that I have killed for my shearers and give it to men who I don't know where they come from? So David's young men turned on their way and went back and came and told him according to all these words. David said to his men, Every man put on his sword. 
every man put on his sword. David also put on his sword. About 400 men followed David, and 200 stayed by the baggage. But one of the young men told Abigail, Nabal's wife, saying, Behold, David sent messengers out of the wilderness to greet our master, and he railed at them. But the men were very good to us, and we were not hurt, neither missed we anything as long as we went with them when we were in the fields. They were a wall to us, both by night and by day, all the while we were with them, keeping the sheep. Now, therefore, know and consider what you will do, for evil is determined against our master and against all his house, for he is such a worthless fellow that one can't speak to him. Abigail intercedes for Nabal. Then Abigail hurried and took two hundred loaves of bread, two bottles of wine, five sheep ready dressed, five measures of parched grain, one hundred clusters of raisins, and two hundred cakes of figs, and laid them on donkeys. She said to her young men, Go on before me. Behold, I come after you. But she didn't tell her husband, Nabal. It was so, as she rode on her donkey, and came down by the covert of the mountain, that, behold, David and his men came down toward her, and she met them. Now David had said, Surely in vain have I kept all that this fellow has in the wilderness, so that nothing was missed of all that pertained to him. He has returned me evil for good. God do so to the enemies of David, and more also, if I leave of all that belongs to him by the morning light, so much as one who urinates on a wall. When Abigail saw David, she hurried and alighted from her donkey and fell before David on her face and bowed herself to the ground. She fell at his feet and said, On me, my lord, on me be the iniquity, and please let your handmaid speak in your ears. Hear the words of your handmaid. Please don't let my lord regard this worthless fellow, even Nabal, for as his name is, so is he. Nabal is his name, and folly is with him. But I, your handmaid, didn't see the young man of my Lord whom you sent. Now therefore, my Lord, as Yahweh lives and as your soul lives, since Yahweh has withheld you from blood guiltiness and from avenging yourself with your own hand, now therefore let your enemies and those who seek evil to my Lord be as Nabal. Now this present which your servant has brought to my Lord, let it be given to the young men who follow my Lord. Please forgive the trespass of your handmaid, for Yahweh will certainly make my Lord a sure house, because my Lord fights the battles of Yahweh, and evil shall not be found in you all your days. Though men may rise up to pursue you and to seek your soul, yet the soul of my Lord shall be bound in the bundle of life with Yahweh your God. He will sling out the souls of your enemies as from the hollow of a sling. It shall come to pass, when Yahweh has done to my Lord according to all the good that he has spoken concerning you, and shall have appointed you prince over Israel, that this shall be no grief to you, nor offense of heart to my Lord, either that you have shed blood without cause, or that my Lord has avenged himself. When Yahweh has dealt well with my Lord, then remember your handmaid. David said to Abigail, Blessed is Yahweh, the God of Israel, who sent you this day to meet me. Blessed is your discretion, and blessed are you that have kept me this day from blood guiltiness and from avenging myself with my own hand. For indeed, as Yahweh, the God of Israel, lives, who has withheld me from hurting you, unless you had hurried and come to meet me, Surely there wouldn't have been left to Nabal by the morning light so much as one who urinates on a wall. So David received of her hand that which she had brought him, and he said to her, Go up in peace to your house. Behold, I have listened to your voice and have granted your request. Abigail came to Nabal, and behold, he held a feast in his house like the feast of a king. Nabal's heart was merry within him, for he was very drunken. Therefore she told him nothing, less or more, until the morning light. 
It happened in the morning, when the wine was gone out of Nabal, that his wife told him these things, and his heart died within him, and he became as a stone. It happened about ten days after that Yahweh struck Nabal, so that he died. David Marries Abigail When David heard that Nabal was dead, he said, Blessed is Yahweh, who has pleaded the cause of my reproach from the hand of Nabal, and has kept back his servant from evil. Yahweh has returned the evil doing of Nabal on his own head. David sent and spoke concerning Abigail to take her to him as wife. When the servants of David had come to Abigail to Carmel, they spoke to her, saying, David has sent us to you to take you to him as wife. She arose and bowed herself with her face to the earth and said, Behold, your handmaid is a servant to wash the feet of the servants of my Lord. Abigail hurried and arose and rode on a donkey with five ladies of hers who followed her. And she went after the messengers of David and became his wife. David also took Ahinoam of Jezreel, and they both became his wives. Now Saul had given Michael, his daughter, David's wife, to Paltai, the son of Laish, who was of Galam. Chapter 26 David again spares Saul. The Ziphites came to Saul to Gibeah, saying, Doesn't David hide himself in the hill of Achilah, which is before the desert? Then Saul arose and went down to the wilderness of Ziph, having three thousand chosen men of Israel with him, to seek David in the wilderness of Ziph. Saul encamped in the hill of Hakilah, which is before the desert, by the way. But David stayed in the wilderness, and he saw that Saul came after him into the wilderness. David therefore sent out spies, and understood that Saul had certainly come. David arose and came to the place where Saul had encamped. And David saw the place where Saul lay, and Abner, the son of Ner, the captain of his army. And Saul lay within the place of the wagons, and the people were encamped around him. Then answered David and said to Ahimelech, the Hittite, and to Abishai, the son of Zeruah, brother to Joab, saying, Who will go down with me to Saul? to the camp. Abishai said, I will go down with you. So David and Abishai came to the people by night, and behold, Saul lay sleeping within the place of the wagons, with his spear stuck in the ground at his head, and Abner and the people lay around him. Then Abishai said to David, God has delivered up your enemy into your hand this day. Now therefore, Please let me strike him with the spear to the earth at one stroke, and I will not strike him the second time. David said to Abishai, Don't destroy him, for who can put forth his hand against Yahweh's anointed and be guiltless? David said, As Yahweh lives, Yahweh will strike him, or his day shall come to die, or he shall go down into battle and perish. Yahweh forbid that I should put forth my hand against Yahweh's anointed. But now, please take the spear that is at his head and the jar of water and let us go. So David took the spear and the jar of water from Saul's head, and they went away, and no man saw it, nor knew it, neither did any awake, for they were all asleep, because a deep sleep from Yahweh was fallen on them. David Reproves Abner Then David went over to the other side and stood on the top of the mountain afar off, a great space being between them. And David cried to the people and to Abner, the son of Ner, saying, Don't you answer, Abner? Then Abner answered, Who are you who cries to the king? David said to Abner, Aren't you a man? Who is like you in Israel? Why then have you not kept watch over your lord, the king? For one of the people came in to destroy the king, your lord. 
this thing isn't good that you have done. As Yahweh lives, you are worthy to die, because you have not kept watch over your Lord. Yahweh is anointed. Now see where the king's spear is, and the jar of water that was at his head. Saul knew David's voice and said, Is this your voice, my son, David? David said, It is my voice, my lord, O king. He said, Why does my lord pursue after his servant? For what have I done, or what evil is in my hand? Now, therefore, please let my lord the king hear the words of his servant. If it is so that Yahweh has stirred you up against me, let him accept an offering. But if it is the children of men, they are cursed before Yahweh, for they have driven me out this day that I shouldn't cling to Yahweh's inheritance, saying, Go serve other gods. Now, therefore, don't let my blood fall to the earth away from the presence of Yahweh, for the king of Israel has come out to seek a flea, as when one hunts a partridge in the mountains. Saul acknowledges his sin. Then Saul said, I have sinned. Return, my son David, for I will no more do you harm, because my life was precious in your eyes this day. Behold, I have played the fool and have erred exceedingly. David answered, Behold the spear, O king. Then let one of the young men come over and get it. Yahweh will render to every man his righteousness and his faithfulness, because Yahweh delivered you into my hand today, and I wouldn't put forth my hand against Yahweh's anointed. Behold, as your life was respected this day in my eyes, so let my life be respected in the eyes of Yahweh, and let him deliver me out of all oppression. Then Saul said to David, You are blessed, my son David. You shall both do mightily and shall surely prevail. So David went his way, and Saul returned to his place. Chapter 27 David and the Philistines David said in his heart, I shall now perish one day by the hand of Saul. There is nothing better for me than that I should escape into the land of the Philistines, and Saul will despair of me to seek me any more in all the borders of Israel. So shall I escape out of his hand. David arose and passed over, he and the six hundred men who were with him, to Achish, the son of Maok, king of Gath. David lived with Achish at Gath, he and his men, every man with his household, even David with his two wives, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the Carmelitess, Nabal's wife. It was told Saul that David was fled to Gath, and he sought no more again for him. David said to Achish, If now I have found favor in your eyes, let them give me a place in one of the cities in the country, that I may dwell there. For why should your servant dwell in the royal city with you? Then Achish gave him Ziklag that day. Why Ziklag pertains to the kings of Judah to this day. The number of the days that David lived in the country of the Philistines was a full year and four months. David and his men went up and made a raid on the Geshurites, and the Gerzites, and the Amalekites. For those nations were the inhabitants of the land, who were of old, as you go to Shur. Even to the land of Egypt, David struck the land, and saved neither man nor woman alive, and took away the sheep, and the cattle, and the donkeys, and the camels, and the clothing, and he returned and came to Achish. Achish said, Against whom have you made a raid today? David said, Against the south of Judah, against the south of the Jeramielites, and against the south of the Kenites. 
David saved neither man nor woman alive to bring them to Gath, saying, Lest they should tell of us, saying, So did David, and so has been his way all the while he has lived in the country of the Philistines. Achish believed David, saying, He has made his people Israel utterly to abhor him. Therefore, he shall be my servant forever. End of section 25. Chapter 28 Philistines Gather Against Israel It happened in those days that the Philistines gathered their armies together for warfare to fight with Israel. Achish said to David, Know assuredly that you shall go out with me in the army, you and your men. David said to Achish, Therefore you shall know what your servant will do. Achish said to David, Therefore will I make you my bodyguard forever. Now Samuel was dead, and all Israel had lamented him, and buried him in Ramah, even in his own city. Saul had put away those who had familiar spirits, and the wizards, out of the land. The Philistines gathered themselves together and came and encamped in Shunem. And Saul gathered all Israel together, and they encamped in Gilboa. When Saul saw the army of the Philistines, he was afraid, and his heart trembled greatly. When Saul inquired of Yahweh, Yahweh didn't answer him, neither by dreams, nor by Urim, nor by prophets. Saul and the medium of Endor. Then Saul said to his servants, Seek me a woman who has a familiar spirit, that I may go to her and inquire of her. His servant said to him, Behold, there is a woman who has a familiar spirit at Endor. Saul disguised himself and put on other clothing and went, he and two men with him. And they came to the woman by night, and he said, Please divine to me by the familiar spirit, and bring me up whoever I shall name to you. The woman said to him, Behold, you know what Saul has done, how he has cut off those who have familiar spirits, and the wizards out of the land. Why then do you lay a snare for my life, to cause me to die? Saul swore to her by Yahweh, saying, As Yahweh lives, no punishment shall happen to you for this thing. Then the woman said, Whom shall I bring up to you? He said, Bring Samuel up for me. When the woman saw Samuel, she cried with a loud voice, and the woman spoke to Saul, saying, Why have you deceived me? For you are Saul. The king said to her, don't be afraid, for what do you see? The woman said to Saul, I see a god coming up out of the earth. He said to her, What does he look like? She said, An old man comes up. He is covered with a robe. Saul perceived that it was Samuel, and he bowed with his face to the ground and did obeisance. Samuel said to Saul, why have you disturbed me to bring me up? Saul answered, I am very distressed, for the Philistines make war against me, and God has departed from me and answers me no more, neither by prophets nor by dreams. Therefore I have called you, that you may make known to me what I shall do. Samuel said, Why then do you ask of me? since Yahweh has departed from you and has become your adversary. Yahweh has done to you as he spoke by me. Yahweh has torn the kingdom out of your hand and given it to your neighbor, even to David, 
because you didn't obey the voice of Yahweh and didn't execute his fierce wrath on Amalek. Therefore, Yahweh has done this thing to you this day. Moreover, Yahweh will deliver Israel also with you into the hand of the Philistines. And tomorrow, you and your sons will be with me. Yahweh will deliver the army of Israel also into the hand of the Philistines. Then Saul fell immediately his full length on the earth and was terrified because of the words of Samuel. There was no strength in him, for he had eaten no bread all the day nor all the night. The woman came to Saul and saw that he was very troubled and said to him, Behold, your handmaid has listened to your voice, and I have put my life in my hand, and have listened to your words which you spoke to me. Now, therefore, please listen also to the voice of your handmaid, and let me set a morsel of bread before you, and eat, that you may have strength when you go on your way. But he refused, and said, I will not eat. But his servants, together with the woman, constrained him, and he listened to their voice. So he arose from the earth and sat on the bed. The woman had a fattened calf in the house. She hurried and killed it, and she took flour and kneaded it, and baked unleavened bread of it. She brought it before Saul and before his servants, and they ate. Then they rose up and went away that night. Chapter 29 The Philistines Reject David Now the Philistines gathered together all their armies to Aphek, and the Israelites encamped by the spring which is in Jezreel. The lords of the Philistines passed on by hundreds and by thousands, and David and his men passed on in the rear with Achish. Then the princes of the Philistines said, What about these Hebrews? Achish said to the princes of the Philistines, Isn't this David, the servant of Saul, the king of Israel, who has been with me these days, or rather these years, and I have found no fault in him since he fell away to this day? But the princes of the Philistines were angry with him, and the princes of the Philistines said to him, Make the man return, that he may go back to his place where you have appointed him, and let him not go down with us to battle, lest in the battle he become an adversary to us. For with what should this fellow reconcile himself to his Lord? Should it not be with the heads of these men? Is not this David, of whom they sang one to another in dances, saying, Saul has slain his thousands, David his ten thousands? Then Achish called David and said to him, As Yahweh lives, you have been upright, and your going out and your coming in with me in the army is good in my sight, for I have not found evil in you since the day of your coming to me to this day. Nevertheless, the lords don't favor you. Therefore now return and go in peace that you not displease the lords of the Philistines. David said to Achish, But what have I done? What have you found in your servant, so long as I have been before you to this day, that I may not go and fight against the enemies of my lord the king? Achish answered David, I know that you are good in my sight as an angel of God, notwithstanding the princes of the Philistines have said, He shall not go up with us to the battle. Therefore now, rise up early in the morning with the servants of your Lord who have come with you, and as soon as you are up early in the morning and have light, depart. So David rose up early, he and his men, to depart in the morning, to return into the land of the Philistines. The Philistines went up to Jezreel.
Chapter 30 The Amalekites Raid Ziglag It happened, when David and his men were come to Ziglag on the third day, that the Amalekites had made a raid on the south, and on Ziglag, and had struck Ziglag, and burned it with fire, and had taken captive the women and all who were therein, both small and great. They didn't kill any, but carried them off, and went their way. When David and his men came to the city, behold, it was burned with fire, and their wives, and their sons, and their daughters were taken captive. Then David and the people who were with him lifted up their voice and wept, until they had no more power to weep. David's two wives were taken captive, Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. David was greatly distressed, for the people spoke of stoning him, because the soul of all the people was grieved, every man for his sons and for his daughters. But David strengthened himself in Yahweh his God. David destroys the Amalekites. David said to Abiathar the priest, the son of Ahimelech, Please, bring me here the ephod. Abiathar brought the ephod to David. David inquired of Yahweh, saying, If I pursue after this troop, shall I overtake them? He answered him, Pursue, for you shall surely overtake them, and shall without fail recover all. So David went, he and the six hundred men who were with him, and came to the brook Besor, where those who were left behind stayed. But David pursued, he and four hundred men, for two hundred stayed behind, who were so faint that they couldn't go over the brook Besor. They found an Egyptian in the field, and brought him to David, and gave him bread, and he ate and they gave him water to drink. They gave him a piece of a cake of figs and two clusters of raisins. When he had eaten, his spirit came again to him, for he had eaten no bread nor drunk any water three days and three nights. David asked him, To whom do you belong? Where are you from? He said, I am a young man of Egypt, servant to an Amalekite, and my master left me, because three days ago I fell sick. We made a raid on the south of the Kerithites, and on that which belongs to Judah, and on the south of Caleb, and we burned Ziglag with fire. David said to him, Will you bring me down to this troop? He said, Swear to me, by God, that you will neither kill me, nor deliver me up into the hands of my master, and I will bring you down to this troop. When he had brought him down, behold, they were spread around over all the ground, eating, drinking, and dancing, because of all the great spoil that they had taken out of the land of the Philistines and out of the land of Judah. David struck them from the twilight even to the evening of the next day. Not a man of them escaped from there, except four hundred young men who rode on camels and fled. David recovered all that the Amalekites had taken, and David rescued his two wives. There was nothing lacking to them, neither small nor great, neither sons nor daughters, neither spoil, nor anything that they had taken to them. David brought back all. David took all the flocks and the herds, which they drove before those other livestock and said, This is David's spoil. The spoils are divided. David came to the two hundred men, who were so faint that they could not follow David, whom also they had made to stay at the brook Besor. And they went forth to meet David, and to meet the people who were with him. When David came near to the people, he greeted them. Then all the wicked men and base fellows of those who went with David 
answered and said, Because they didn't go with us, we will not give them anything of the spoil that we have recovered, except to every man his wife and his children, that he may lead them away and depart. Then David said, You shall not do so, my brothers, with that which Yahweh has given to us, who has preserved us, and delivered the troop that came against us into our hand. Who will listen to you in this matter? For as his share is who goes down to the battle, so shall his share be who tarries by the baggage. They shall share alike. It was so from that day forward that he made it a statute and an ordinance for Israel to this day. When David came to Ziklag, he sent of the spoil to the elders of Judah, even to his friends, saying, Behold, a present for you of the spoil of the enemies of Yahweh. He sent it to those who were in Bethel, and to those who were in Ramoth of the south, and to those who were in Jadr, and to those who were in Aror, and to those who were in Sifmoth, and to those who were in Eshtemoa, and to those who were in Rachel, and to those who were in the cities of the Jeramielites and to those who were in the cities of the Kenites, and to those who were in Horma, and to those who were in Boration, and to those who were in Asak, and to those who were in Hebron, and to all the places where David himself and his men used to stay. Chapter 31 Saul's Overthrow and Death now the Philistines fought against Israel, and the men of Israel fled from before the Philistines, and fell down slain on Mount Gilboa. The Philistines followed hard on Saul and on his sons, and the Philistines killed Jonathan and Abinadab and Malkishua, the sons of Saul. The battle went hard against Saul, and the archers overtook him and he was greatly distressed by reason of the archers. Then Saul said to his armor-bearer, Draw your sword, and thrust me through with it, lest these uncircumcised come and thrust me through, and abuse me. But his armor-bearer would not, for he was terrified. Therefore Saul took his sword and fell on it. When his armor-bearer saw that Saul was dead, he likewise fell on his sword and died with him. So Saul died, and his three sons, and his armor-bearer, and all his men, that same day together. The Philistines possessed the towns. When the men of Israel, who were on the other side of the valley, and those who were beyond the Jordan, saw that the men of Israel fled, and that Saul and his sons were dead, they forsook the cities and fled, and the Philistines came and lived in them. It happened on the next day, when the Philistines came to strip the slain, that they found Saul and his three sons fallen on Mount Gilboa. They cut off his head and stripped off his armor and sent into the land of the Philistines all around to carry the news to the house of their idols and to the people. They put his armor in the house of the Ashtaroth, and they fastened his body to the wall of Bethshan. Jabesh Gilead's Tribute to Saul When the inhabitants of Jabesh Gilead heard concerning him that which the Philistines had done to Saul, all the valiant men arose and went all night, and took the body of Saul and the bodies of his sons from the wall of Bethshan. And they came to Jabesh and burnt them there. They took their bones and buried them under the tamarisk tree in Jabesh and fasted seven days. Second Samuel Chapter 1 David Learns of Saul's Death It happened after the death of Saul, when David was returned from the slaughter of the Amalekites, and David had stayed two days in Ziklag. 
it happened on the third day that, behold, a man came out of the camp from Saul with his clothes torn and earth on his head. And so it was, when he came to David, that he fell to the earth and did obeisance. David said to him, Where do you come from? He said to him, I have escaped out of the camp of Israel. David said to him, How did it go? Please tell me. He answered, The people have fled from the battle, and many of the people also have fallen and are dead, and Saul and Jonathan his son are dead also. David said to the young man who told him, How do you know that Saul and Jonathan his son are dead? The young man who told him said, as I happened by chance on Mount Gilboa, behold, Saul was leaning on his spear, and behold, the chariots and the horsemen followed hard after him. When he looked behind him, he saw me and called to me. I answered, Here I am. He said to me, Who are you? I answered him, I am an Amalekite. He said to me, Please stand beside me and kill me for anguish has taken hold of me, because my life is yet whole in me. So I stood beside him and killed him, because I was sure that he could not live after he had fallen. I took the crown that was on his head and the bracelet that was on his arm and have brought them here to my Lord. Then David took hold on his clothes and tore them, and likewise all the men who were with him. They mourned and wept, and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan his son and for the people of Yahweh and for the house of Israel because they were fallen by the sword. David said to the young man who told him, Where are you from? He answered, I am the son of a foreigner, an Amalekite. David said to him, How were you not afraid to put forth your hand to destroy Yahweh's anointed. David called one of the young men and said, Go near and fall on him. He struck him so that he died. David said to him, Your blood be on your head, for your mouth has testified against you, saying, I have slain Yahweh's anointed. David's Song for Saul and Jonathan David lamented with this lamentation over Saul and over Jonathan his son, and he commanded them to teach the children of Judah the song of the bow. Behold, it is written in the book of Jasher. Your glory, Israel, is slain on your high places. How the mighty have fallen! Don't tell it in Gath. Don't publish it in the streets of Ashkelon, lest the daughters of the Philistines rejoice lest the daughters of the uncircumcised triumph. You mountains of Gilboa, let there be no dew nor rain on you, neither fields of offerings, for there the shield of the mighty was vilely cast away. The shield of Saul was not anointed with oil. From the blood of the slain, from the fat of the mighty, Jonathan's bow didn't turn back, Saul's sword didn't return empty. Saul and Jonathan were lovely and pleasant in their lives. In their death they were not divided. They were swifter than eagles. They were stronger than lions. You, daughters of Israel, weep over Saul, who clothed you in scarlet delicately, who put ornaments of gold on your clothing. How are the mighty fallen in the midst of the battle? Jonathan is slain on your high places. I am distressed for you, my brother Jonathan. You have been very pleasant to me. Your love to me was wonderful, passing the love of women. How are the mighty fallen, and the weapons of war perished? Chapter 2 David Anointed King of Judah It happened after this that David inquired of Yahweh, saying, Shall I go up into any of the cities of Judah? Yahweh said to him, Go up. David said, 
Where shall I go up? He said, To Hebron. So David went up there, and his two wives also, Ahinoam the Jezreelitess, and Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite. David brought up his men who were with him, every man with his household. They lived in the cities of Hebron. The men of Judah came, and there they anointed David king over the house of Judah. They told David, saying, The men of Jabesh-Gilead were those who buried Saul. David sent messengers to the men of Jabesh-Gilead and said to them, Blessed are you by Yahweh that you have shown this kindness to your Lord, even to Saul, and have buried him. Now may Yahweh show loving kindness and truth to you. I also will reward you for this kindness, because you have done this thing. Now, therefore, let your hands be strong and be valiant, for Saul your Lord is dead. And also the house of Judah have anointed me king over them. Ishbosheth made king of Israel. Now Abner, the son of Ner, captain of Saul's army, had taken Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, and brought him over to Mahanaim. And he made him king over Gilead, and over the Asherites, and over Jezreel, and over Ephraim and over Benjamin, and over all Israel. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, was forty years old when he began to reign over Israel, and he reigned two years. But the house of Judah followed David. The time that David was king in Hebron over the house of Judah was seven years and six months. Civil War Between Abner and Joab Abner, the son of Ner, and the servants of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, went out from Mahanaim to Gibeon. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and the servants of David went out and met them by the pool of Gibeon. And they sat down, the one on the one side of the pool and the other on the other side of the pool. Abner said to Joab, Please, let the young men arise and play before us. Joab said, Let them arise. Then they arose and went over by number, twelve for Benjamin and for Ishbosheth the son of Saul, and twelve of the servants of David. They caught every one his fellow by the head and thrust his sword in his fellow's side. So they fell down together. Therefore that place was called Helkath Hazurim, which is in Gibeon. The battle was very severe that day, and Abner was beaten, and the men of Israel before the servants of David. The three sons of Zeruiah were there, Joab, and Abishai, and Azahel. And Azahel was as light of foot as a wild gazelle, Azahel pursued after Abner, and in going he didn't turn to the right hand nor to the left from following Abner. Then Abner looked behind him and said, Is it you, Azahel? He answered, It is I. Abner said to him, Turn aside to your right hand or to your left and grab one of the young men and take his armor. But Azahel would not turn aside from following him. Abner said again to Azahel, Turn aside from following me. Why should I strike you to the ground? How then should I hold up my face to Joab, your brother? However, he refused to turn aside. Therefore, Abner, with the back end of the spear, struck him in the body, so that the spear came out behind him, and he fell down there and died in the same place. It happened that as many as came to the place where Azahel fell down and died, stood still. But Joab and Abishai pursued after Abner. And the sun went down when they were come to the hill of Amma, that lies before Gaia, by the way of the wilderness of Gibeon. 
the children of Benjamin gathered themselves together after Abner, and became one band, and stood on the top of a hill. Then Abner called to Joab, and said, Shall the sword devour for ever? Don't you know that it will be bitterness in the latter end? How long shall it be then, before you ask the people to return from following their brothers? Joab said, as God lives, if you had not spoken, surely then in the morning the people would have gone away, and not each followed his brother. So Joab blew the trumpet, and all the people stood still, and pursued after Israel no more, neither fought they any more. Abner and his men went all that night through the Arabah, and they passed over the Jordan, and went through all Bithron, and came to Mahanaim. Joab returned from following Abner, and when he had gathered all the people together, there lacked of David's servants nineteen men and Azahel. But the servants of David had struck of Benjamin and of Abner's men, so that three hundred sixty men died. They took up Azahel and buried him in the tomb of his father, which was in Bethlehem. Joab and his men went all night, and the day broke on them at Hebron. Chapter 3 The House of David Strengthened Now there was long war between the house of Saul and the house of David. And David grew stronger and stronger, but the house of Saul grew weaker and weaker. To David were sons born in Hebron, and his firstborn was Amnon, of Ahinoam, the Jezreelitess, and his second, Kiliab, of Abigail, the wife of Nabal, the Carmelite, and the third, Absalom, the son of Maacah, the daughter of Talmai, king of Geshur, and the fourth, Adonijah, the son of Haggith, and the fifth, Shephatiah, the son of Abidal, and the sixth, Ithream, of Egla, David's wife. These were born to David in Hebron. Abner joins David. It happened, while there was war between the house of Saul and the house of David, that Abner made himself strong in the house of Saul. Now Saul had a concubine, whose name was Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, and Ishbosheth said to Abner, Why have you gone in to my father's concubine? Then was Abner very angry for the words of Ishbosheth, and said, Am I a dog's head that belongs to Judah? Today I show kindness to the house of Saul, your father, to his brothers and to his friends, and have not delivered you into the hand of David. And yet you charge me this day with a fault concerning this woman. God do so to Abner, and more also, if, as Yahweh has sworn to David, I don't do even so to him, to transfer the kingdom from the house of Saul, and to set up the throne of David over Israel and over Judah, from Dan even to Beersheba. He could not answer Abner another word, because he feared him. Abner sent messengers to David on his behalf, saying, Whose is the land? And saying, Make your alliance with me, and behold, my hand shall be with you, to bring all Israel around to you. He said, Good, I will make a treaty with you, but one thing I require of you, that is, you shall not see my face, unless you first bring Michael, Saul's daughter, when you come to see my face. David sent messengers to Ishbosheth, Saul's son, saying, Deliver me my wife, Michael, whom I pledged to be married to me, for one hundred foreskins of the Philistines. Ishbosheth sent and took her from her husband, even from Paltiel, the son of Laish. Her husband went with her, weeping as he went, and followed her to Bahurim. Then Abner said to him, Go, return. 
and he returned. Abner had communication with the elders of Israel, saying, In times past, you sought for David to be king over you. Now then, do it. For Yahweh has spoken of David, saying, By the hand of my servant David, I will save my people Israel out of the hand of the Philistines and out of the hand of all their enemies. Abner also spoke in the ears of Benjamin, and Abner went also to speak in the ears of David in Hebron, all that seemed good to Israel and to the whole house of Benjamin. So Abner came to David to Hebron, and twenty men with him. David made Abner and the men who were with him a feast. Abner said to David, I will arise and go, and will gather all Israel to my lord the king, that they may make a covenant with you, and that you may reign over all that your soul desires. David sent Abner away, and he went in peace. Joab murders Abner. Behold, the servants of David and Joab came from a foray and brought in a great spoil with them. But Abner was not with David in Hebron, for he had sent him away, and he was gone in peace. When Joab and all the army who was with him had come, they told Joab, saying, Abner the son of Ner came to the king, and he has sent him away, and he is gone in peace. Then Joab came to the king and said, What have you done? Behold, Abner came to you. Why is it that you have sent him away, and he is quite gone? You know, Abner, the son of Ner, that he came to deceive you, and to know your going out and your coming in, and to know all that you do. When Joab had come out from David, he sent messengers after Abner, and they brought him back from the well of Syrah. But David didn't know it. When Abner was returned to Hebron, Joab took him aside into the midst of the gate to speak with him quietly, and struck him there in the body, so that he died, for the blood of Asahel, his brother. Afterward, when David heard it, he said, I and my kingdom are guiltless before Yahweh forever of the blood of Abner, the son of Ner. Let it fall on the head of Joab and on all his father's house. Let there not fail from the house of Joab one who has an issue, or who is a leper, or who leans on a staff, or who falls by the sword, or who lacks bread. So Joab and Abishai, his brother, killed Abner, because he had killed their brother Asahel at Gibeon in the battle. David mourns for Abner. David said to Joab and to all the people who were with him, Tear your clothes and clothe yourselves with sackcloth and mourn before Abner. King David followed the bier. They buried Abner in Hebron, and the king lifted up his voice and wept at the grave of Abner, and all the people wept. The king lamented for Abner, and said, Should Abner die as a fool dies? Your hands were not bound, nor your feet put into fetters. As a man falls before the children of iniquity, so you fail. All the people wept again over him. All the people came to cause David to eat bread while it was yet day. But David swore, saying, God, do so to me, and more also if I taste bread, or anything else, until the sun goes down. All the people took notice of it, and it pleased them, as whatever the king did pleased all the people. So all the people and all Israel understood that day that it was not of the king to kill Abner, the son of Ner. The king said to his servants, don't you know that there a prince and a great man has fallen this day in Israel? I am this day weak, though anointed king, and these men, the sons of Zeruiah, are too hard for me. May Yahweh reward the evildoer according to his wickedness.
Chapter 4 The Murder of Ishbosheth. When Ishbosheth, Saul's son, heard that Abner was dead in Hebron, his hands became feeble, and all the Israelites were troubled. Ishbosheth, Saul's son, had two men who were captains of bands. The name of the one was Baana, and the name of the other, Rechab, the sons of Remon, the Beerothite, of the children of Benjamin. For Beeroth also is reckoned to Benjamin. And the Beerothites fled to Gitaim, and have lived as foreigners there until this day. Now Jonathan, Saul's son, had a son who was lame of his feet. He was five years old when the news came of Saul and Jonathan out of Jezreel. And his nurse took him up and fled. And it happened, as she made haste to flee, that he fell and became lame. His name was Mephibosheth. The sons of Rimmon, the Beerothite, Rechab and Baana, went and came about the heat of the day to the house of Ishbosheth as he took his rest at noon. They came there into the midst of the house, as though they would have fetched wheat, and they struck him in the body. And Rechab and Baana, his brother, escaped. Now when they came into the house, as he lay on his bed in his bedroom, they struck him, and killed him, and beheaded him, and took his head, and went by the way of the Arabah all night. They brought the head of Ishbosheth to David, to Hebron, and said to the king, Behold, the head of Ishbosheth, the son of Saul, your enemy, who sought your life. Yahweh has avenged my lord the king this day of Saul and of his seed. David kills the murderers. David answered Rechab and Baana his brother the sons of Remon the Beerothite, and said to them, As Yahweh lives, who has redeemed my soul out of all adversity, when someone told me, Behold, Saul is dead, thinking to have brought good news, I took hold of him and killed him in Ziklag, which was the reward I gave him for his news. How much more, when wicked men have slain a righteous person in his own house, on his bed, shall I not now require his blood of your hand and take you away from the earth? David commanded his young men, and they killed them, and cut off their hands and their feet, and hanged them up beside the pool in Hebron. But they took the head of Ishbosheth and buried it in the grave of Abner in Hebron. Chapter 5 David anointed king over Israel. Then came all the tribes of Israel to David to Hebron, and spoke, saying, Behold, we are your bone and your flesh. In times past, when Saul was king over us, it was you who led out and brought in Israel. Yahweh said to you, You shall be shepherd of my people Israel and you shall be prince over Israel. So all the elders of Israel came to the king to Hebron, and King David made a covenant with them in Hebron before Yahweh, and they anointed David king over Israel. David was thirty years old when he began to reign, and he reigned forty years. In Hebron he reigned over Judah seven years and six months, and in Jerusalem he reigned thirty-three years over all Israel and Judah. David Conquers Jerusalem The king and his men went to Jerusalem against the Jebusites, the inhabitants of the land, who spoke to David, saying, Unless you take away the blind and the lame, you shall not come in here, thinking, David can't come in here. Nevertheless, David took the stronghold of Zion. The same is the city of David. David said on that day, 
Whoever strikes the Jebusites, let him get up to the watercourse and strike the lame and the blind who are hated by David's soul. Therefore, they say, the blind and the lame can't come into the house. David lived in the stronghold and called it the city of David. David built around from Milo and inward. David grew greater and greater, for Yahweh, the God of armies, was with him. Hiram, king of Tyre, sent messengers to David, and cedar trees, and carpenters, and masons, and they built David a house. David's family grows. David perceived that Yahweh had established him king over Israel, and that he had exalted his kingdom for his people Israel's sake. David took him more concubines and wives out of Jerusalem after he was come from Hebron, and there were yet sons and daughters born to David. These are the names of those who were born to him in Jerusalem, Shemua, and Shobab, and Nathan, and Solomon, and Ibhar, and Elishua, and Nephig, and Japhiah, and Elishma, and Eliada, and Eliphalet. David defeats the Philistines. When the Philistines heard that they had anointed David king over Israel, all the Philistines went up to seek David, and David heard of it, and went down to the stronghold. Now the Philistines had come and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. David inquired of Yahweh, saying, Shall I go up against the Philistines? Will you deliver them into my hand? Yahweh said to David, Go up, for I will certainly deliver the Philistines into your hand. David came to baal Perazim, and David struck them there. And he said, Yahweh has broken my enemies before me like the breach of waters. Therefore he called the name of that place baal Perazim. They left their images there, and David and his men took them away. The Philistines came up yet again and spread themselves in the valley of Rephaim. When David inquired of Yahweh, he said, You shall not go up. Circle around behind them and attack them over against the mulberry trees. It shall be when you hear the sound of marching in the tops of the mulberry trees that then you shall stir yourself up. For then Yahweh has gone out before you to strike the army of the Philistines. David did so as Yahweh commanded him and struck the Philistines from Geba until you come to Gezer. Chapter 6 David Fetches the Ark David again gathered together all the chosen men of Israel, 30,000. David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baali Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name, even the name of Yahweh of armies, who sits above the cherubim. They set the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, that was in the hill, and Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, drove the new cart. They brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was in the hill, with the ark of God, and Ahio went before the ark. Uzzah and the ark David and all the house of Israel played before Yahweh with all kinds of instruments, made of fir wood, and with harps, and with stringed instruments, and with tambourines, and with castanets, and with cymbals. When they came to the threshing floor of Nacon, Uzzah put forth his hand to the ark of God, and took hold of it, for the cattle stumbled. 
the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Uzzah, and God struck him there for his error. And there he died by the ark of God. David was displeased because Yahweh had broken forth on Uzzah, and he called that place Perez Uzzah to this day. David was afraid of Yahweh that day, and he said, How shall the ark of Yahweh come to me? So David would not move the ark of Yahweh to be with him in the city of David. But David carried it aside into the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite. The ark of Yahweh remained in the house of Obed-Edom, the Gittite, three months. And Yahweh blessed Obed-Edom and all his house. The Ark Brought to Jerusalem It was told King David, saying, Yahweh has blessed the house of Obed-Edom and all that pertains to him because of the Ark of God. David went and brought up the Ark of God from the house of Obed-Edom into the city of David with joy. It was so that when those who bore the Ark of Yahweh had gone six paces, he sacrificed an ox and a fattened calf. David danced before Yahweh with all his might, and David was clothed in a linen ephod. So David and all the house of Israel brought up the ark of Yahweh with shouting and with the sound of the trumpet. Michael's Contempt for David It was so, as the ark of Yahweh came into the city of David, that Michael, the daughter of Saul, looked out at the window and saw King David leaping and dancing before Yahweh, and she despised him in her heart. They brought in the ark of Yahweh and set it in its place, in the midst of the tent that David had pitched for it. And David offered burnt offerings and peace offerings before Yahweh. When David had made an end of offering the burnt offering and the peace offerings, he blessed the people in the name of Yahweh of armies. He dealt among all the people, even among the whole multitude of Israel, both to men and women, to everyone, a cake of bread and a portion of flesh and a cake of raisins. So all the people departed, everyone to his house. Then David returned to bless his household. Michael, the daughter of Saul, came out to meet David and said, How glorious the king of Israel was today, who uncovered himself today in the eyes of the handmaids of his servants, as one of the vain fellows shamelessly uncovers himself. David said to Michael, It was before Yahweh who chose me above your father, and above all his house, to appoint me prince over the people of Yahweh, over Israel. Therefore will I celebrate before Yahweh. I will be yet more vile than this, and will be base in my own sight. But of the handmaids of whom you have spoken, they shall honor me. Michael, the daughter of Saul, had no child to the day of her death. Chapter 7 David Plans a Temple It happened when the king lived in his house, and Yahweh had given him rest from all his enemies all around, that the king said to Nathan the prophet, See now, I dwell in a house of cedar, but the ark of God dwells within curtains. Nathan said to the king, Go, do all that is in your heart, for Yahweh is with you. God's Covenant with David It happened the same night that the word of Yahweh came to Nathan, saying, Go, and tell my servant David. Thus says Yahweh, Shall you build me a house for me to dwell in? For I have not lived in a house since the day that I brought up the children of Israel out of Egypt, even to this day, but have moved around in a tent and in a tabernacle. 
in all places in which I have walked with all the children of Israel? Did I say a word to any of the tribes of Israel, whom I commanded to be shepherd of my people Israel, saying, Why have you not built me a house of cedar? Now therefore, you shall tell my servant David this, Thus says Yahweh of armies, I took you from the sheep pen, from following the sheep, that you should be prince over my people, over Israel. I have been with you wherever you went, and have cut off all your enemies from before you. I will make you a great name, like the name of the great ones who are in the earth. I will appoint a place for my people Israel, and will plant them, that they may dwell in their own place, and be moved no more. Neither shall the children of wickedness afflict them any more, as at the first, and as from the day that I commanded judges to be over my people Israel. I will cause you to rest from all your enemies. Moreover, Yahweh tells you that Yahweh will make you a house. When your days are fulfilled, and you shall sleep with your fathers, I will set up your seed after you, who shall proceed out of your bowels, and I will establish his kingdom. He shall build a house for my name, and I will establish the throne of his kingdom forever. I will be his father and he shall be my son. If he commits iniquity, I will chasten him with the rod of men, and with the stripes of the children of men. But my loving kindness shall not depart from him, as I took it from Saul, whom I put away before you. Your house and your kingdom shall be made sure forever before you. Your throne shall be established forever. According to all these words, and according to all this vision, so Nathan spoke to David. David's Prayer of Thanksgiving Then David the king went in and sat before Yahweh, and he said, Who am I, Lord Yahweh, and what is my house? that you have brought me thus far. This was yet a small thing in your eyes, Lord Yahweh, but you have spoken also of your servant's house for a great while to come. And this after the way of men, Lord Yahweh. What more can David say to you? For you know your servant, Lord Yahweh. For your word's sake, and according to your own heart, you have worked all this greatness, to make your servant know it. Therefore, you are great, Yahweh God, for there is none like you, neither is there any God besides you, according to all that we have heard with our ears. What one nation in the earth is like your people, even like Israel, whom God went to redeem to himself for a people, and to make him a name, and to do great things for you, and awesome things for your land, before your people, whom you redeemed to you out of Egypt, from the nations and their gods. You established for yourself your people Israel, to be a people to you forever, and you, Yahweh, became their God. Now, Yahweh God, the word that you have spoken concerning your servant, and concerning his house, Confirm it forever, and do as you have spoken. Let your name be magnified forever, saying, Yahweh of armies is God over Israel, and the house of your servant David shall be established before you. For you, Yahweh of armies, the God of Israel, have revealed to your servant, saying, I will build you a house. Therefore your servant has found in his heart to pray this prayer to you. Now, O Lord Yahweh, you are God, and your words are truth, 
and you have promised this good thing to your servant now therefore let it please you to bless the house of your servant that it may continue for ever before you for you lord yahweh have spoken it let the house of your servant be blessed for ever with your blessing chapter eight david's triumphs after this it happened that david struck the philistines and subdued them and david took the bridle of the mother city out of the hand of the philistines he struck moab and measured them with the line making them to lie down on the ground and he measured two lines to put to death and one full line to keep alive the moabites became servants to david and brought tribute david struck also hadadezer the son of rehob king of zobah as he went to recover his dominion at the river david took from him one thousand seven hundred horsemen and twenty thousand footmen and david hamstrung all the chariot horses but reserved of them for one hundred chariots when the syrians of damascus came to help hadadezer king of zobah david struck of the syrians two and twenty thousand men then david put garrisons in syria of damascus and the syrians became servants to david and brought tribute yahweh gave victory to david wherever he went david took the shields of gold that were on the servants of hadadezer and brought them to jerusalem from beta and from berothai cities of hadadezer king david took exceeding much brass when toai king of hamath heard that david had struck all the army of hadadezer then toai sent joram his son to king david to greet him and to bless him because he had fought against Hadadezer and struck him. For Hadadezer had wars with Toai. Joram brought with him vessels of silver, and vessels of gold, and vessels of brass. These also did King David dedicate to Yahweh, with the silver and gold that he dedicated of all the nations which he subdued. Of Syria and of Moab, and of the children of Ammon, and of the Philistines, and of Amalek, and of the spoil of Hadadezer, son of Rehob, king of Zobah. David earned a reputation when he returned from smiting the Syrians in the valley of Salt, even eighteen thousand men. He put garrisons in Edom. Throughout all Edom put he garrisons and all the Edomites became servants to David. Yahweh gave victory to David wherever he went. David's Officers David reigned over all Israel, and David executed justice and righteousness to all his people. Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was over the army, and Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, was recorder, and Zadok, the son of Ahitub, and Ahimelech, the son of Abiathar, were priests, and Sariah was scribe, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the Kerithites and the Pelathites, and David's sons were chief ministers. Chapter 9 David and Mephibosheth. David said, Is there yet any who is left of the house of Saul, that I may show him kindness for Jonathan's sake? There was of the house of Saul a servant whose name was Ziba, and they called him to David. And the king said to him, Are you Ziba? He said, Your servant is he. The king said, is there not yet any of the house of Saul, that I may show the kindness of God to him? Ziba said to the king, 
Jonathan has yet a son who is lame of his feet. The king said to him, Where is he? Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is in the house of Mekur, the son of Amiel, in Lodibar. Then King David sent and fetched him out of the house of Mekur, the son of Amiel, from Lodibar. Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, came to David and fell on his face and did obeisance. David said, Mephibosheth, he answered, Behold your servant. David said to him, Don't be afraid, for I will surely show you kindness for Jonathan, your father's sake, and I will restore to you all the land of Saul, your father. You shall eat bread at my table continually. He did obeisance and said, What is your servant that you should look on such a dead dog as I am? Then the king called to Ziba, Saul's servant, and said to him, All that pertained to Saul and to all his house have I given to your master's son. You shall till the land for him, you and your sons and your servants, and you shall bring in the fruits that your master's son may have bread to eat. But Mephibosheth, your master's son, shall eat bread always at my table. Now Ziba had fifteen sons and twenty servants. Then Ziba said to the king, According to all that my lord the king commands his servant, so your servant shall do. So Mephibosheth ate at the king's table like one of the king's sons. Mephibosheth had a young son whose name was Micah. All that lived in the house of Ziba were servants to Mephibosheth. So Mephibosheth lived in Jerusalem, for he ate continually at the king's table. He was lame in both his feet. Chapter 10 David's Messengers Disgraced It happened after this that the king of the children of Ammon died, and Hanan his son reigned in his place. David said, I will show kindness to Hanan, the son of Nahash, as his father showed kindness to me. So David sent by his servants to comfort him concerning his father. David's servants came into the land of the children of Ammon. But the princes of the children of Ammon said to Hanan, their lord, Do you think that David honors your father in that he has sent comforters to you? Hasn't David sent his servants to you to search the city and to spy it out and to overthrow it? So Hanan took David's servants and shaved off the one half of their beards and cut off their garments in the middle, even to their buttocks, and sent them away. When they told it to David, he sent to meet them, for the men were greatly ashamed. The king said, Wait at Jericho until your beards have grown, and then return. When the children of Ammon saw that they were become odious to David, the children of Ammon sent and hired the Syrians of Beth Rehob and the Syrians of Zobah, twenty thousand footmen, and the king of Maacah with one thousand men, and the men of Tob, twelve thousand men. When David heard of it, he sent Joab, and all the army of the mighty men. The children of Ammon came out and put the battle in array at the entrance of the gate, and the Syrians of Zobah and of Rehob, and the men of Tob and Maacah were by themselves in the field. David defeats Ammon and Syria. Now when Joab saw that the battle was set against him before and behind, he chose of all the choice men of Israel and put them in array against the Syrians. The rest of the people he committed into the hand of Abishai, his brother, and he put them in array against the children of Ammon. He said, If the Syrians are too strong for me, then you shall help me. But if the children of Ammon are too strong for you, 
then I will come and help you. Be courageous and let us be strong for our people and for the cities of our God. And Yahweh do that which seems good to him. So Joab and the people who were with him drew near to the battle against the Syrians, and they fled before him. When the children of Ammon saw that the Syrians had fled, they likewise fled before Abishai and entered into the city. Then Joab returned from the children of Ammon and came to Jerusalem. When the Syrians saw that they were defeated by Israel, they gathered themselves together. Hadad Ezer sent and brought out the Syrians who were beyond the river, and they came to Helam, with Shabak, the captain of the army of Hadad Ezer, at their head. It was told David, and he gathered all Israel together and passed over the Jordan, and came to Helam. The Syrians set themselves in array against David, and fought with him. The Syrians fled before Israel, and David killed of the Syrians the men of seven hundred chariots, and forty thousand horsemen, and struck Shabak, the captain of their army, so that he died there. When all the kings who were servants to Hadad-Ezer saw that they were defeated before Israel, they made peace with Israel and served them. So the Syrians feared to help the children of Ammon any more. End of section 26Chapter 11 David and Bathsheba It happened at the return of the year, at the time when kings go out to battle, that David sent Joab and his servants with him, and all Israel. And they destroyed the children of Ammon, and besieged Rabbah. But David stayed at Jerusalem. It happened at evening that David arose from off his bed and walked on the roof of the king's house. And from the roof he saw a woman bathing, and the woman was very beautiful to look on. David sent and inquired after the woman. One said, Isn't this Bathsheba, the daughter of Eliam, the wife of Uriah the Hittite? David sent messengers and took her, and she came in to him, and he lay with her, for she was purified from her uncleanness. And she returned to her house. The woman conceived, and she sent and told David, and said, I am with child. David sent to Joab, saying, Send me Uriah the Hittite. Joab sent Uriah to David. When Uriah was come to him, David asked of him how Joab did, and how the people fared, and how the war prospered. David said to Uriah, Go down to your house and wash your feet. Uriah departed out of the king's house, and a gift from the king was sent after him. But Uriah slept at the door of the king's house with all the servants of his lord, and didn't go down to his house. When they had told David, saying, Uriah didn't go down to his house, David said to Uriah, Haven't you come from a journey? Why didn't you go down to your house? Uriah said to David, The ark, Israel, and Judah are staying in tents, and my lord Joab and the servants of my lord are encamped in the open field. Shall I then go into my house to eat and to drink and to lie with my wife? As you live and as your soul lives, I will not do this thing. David said to Uriah, Stay here today also, and tomorrow I will let you depart. So Uriah stayed in Jerusalem that day and the next day. When David had called him, he ate and drank before him and he made him drunk. At evening, 
he went out to lie on his bed with the servants of his Lord, but didn't go down to his house. David arranges Uriah's death. It happened in the morning that David wrote a letter to Joab and sent it by the hand of Uriah. He wrote in the letter, saying, Send Uriah to the forefront of the hottest battle and retreat from him that he may be struck and die. It happened when Joab kept watch on the city that he assigned Uriah to the place where he knew that valiant men were. The men of the city went out and fought with Joab. Some of the people fell, even of the servants of David, and Uriah the Hittite died also. Then Joab sent and told David all the things concerning the war, and he commanded the messenger, saying, When you have finished telling all the things concerning the war to the king, it shall be that if the king's wrath arise and he asks you, Why did you go so near to the city to fight? Didn't you know that they would shoot from the wall? Who struck Abimelech, the son of Jerubasheth? Didn't a woman cast an upper millstone on him from the wall, so that he died at Thebes? Why did you go so near the wall? Then you shall say, Your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. So the messenger went, and came, and showed David all that Joab had sent him for. The messenger said to David, The men prevailed against us, and came out to us into the field, and we were on them, even to the entrance of the gate. The shooters shot at your servants from off the wall, and some of the king's servants are dead, and your servant Uriah the Hittite is dead also. Then David said to the messenger, Thus you shall tell Joab, Don't let this thing displease you for the sword devours one as well as another. Make your battle stronger against the city and overthrow it. Encourage him. David marries Bathsheba. When the wife of Uriah heard that Uriah her husband was dead, she made lamentation for her husband. When the morning was past, David sent and took her home to his house, and she became his wife and bore him a son. But the thing that David had done displeased Yahweh. Chapter 12 Nathan Rebukes David Yahweh sent Nathan to David. He came to him and said to him, there were two men in one city, the one rich and the other poor. The rich man had very many flocks and herds, but the poor man had nothing except one little ewe lamb, which he had bought and raised. It grew up together with him and with his children. It ate of his own food, drank of his own cup, and lay in his bosom, and was to him like a daughter. A traveler came to the rich man, and he spared to take of his own flock and of his own herd to dress for the wayfaring man who had come to him, but took the poor man's lamb and dressed it for the man who had come to him. David's anger was greatly kindled against the man, and he said to Nathan, as Yahweh lives, the man who has done this is worthy to die. He shall restore the lamb fourfold because he did this thing and because he had no pity. Nathan said to David, You are the man. This is what Yahweh, the God of Israel, says. I anointed you king over Israel and I delivered you out of the hand of Saul. I gave you your master's house and your master's wives into your bosom and gave you the house of Israel and of Judah. And if that would have been too little, I would have added to you many more such things. 
Why have you despised the word of Yahweh to do that which is evil in his sight? You have struck Uriah the Hittite with the sword and have taken his wife to be your wife and have slain him with the sword of the children of Ammon. Now, therefore, the sword will never depart from your house because you have despised me and have taken the wife of Uriah the Hittite to be your wife. This is what Yahweh says. Behold, I will raise up evil against you out of your own house, and I will take your wives before your eyes and give them to your neighbor, and he will lie with your wives in the sight of this son. For you did it secretly, but I will do this thing before all Israel and before the son. David's Loss and Repentance David said to Nathan, I have sinned against Yahweh. Nathan said to David, Yahweh also has put away your sin. You will not die. However, because by this deed you have given great occasion to Yahweh's enemies to blaspheme, the child also who is born to you shall surely die. Nathan departed to his house. Yahweh struck the child that Uriah's wife bore to David, and it was very sick. David therefore begged God for the child, and David fasted and went in and lay all night on the earth. The elders of his house arose and stood beside him to raise him up from the earth, but he would not, neither did he eat bread with them. It happened on the seventh day that the child died. The servants of David feared to tell him that the child was dead, for they said, Behold, while the child was yet alive, we spoke to him, and he didn't listen to our voice. How will he then harm himself if we tell him that the child is dead? But when David saw that his servants were whispering together, David perceived that the child was dead. And David said to his servants, Is the child dead? They said, He is dead. Then David arose from the earth and washed and anointed himself and changed his clothing. And he came into the house of Yahweh and worshipped. Then he came to his own house. And when he required, they set bread before him and he ate. Then his servants said to him, What is this that you have done? You fasted and wept for the child while he was alive. But when the child was dead, you rose up and ate bread. He said, While the child was yet alive, I fasted and wept, for I said, Who knows whether Yahweh will not be gracious to me, that the child may live. But now he is dead. Why should I fast? Can I bring him back again? I shall go to him, but he will not return to me. Solomon's Birth David comforted Bathsheba, his wife, and went in to her and lay with her. She bore a son, and he called his name Solomon. Yahweh loved him. And he sent by the hand of Nathan the prophet, and he named him Jedidiah, for Yahweh's sake. David Captures Rabbah Now Joab fought against Rabbah of the children of Ammon, and took the royal city. Joab sent messengers to David, and said, I have fought against Rabbah, yes, I have taken the city of waters. Now, therefore, gather the rest of the people together and encamp against the city and take it, lest I take the city and it be called after my name. David gathered all the people together and went to Rabbah and fought against it and took it. He took the crown of their king from off his head 
and its weight was a talent of gold, and in it were precious stones, and it was set on David's head. He brought forth the spoil of the city, exceeding much. He brought forth the people who were therein, and put them under saws, and under iron picks, and under axes of iron, and made them pass through the brick kiln. And he did so to all the cities of the children of Ammon. David and all the people returned to Jerusalem. Chapter 13 Amnon and Tamer It happened after this that Absalom, the son of David, had a beautiful sister, whose name was Tamer, and Amnon, the son of David, loved her. Amnon was so troubled that he fell sick because of his sister, Tamer. For she was a virgin, and it seemed hard to Amnon to do anything to her. But Amnon had a friend, whose name was Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother. And Jonadab was a very subtle man. He said to him, Why, son of the king, are you so sad from day to day? Won't you tell me? Amnon said to him, I love Tamer, my brother Absalom's sister. Jonadab said to him, Lay down on your bed and pretend to be sick. When your father comes to see you, tell him, Please let my sister Tamer come and give me bread to eat and dress the food in my sight, that I may see it and eat it from her hand. So Amnon lay down and faked being sick. When the king came to see him, Amnon said to the king, Please, let my sister Tamer come and make me a couple of cakes in my sight that I may eat from her hand. Then David sent home to Tamer, saying, Go now to your brother Amnon's house and prepare food for him. So Tamer went to her brother Amnon's house and he was laid down. She took dough and kneaded it, and made cakes in his sight, and baked the cakes. She took the pan and poured them out before him, but he refused to eat. Amnon said, Have all men leave me. Every man went out from him. Amnon said to Tamer, Bring the food into the room, that I may eat from your hand. Tamer took the cakes which she had made and brought them into the room to Amnon, her brother. When she had brought them near to him to eat, he took hold of her and said to her, Come, lie with me, my sister. She answered him, No, my brother, do not force me, for no such thing ought to be done in Israel. Don't you do this folly. I, where would I carry my shame? As for you, you will be as one of the fools in Israel. Now, therefore, please speak to the king, for he will not withhold me from you. However, he would not listen to her voice. But being stronger than she, he forced her and lay with her. Then Amnon hated her with exceeding great hatred, for the hatred with which he hated her was greater than the love with which he had loved her. Amnon said to her, Arise, be gone. She said to him, Not so, because this great wrong in sending me away is worse than the other that you did to me. But he would not listen to her. Then he called his servant who ministered to him and said, Put now this woman out from me and bolt the door after her. She had a garment of various colors on her. For with such robes were the king's daughters, who were virgins, dressed. Then his servant brought her out, and bolted the door after her. Tamer put ashes on her head, and tore her garment of various colors that was on her. And she laid her hand on her head, and went her way, crying aloud as she went. Absalom, her brother, said to her, Has Amnon, your brother, been with you? 
But now hold your peace, my sister. He is your brother. Don't take this thing to heart. So Tamar remained desolate in her brother Absalom's house. But when King David heard of all these things, he was very angry. Absalom spoke to Amnon neither good nor bad, for Absalom hated Amnon, because he had forced his sister Tamar. Absalom's Revenge on Amnon It happened after two full years that Absalom had sheep shearers in Baal Hazer, which is beside Ephraim. And Absalom invited all the king's sons. Absalom came to the king and said, See now, your servant has sheep shearers. Please let the king and his servants go with your servant. The king said to Absalom, No, my son, let us not all go, lest we be burdensome to you. He pressed him. However, he would not go, but blessed him. Then Absalom said, If not, please let my brother Amnon go with us. The king said to him, Why should he go with you? But Absalom pressed him, and he let Amnon and all the king's sons go with him. Absalom commanded his servants, saying, Mark now, when Amnon's heart is merry with wine, and when I tell you, strike Amnon, then kill him. Don't be afraid. Haven't I commanded you? Be courageous and be valiant. The servants of Absalom did to Amnon as Absalom had commanded. Then all the king's sons arose, and every man got up on his mule and fled. It happened, while they were in the way, that the news came to David, saying, Absalom has slain all the king's sons, and there is not one of them left. Then the king arose and tore his garments and lay on the earth, and all his servants stood by with their clothes torn. Jonadab, the son of Shimea, David's brother, answered, Don't let my lord suppose that they have killed all the young men, the king's sons, for Amnon only is dead. For by the appointment of Absalom, this has been determined from the day that he forced his sister Tamar. Now, therefore, don't let my lord the king take the thing to his heart, to think that all the king's sons are dead, for Amnon only is dead. Absalom flees to Geshur. But Absalom fled. The young man who kept the watch lifted up his eyes and looked, and behold, many people were coming by way of the hillside behind him. Jonadab said to the king, Behold, the king's sons are coming. It is as your servant said. It happened, as soon as he had finished speaking, that, behold, the king's sons came and lifted up their voice and wept. The king also, and all his servants, wept bitterly. But Absalom fled, and went to Talmai, the son of Amihur, king of Geshur. David mourned for his son every day. So Absalom fled, and went to Geshur, and was there three years. The soul of King David longed to go forth to Absalom, for he was comforted concerning Amnon since he was dead. Chapter 14 Now Joab, the son of Zeruiah, perceived that the king's heart was toward Absalom. Joab sent to Tekoa and fetched there a wise woman and said to her, Please, act like a mourner and put on mourning clothing, please, and don't anoint yourself with oil but be as a woman who has mourned a long time for the dead. Go in to the king and speak like this to him. So Joab put the words in her mouth. When the woman of Tekoa spoke to the king, she fell on her face to the ground and did obeisance and said, Help, O king. The king said to her, 
What ails you? She answered, Truly, I am a widow, and my husband is dead. Your handmaid had two sons, and they both fought together in the field, and there was no one to part them, but the one struck the other and killed him. Behold, the whole family has risen against your handmaid, and they say, Deliver him who struck his brother, that we may kill him for the life of his brother whom he killed, and so destroy the heir also. Thus they would quench my coal which is left, and would leave to my husband neither name nor remainder on the surface of the earth. The king said to the woman, Go to your house, and I will give a command concerning you. The woman of Tekoa said to the king, My lord, O king, the iniquity be on me and on my father's house, and the king and his throne be guiltless. The king said, Whoever says anything to you, bring him to me, and he shall not touch you any more. Then she said, Please let the king remember Yahweh your God, that the avenger of blood destroy not any more, lest they destroy my son. He said, As Yahweh lives, not one hair of your son shall fall to the earth. Then the woman said, Please let your handmaid speak a word to my lord the king. He said, Say on. The woman said, why then have you devised such a thing against the people of God? For in speaking this word, the king is as one who is guilty, in that the king does not bring home again his banished one. For we must die, and are as water spilt on the ground, which can't be gathered up again. Neither does God take away life, but devises means, that he who is banished not be an outcast from him. Now therefore, seeing that I have come to speak this word to my lord the king, it is because the people have made me afraid. And your handmaid said, I will now speak to the king. It may be that the king will perform the request of his servant, for the king will hear to deliver his servant out of the hand of the man who would destroy me and my son together out of the inheritance of god then your handmaid said please let the word of my lord the king bring rest for as an angel of god so is my lord the king to discern good and bad may yahweh your god be with you then the king answered the woman Please, don't hide anything from me that I ask you. The woman said, Let my lord the king now speak. The king said, Is the hand of Joab with you in all this? The woman answered, As your soul lives, my lord the king, no one can turn to the right hand or to the left from anything that my lord the king has spoken. For your servant Joab, he urged me, and he put all these words in the mouth of your handmaid. To change the face of the matter, has your servant Joab done this thing? My Lord is wise, according to the wisdom of an angel of God, to know all things that are in the earth. The king said to Joab, Behold now, I have done this thing. Go therefore, bring the young man Absalom back. Joab fell to the ground on his face, and did obeisance, and blessed the king. Joab said, Today your servant knows that I have found favor in your sight. My lord, king, in that the king has performed the request of his servant. So Joab arose and went to Geshur, and brought Absalom to Jerusalem. The king said, let him return to his own house, but let him not see my face. So Absalom returned to his own house, and didn't see the king's face. Now in all Israel there was none to be so much praised as Absalom for his beauty, from the sole of his foot 
even to the crown of his head, there was no blemish in him. When he cut the hair of his head, now it was at every year's end that he cut it, because it was heavy on him, therefore he cut it. He weighed the hair of his head at two hundred shekels, after the king's weight. To Absalom there were born three sons and one daughter, whose name was Tamer. She was a woman of a beautiful face. Absalom reconciled to David. Absalom lived two full years in Jerusalem, and he didn't see the king's face. Then Absalom sent for Joab to send him to the king, but he would not come to him. And he sent again a second time, but he would not come. Therefore he said to his servants, Behold, Joab's field is near mine, and he has barley there. Go and set it on fire. Absalom's servants set the field on fire. Then Joab arose and came to Absalom to his house and said to him, Why have your servants set my field on fire? Absalom answered Joab, Behold, I sent to you, saying, Come here, that I may send you to the king, to say, Why have I come from Gesher? It would be better for me to be there still. Now, therefore, let me see the king's face, and if there is iniquity in me, let him kill me. So Joab came to the king and told him. And when he had called for Absalom, he came to the king and bowed himself on his face to the ground before the king. And the king kissed Absalom. Chapter 15 Absalom's Conspiracy It happened after this that Absalom prepared him a chariot and horses, and fifty men to run before him. Absalom rose up early and stood beside the way of the gate. It was so that when any man had a suit which should come to the king for judgment, then Absalom called to him and said, What city are you from? He said, Your servant is of one of the tribes of Israel. Absalom said to him, Behold, your matters are good and right, but there is no man deputized by the king to hear you. Absalom said moreover, Oh, that I were made judge in the land, that every man who has any suit or cause might come to me, and I would do him justice. It was so that when any man came near to do him obeisance, he put forth his hand and took hold of him and kissed him. Absalom did this sort of thing to all Israel who came to the king for judgment. So Absalom stole the hearts of the men of Israel. It happened at the end of forty years that Absalom said to the king, Please let me go and pay my vow which I have vowed to Yahweh in Hebron. For your servant vowed a vow while I stayed at Gesher in Syria, saying, If Yahweh shall indeed bring me again to Jerusalem, then I will serve Yahweh. The king said to him, Go in peace. So he arose and went to Hebron. But Absalom sent spies throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, as soon as you hear the sound of the trumpet, then you shall say, Absalom is king in Hebron. Two hundred men went with Absalom out of Jerusalem, who were invited, and went in their simplicity, and they didn't know anything. Absalom sent for Ahithophel, the Gilonite, David's counselor, from his city, even from Gilo, while he was offering the sacrifices. The conspiracy was strong, for the people increased continually with Absalom. David flees Jerusalem. A messenger came to David, saying, The hearts of the men of Israel are after Absalom. David said to all his servants who were with him at Jerusalem, Arise, and let us flee. 
for else none of us shall escape from Absalom. Make speed to depart, lest he overtake us quickly, and bring down evil on us, and strike the city with the edge of the sword. The king's servants said to the king, Behold, your servants are ready to do whatever my lord the king chooses. The king went forth, and all his household after him. The king left ten women, who were concubines, to keep the house. The king went forth, and all the people after him. And they stayed in Beth Merak. All his servants passed on beside him. And all the Carathites, and all the Pelathites, and all the Gittites, six hundred men who came after him from Gath, passed on before the king. Then the king said to Ittai the Gittite, Why do you also go with us? Return and stay with the king, for you are a foreigner and also an exile. Return to your own place, whereas you came but yesterday. Should I this day make you go up and down with us, since I go where I may? Return and take back your brothers, Mercy and truth be with you. Ittai answered the king and said, As Yahweh lives, and as my lord the king lives, surely in what place my lord the king shall be, whether for death or for life, even there also will your servant be. David said to Ittai, Go and pass over. Ittai the Gittite passed over, and all his men, and all the little ones who were with him. All the country wept with a loud voice, and all the people passed over. The king also, himself, passed over the brook Kidron, and all the people passed over, toward the way of the wilderness. Behold, Zadok also came, and all the Levites with him, bearing the ark of the covenant of God. And they set down the ark of God, and Abiathar went up, until all the people finished passing out of the city. The king said to Zadok, Carry back the ark of God into the city. If I find favor in the eyes of Yahweh, he will bring me again, and show me both it and his habitation. But if he say thus, I have no delight in you, behold, here am I. Let him do to me as seems good to him. The king said also to Zadok the priest, Aren't you a seer? Return into the city in peace, and your two sons with you, Ahimaaz, your son, and Jonathan, the son of Abiathar. Behold, I will stay at the fords of the wilderness until word comes from you to inform me. Zadok, therefore, and Abiathar carried the ark of God again to Jerusalem, and they stayed there. David weeps at Mount Olivet. David went up by the ascent of the Mount of Olives, and wept as he went up. And he had his head covered, and went barefoot. And all the people who were with him covered every man his head. And they went up weeping as they went up. Someone told David, saying, Ahithophel is among the conspirators with Absalom. David said, Yahweh, please turn the counsel of Ahithophel into foolishness. It happened that when David had come to the top of the ascent, where God was worshipped, behold, Hushai the archite came to meet him with his coat torn, and earth on his head. David said to him, If you pass on with me, then you will be a burden to me. But if you return to the city and tell Absalom, I will be your servant, O king, as I have been your father's servant in time past, so will I now be your servant, then will you defeat for me the counsel of Ahithophel. Don't you have Zadok and Abiathar the priests there with you? Therefore it shall be that whatever thing you shall hear out of the king's house, you shall tell it to Zadok and Abiathar the priests. 
Behold, they have there with them their two sons, Ahimaaz, Zadok's son, and Jonathan, Abiathar's son. And by them you shall send to me everything that you shall hear. So Hushai, David's friend, came into the city, and Absalom came into Jerusalem. Chapter 16 David and Ziba When David was a little past the top of the ascent, behold, Ziba, the servant of Mephibosheth, met him with a couple of donkeys saddled and on them two hundred loaves of bread, and one hundred clusters of raisins, and one hundred summer fruits, and a bottle of wine. The king said to Ziba, What do you mean by these? Ziba said, The donkeys are for the king's household to ride on, and the bread and summer fruit for the young men to eat, and the wine that such as are faint in the wilderness may drink. The king said, Where is your master's son? Ziba said to the king, Behold, he is staying in Jerusalem. For he said, Today the house of Israel will restore me the kingdom of my father. Then the king said to Ziba, Behold, all that pertains to Mephibosheth is yours. Ziba said, I do obeisance. Let me find favor in your sight, my lord, O king. Shimei Curses David When King David came to Behurim, behold, a man of the family of the house of Saul came out, whose name was Shimei, the son of Jira. He came out and cursed still as he came. He cast stones at David and at all the servants of King David, and all the people and all the mighty men were on his right hand and on his left. Shimei said when he cursed, Be gone, be gone, you man of blood and base fellow. Yahweh has returned on you all the blood of the house of Saul, in whose place you have reigned. Yahweh has delivered the kingdom into the hand of Absalom, your son. Behold, you are caught by your own mischief, because you are a man of blood. Then Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, said to the king, Why should this dead dog curse my lord the king? Please let me go over and take off his head. The king said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah? Because he curses, and because Yahweh has said to him, Curse David. Who then shall say, Why have you done so? David said to Abishai and to all his servants, Behold, my son who came forth from my bowels seeks my life. How much more this Benjamite now? Leave him alone and let him curse, for Yahweh has invited him. It may be that Yahweh will look on the wrong done to me and that Yahweh will repay me good for the cursing of me today. So David and his men went by the way, and Shimei went along on the hillside opposite him, and cursed as he went, threw stones at him, and threw dust. The king and all the people who were with him came weary, and he refreshed himself there. The Council of Ahithophel and Hushai. Absalom and all the people, the men of Israel, came to Jerusalem, and Ahithophel with him. It happened when Hushai the archite, David's friend, had come to Absalom, that Hushai said to Absalom, Long live the king! Long live the king! Absalom said to Hushai, is this your kindness to your friend? Why didn't you go with your friend? Hushai said to Absalom, No, but whoever Yahweh and this people and all the men of Israel have chosen, his will I be, and with him I will stay. Again, 
whom should I serve? Shouldn't I serve in the presence of his son? As I have served in your father's presence, so will I be in your presence. Then Absalom said to Ahithophel, Give your counsel what we shall do. Ahithophel said to Absalom, Go in to your father's concubines that he has left to keep the house. Then all Israel will hear that you are abhorred by your father. Then the hands of all who are with you will be strong. So they spread Absalom a tent on the top of the house, and Absalom went in to his father's concubines in the sight of all Israel. The counsel of Ahithophel, which he gave in those days, was as if a man inquired at the oracle of God, so was all the counsel of Ahithophel, both with David and with Absalom. Chapter 17 Hushai Counters Ahithophel's Advice Moreover, Ahithophel said to Absalom, Let me now choose twelve thousand men, and I will arise and pursue after David tonight. I will come on him while he is weary and exhausted, and will make him afraid. All the people who are with him shall flee. I will strike the king only, and I will bring back all the people to you. The man whom you seek is as if all returned. All the people shall be in peace. The saying pleased Absalom well, and all the elders of Israel. Then Absalom said, Now call Hushai the archite also, and let us hear likewise what he says. When Hushai was come to Absalom, Absalom spoke to him, saying, Ahithophel has spoken like this. Shall we do what he says? If not, speak up. Hushai said to Absalom, The counsel that Ahithophel has given this time is not good. Hushai said moreover, you know your father and his men, that they are mighty men, and they are fierce in their minds, like a bear robbed of her cubs in the field. Your father is a man of war, and will not lodge with the people. Behold, he is now hidden in some pit, or in some other place. It will happen, when some of them have fallen at the first, that whoever hears it will say, There is a slaughter among the people who follow Absalom. Even he who is valiant, whose heart is as the heart of a lion, will utterly melt. For all Israel knows that your father is a mighty man, and those who are with him are valiant men. But I counsel that all Israel be gathered together to you, from Dan even to Beersheba, as the sand that is by the sea for multitude, and that you go to battle in your own person. So shall we come on him in some place where he shall be found, and we will light on him as the dew falls on the ground. And of him and of all the men who are with him, we will not leave so much as one. Moreover, if he be gone into a city, then shall all Israel bring ropes to that city, and we will draw it into the river, until there isn't one small stone found there. Absalom and all the men of Israel said, the counsel of Hushai the archite is better than the counsel of Ahithophel. For Yahweh had ordained to defeat the good counsel of Ahithophel to the intent that Yahweh might bring evil on Absalom. Hushai's warning saves David. Then Hushai said to Zadok and to Abiathar the priests, Ahithophel counseled Absalom and the elders of Israel that way, and I have counseled this way. Now therefore, send quickly and tell David, saying, Don't lodge this night at the fords of the wilderness, but by all means pass over, lest the king be swallowed up and all the people who are with him. Now Jonathan and Ahimaaz were staying by Enrogel, and a female servant used to go and tell them, and they went and told King David, for they might not be seen to come into the city. But a boy saw them and told Absalom. Then they both went away quickly and came to the house of a man in Bahurim who had a well in his court, and they went down there. 
the woman took and spread the covering over the well's mouth and spread out bruised grain on it, and nothing was known. Absalom's servants came to the woman to the house, and they said, Where are Ahimaaz and Jonathan? The woman said to them, They have gone over the brook of water. When they had sought and could not find them, they returned to Jerusalem. It happened, after they had departed, that they came up out of the well and went and told King David. And they said to David, Arise and pass quickly over the water, for thus has Ahithophel counseled against you. Then David arose, and all the people who were with him, and they passed over the Jordan. By the morning light there lacked not one of them who had not gone over the Jordan. When Ahithophel saw that his counsel was not followed, he saddled his donkey and arose and went home to his city and set his house in order and hanged himself. And he died and was buried in the tomb of his father. Then David came to Mahanaim. Absalom passed over the Jordan, he and all the men of Israel with him. Absalom set Amasa over the army instead of Joab. Now Amasa was the son of a man whose name was Ithra the Israelite, who went in to Abigail, the daughter of Nahash, sister to Zeruiah, Joab's mother. Israel and Absalom encamped in the land of Gilead. It happened, when David was come to Mahanaim, that Shobai, the son of Nahash of Rabbah, of the children of Ammon, and Mekir, the son of Amiel of Lodibar, and Bazillai, the Gileadite of Rogalim, brought beds and basins and earthen vessels and wheat and barley and meal and parched grain and beans and lentils and parched pulse and honey and butter and sheep and cheese of the herd for David and for the people who were with him to eat. For they said, The people are hungry and weary and thirsty in the wilderness. Chapter 18 Absalom Killed David numbered the people who were with him, and set captains of thousands and captains of hundreds over them. David sent forth the people, a third part under the hand of Joab, and a third part under the hand of Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, Joab's brother, and a third part under the hand of Ittai, the Gittite. The king said to the people, I will surely go forth with you myself also. But the people said, You shall not go forth, for if we flee away, they will not care for us. Neither if half of us die will they care for us. But you are worth ten thousand of us. Therefore now, it is better that you are ready to help us out of the city. The king said to them, I will do what seems best to you. The king stood beside the gate, and all the people went out by hundreds and by thousands. The king commanded Joab and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Deal gently for my sake with the young man, even with Absalom. All the people heard when the king commanded all the captains concerning Absalom. So the people went out into the field against Israel, and the battle was in the forest of Ephraim. The people of Israel were struck there before the servants of David, and there was a great slaughter there that day of twenty thousand men. For the battle was there spread over the surface of all the country, and the forest devoured more people that day than the sword devoured. Absalom happened to meet the servants of David. Absalom was riding on his mule, and the mule went under the thick boughs of a great oak, and his head caught hold of the oak, and he was taken up between the sky and the earth, and the mule that was under him went on. A certain man saw it and told Joab and said, Behold! I saw Absalom hanging in an oak. Joab said to the man who told him, Behold, you saw it, and why didn't you strike him there to the ground? 
I would have given you ten pieces of silver and a sash, the man said to Joab. Though I should receive a thousand pieces of silver in my hand, I still wouldn't put forth my hand against the king's son. For in our hearing, the king commanded you and Abishai and Ittai, saying, Beware that none touch the young man Absalom. Otherwise, if I had dealt falsely against his life, and there is no matter hidden from the king, then you yourself would have set yourself against me. Then Joab said, I am not going to wait like this with you. He took three darts in his hand and thrust them through the heart of Absalom while he was yet alive in the midst of the oak. Ten young men who bore Joab's armor surrounded and struck Absalom and killed him. Joab blew the trumpet and the people returned from pursuing after Israel, for Joab held back the people. They took Absalom and cast him into the great pit in the forest and raised over him a very great heap of stones. Then all Israel fled, everyone to his tent. Now Absalom, in his lifetime, had taken and reared up for himself the pillar, which is in the king's dale. For he said, I have no son to keep my name in memory. He called the pillar after his own name and it is called Absalom's Monument to this day. David Mourns for Absalom Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said, Let me now run and bear the king news, how that Yahweh has avenged him of his enemies. Joab said to him, You shall not be the bearer of news this day, but you shall bear news another day. But today you shall bear no news, because the king's son is dead. Then Joab said to the Cushite, Go, tell the king what you have seen. The Cushite bowed himself to Joab and ran. Then Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok, said yet again to Joab, But come what may, please let me also run after the Cushite. Joab said, why do you want to run, my son, since that you will have no reward for the news? But come what may, he said, I will run. He said to him, Run. Then Ahimaaz ran by the way of the plain and outran the Cushite. Now David was sitting between the two gates, and the watchman went up to the roof of the gate to the wall and lifted up his eyes, and looked, and behold, a man running alone. The watchman cried, and told the king. The king said, If he is alone, there is news in his mouth. He came closer and closer. The watchman saw another man running, and the watchman called to the porter, and said, Behold, a man running alone. The king said, he also brings news. The watchman said, I think the running of the first one is like the running of Ahimaaz, the son of Zadok. The king said, He is a good man and comes with good news. Ahimaaz called and said to the king, All is well. He bowed himself before the king with his face to the earth and said, Blessed is Yahweh, your God, who has delivered up the men who lifted up their hand against my lord, the king. The king said, Is it well with the young man, Absalom? Ahimaaz answered, When Joab sent the king's servant, even me, your servant, I saw a great tumult, but I don't know what it was. The king said, Turn aside and stand here. He turned aside and stood still. Behold, the Cushite came. The Cushite said, News for my lord the king, for Yahweh has avenged you this day of all those who rose up against you. The king said to the Cushite, Is it well with the young man Absalom? The Cushite answered, May the enemies of my lord the king and all who rise up against you to do you harm be as that young man is. The king was much moved 
and went up to the room over the gate and wept. As he went, he said, My son, Absalom, my son, my son, Absalom, I wish I had died for you, Absalom, my son, my son. Chapter 19 Joab Reproves David It was told Joab, Behold, the king weeps and mourns for Absalom. The victory that day was turned into mourning to all the people, for the people heard it said that day, The king grieves for his son. The people snuck into the city that day, as people who are ashamed steal away when they flee in battle. The king covered his face, and the king cried with a loud voice, My son, Absalom! Absalom! My son! My son! Joab came into the house to the king and said, You have shamed this day the faces of all your servants, who this day have saved your life and the lives of your sons and of your daughters and the lives of your wives and the lives of your concubines, in that you love those who hate you and hate those who love you. For you have declared this day that princes and servants are nothing to you. For today I perceive that if Absalom had lived and all we had died this day, then it would have pleased you well. Now, therefore, Arise, go out and speak to comfort your servants. For I swear by Yahweh, if you don't go out, not a man will stay with you this night. That would be worse to you than all the evil that has happened to you from your youth until now. David Restored as King Then the king arose and sat in the gate. They told all the people, saying, Behold, the king is sitting in the gate. All the people came before the king. Now Israel had fled every man to his tent. All the people were at strife throughout all the tribes of Israel, saying, The king delivered us out of the hand of our enemies, and he saved us out of the hand of the Philistines. And now he has fled out of the land from Absalom. Absalom, whom we anointed over us, is dead in battle. Now, therefore, why don't you speak a word of bringing the king back? King David sent to Zadok and to Abiathar the priests, saying, Speak to the elders of Judah, saying, Why are you the last to bring the king back to his house? Since the speech of all Israel has come to the king to return him to his house, you are my brothers, you are my bone and my flesh. Why then are you the last to bring back the king? Say to Amasa, aren't you my bone and my flesh? God, do so to me, and more also, if you aren't captain of the army before me continually in the room of Joab. He bowed the heart of all the men of Judah, even as the heart of one man so that they sent to the king, saying, Return, you and all your servants. David returns to Jerusalem. So the king returned and came to the Jordan. Judah came to Gilgal to go to meet the king, to bring the king over the Jordan. Shimei, the son of Jerah, the Benjamite, who was of Behurim, hurried, and came down with the men of Judah to meet King David. There were a thousand men of Benjamin with him, and Ziba, the servant of the house of Saul, and his fifteen sons, and his twenty servants with him. And they went through the Jordan in the presence of the king. Shimei pardoned. A ferry boat went to bring over the king's household, and to do what he thought good. Shimei, the son of Jerah, fell down before the king when he was come over the Jordan. He said to the king, 
Don't let my Lord impute iniquity to me. Neither do you remember that which your servant did perversely, the day that my Lord the King went out of Jerusalem, that the King should take it to his heart. For your servant knows that I have sinned. Therefore, behold, I have come this day, the first of all the house of Joseph, to go down to meet my lord the king. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, answered, Shall Shimei not be put to death for this, because he cursed Yahweh's anointed? David said, What have I to do with you, you sons of Zeruiah, that you should this day be adversaries to me? Shall there any man be put to death this day in Israel? For don't I know that I am this day king over Israel? The king said to Shimei, You shall not die. The king swore to him. Mephibosheth excused. Mephibosheth, the son of Saul, came down to meet the king. And he had neither groomed his feet, nor trimmed his beard, nor washed his clothes, from the day the king departed until the day he came home in peace. It happened, when he had come to Jerusalem to meet the king, that the king said to him, Why didn't you go with me, Mephibosheth? He answered, My lord, O king, my servant deceived me, for your servant said, I will saddle me a donkey, that I may ride thereon, and go with the king, because your servant is lame. He has slandered your servant to my lord the king, but my lord the king is as an angel of God. Do therefore what is good in your eyes. For all my father's house were but dead men before my lord the king, yet you set your servant among those who ate at your own table. What right, therefore, have I yet, that I should cry any more to the king? The king said to him, Why do you speak any more of your matters? I say, you and Ziba divide the land. Mephibosheth said to the king, Yes, let him take all, because my lord the king has come in peace to his own house. David's Kindness to Barzillai Barzillai the Gileadite came down from Rogalim, and he went over the Jordan with the king to conduct him over the Jordan. Now Barzillai was a very aged man, even eighty years old, and he had provided the king with sustenance while he lay at Mahanaim, for he was a very great man. The king said to Barzillai, Come over with me and I will sustain you with me in Jerusalem. Barzillai said to the king, How many are the days of the years of my life that I should go up with the king to Jerusalem? I am this day eighty years old. Can I discern between good and bad? Can your servant taste what I eat or what I drink? Can I hear any more the voice of singing men and singing women? Why then should your servant be yet a burden to my lord the king? Your servant would but just go over the Jordan with the king. Why should the king repay me with such a reward? Please let your servant turn back again that I may die in my own city, by the grave of my father and my mother. But behold, your servant Kim him. Let him go over with my lord the king, and do to him what shall seem good to you. The king answered, Kim him shall go over with me, and I will do to him that which shall seem good to you. Whatever you require of me, that I will do for you. All the people went over the Jordan, and the king went over. Then the king kissed Barzillai, and blessed him, and he returned to his own place. So the king went over to Gilgal, 
and Kimham went over with him. All the people of Judah brought the king over, and also half the people of Israel. Contention over the king Behold, all the men of Israel came to the king, and said to the king, Why have our brothers, the men of Judah, stolen you away, and brought the king and his household over the Jordan, and all David's men with him? All the men of Judah answered the men of Israel, Because the king is a close relative to us. Why then are you angry about this matter? Have we eaten at all at the king's cost? Or has he given us any gift? The men of Israel answered the men of Judah and said, We have ten parts in the king, and we have also more claim to David than you. Why then did you despise us? that our advice should not be first had in bringing back our king. The words of the men of Judah were fiercer than the words of the men of Israel. End of section 27Sheba's Rebellion There happened to be there a base fellow, whose name was Sheba, the son of Bekri, a Benjamite. And he blew the trumpet and said, We have no portion in David, neither have we inheritance in the son of Jesse. Every man to his tents, Israel. So all the men of Israel went up from following David, and followed Sheba, the son of Bekri. But the men of Judah joined with their king, from the Jordan even to Jerusalem. David came to his house at Jerusalem, and the king took the ten women, his concubines, whom he had left to keep the house, and put them in custody, and provided them with sustenance, but didn't go into them. So they were shut up to the day of their death, living in widowhood. Then the king said to Amasa, Call me the men of Judah together within three days, and be here present. So Amasa went to call the men of Judah together, but he stayed longer than the set time which he had appointed him. David said to Abishai, Now Sheba, the son of Bekri, will do us more harm than did Absalom. Take your Lord's servants and pursue after him, lest he get himself fortified cities and escape out of our sight. There went out after him Joab's men, and the Carathites, and the Pelathites, and all the mighty men. And they went out of Jerusalem to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bekri. When they were at the great stone which is in Gibeon, Amasa came to meet them. Joab was clothed in his apparel of war which he had put on, and on it was a sash with a sword fastened on his waist in its sheath. And as he went forth, it fell out. Joab said to Amasa, Is it well with you, my brother? Joab took Amasa by the beard with his right hand to kiss him. Amasa slain. But Amasa took no heed to the sword that was in Joab's hand. So he struck him with it in the body, and shed out his bowels to the ground, and didn't strike him again. And he died. Joab and Abishai his brother pursued after Sheba, the son of Bichri. There stood by him one of Joab's young men, and said, He who favors Joab, and he who is for David, let him follow Joab. Amasa lay wallowing in his blood in the midst of the highway. When the men saw that all the people stood still, he carried Amasa out of the highway into the field, and cast a garment over him when he saw that everyone who came by him stood still. The rebellion stopped. 
when he was removed out of the highway, all the people went on after Joab to pursue after Sheba, the son of Bichri. He went through all the tribes of Israel to Abel and to Bethmaacah and all the Beerites, and they were gathered together and went also after him. They came and besieged him in Abel of Bethmaacah, and they cast up a mound against the city, and it stood against the rampart. And all the people who were with Joab battered the wall to throw it down. Then a wise woman cried out of the city, Here, here, please say to Joab, Come near here, that I may speak with you. He came near to her, and the woman said, are you Joab? He answered, I am. Then she said to him, Hear the words of your handmaid. He answered, I do hear. Then she spoke, saying, They were used to say in old times, They shall surely ask counsel at Abel, and so they settled it. I am among those who are peaceable and faithful in Israel. You seek to destroy a city and a mother in Israel. Why will you swallow up the inheritance of Yahweh? Joab answered, Far be it, far be it from me, that I should swallow up or destroy. The matter is not so. But a man of the hill country of Ephraim, Sheba, the son of Bichri by name, has lifted up his hand against the king, even against David. Deliver him only, and I will depart from the city. The woman said to Joab, Behold, his head shall be thrown to you over the wall. Then the woman went to all the people in her wisdom. They cut off the head of Sheba, the son of Bichri, and threw it out to Joab. He blew the trumpet, and they were dispersed from the city, every man to his tent. Joab returned to Jerusalem to the king. Now Joab was over all the army of Israel, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada was over the Carathites and over the Pelathites, and Adoram was over the men subject to forced labor, and Jehoshaphat the son of Ahilut was the recorder, and Shiva was scribe and Zadok and Abiathar were priests, and also Ira the Jairite was chief minister to David. Chapter 21 David Avenges the Gibeonites There was a famine in the days of David, three years, year after year, and David sought the face of Yahweh, Yahweh said, It is for Saul and for his bloody house, because he put to death the Gibeonites. The king called the Gibeonites and said to them, Now the Gibeonites were not of the children of Israel, but of the remnant of the Amorites. And the children of Israel had sworn to them, and Saul sought to kill them in his zeal for the children of Israel and Judah. And David said to the Gibeonites, What shall I do for you? And with what shall I make atonement, that you may bless the inheritance of Yahweh? The Gibeonites said to him, It is no matter of silver or gold between us and Saul or his house, Neither is it for us to put any man to death in Israel. He said, Whatever you say, that will I do for you. They said to the king, The man who consumed us and who devised against us that we should be destroyed from remaining in any of the borders of Israel, let seven men of his sons be delivered to us and we will hang them up to Yahweh in Gibeah of Saul, the chosen of Yahweh. The king said, I will give them. But the king spared Mephibosheth, the son of Jonathan, the son of Saul, because of Yahweh's oath that was between them, 
between David and Jonathan, the son of Saul. But the king took the two sons of Rizpah, the daughter of Aiah, whom she bore to Saul, Armoni and Mephibosheth, and the five sons of Michael, the daughter of Saul, whom she bore to Adriel, the son of Barzillai, the Maholothite. He delivered them into the hands of the Gibeonites, and they hanged them in the mountain before Yahweh, and all seven of them fell together. They were put to death in the days of harvest, in the first days at the beginning of barley harvest. Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, took sackcloth and spread it for her on the rock, from the beginning of harvest until water was poured on them from the sky. She allowed neither the birds of the sky to rest on them by day, nor the animals of the field by night. It was told David what Rizpah, the daughter of Aya, the concubine of Saul, had done. David went and took the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son, from the men of Jabesh-Gilead, who had stolen them from the street of beth Shun, where the Philistines had hanged them, in the day that the Philistines killed Saul in Gilboa. And he brought up from there the bones of Saul and the bones of Jonathan, his son. And they gathered the bones of those who were hanged. They buried the bones of Saul and Jonathan, his son, in the country of Benjamin, in Zela, in the tomb of Kish, his father. And they performed all that the king commanded. After that, God was entreated for the land. Four Battles Against the Philistines The Philistines had war again with Israel, and David went down, and his servants with him, and fought against the Philistines. David grew faint, and Ishbi Benob, who was of the sons of the giant, the weight of whose spear was three hundred shekels of brass in weight, he being armed with a new sword, thought to have slain David. But Abishai, the son of Zeruiah, helped him, and struck the Philistine, and killed him. Then the men of David swore to him, saying, You shall go no more out with us to battle, that you don't quench the lamp of Israel. It came to pass after this that there was again war with the Philistines at Gob. Then Sibachai, the Hushathite, killed Seth, who was of the sons of the giant. There was again war with the Philistines at Gob, and Elhanan, the son of Jeoreorogam, the Bethlehemite, killed Goliath, the Gittite's brother, the staff of whose spear was like a weaver's beam. There was again war at Gath, where there was a man of great stature, who had on every hand six fingers, and on every foot six toes, four and twenty in number. And he also was born to the giant. When he defied Israel, Jonathan, the son of Shimei, David's brother, killed him. These four were born to the giant in Gath, and they fell by the hand of David and by the hand of his servants. Chapter 22 David's Song of Deliverance David spoke to Yahweh the words of this song in the day that Yahweh delivered him out of the hand of all his enemies and out of the hand of Saul. And he said, Yahweh is my rock, my fortress, and my deliverer, even mine. God, my rock, in him I will take refuge, my shield and the horn of my salvation, my high tower and my refuge, my savior, you save me from violence. I will call on Yahweh, who is worthy to be praised, so shall I be saved from my enemies. For the waves of death surround me. The floods of ungodliness made me afraid. 
The cords of Sheol were around me. The snares of death caught me. In my distress, I called on Yahweh. Yes, I called to my God. He heard my voice out of his temple. My cry came into his ears. Then the earth shook and trembled. The foundations of heaven quaked and were shaken because he was angry. Smoke went up out of his nostrils. Fire out of his mouth devoured. Coals were kindled by it. He bowed the heavens also and came down. Thick darkness was under his feet. He rode on a cherub and flew. Yes, he was seen on the wings of the wind. He made darkness pavilions around himself, gathering of waters and thick clouds of the skies. At the brightness before him, coals of fire were kindled. Yahweh thundered from heaven. The Most High uttered his voice. He sent out arrows and scattered them, lightning and confused them. Then the channels of the sea appeared. The foundations of the world were laid bare by the rebuke of Yahweh at the blast of the breath of his nostrils. He sent from on high, and he took me. He drew me out of many waters. He delivered me from my strong enemy, from those who hated me, for they were too mighty for me. They came on me in the day of my calamity, but Yahweh was my support. He also brought me out into a large place. He delivered me because he delighted in me. Yahweh rewarded me according to my righteousness. He rewarded me according to the cleanness of my hands. For I have kept the ways of Yahweh and have not wickedly departed from my God. For all his ordinances were before me. As for his statutes, I did not depart from them. I was also perfect toward him. I kept myself from iniquity. Therefore, Yahweh has rewarded me according to my righteousness, according to my cleanness in his eyesight. With the merciful, you will show yourself merciful. With the perfect man, you will show yourself perfect. With the pure, you will show yourself pure. With the crooked, you will show yourself shrewd. You will save the afflicted people, but your eyes are on the haughty that you may bring them down. For you are my lamp, Yahweh. Yahweh will light up my darkness. For by you I run against a troop. By my God I leap over a wall. As for God, his way is perfect. The word of Yahweh is tested. He is a shield to all those who take refuge in him. For who is God? besides Yahweh, who is a rock besides our God. God is my strong fortress. He makes my way perfect. He makes his feet like hinds feet and sets me on my high places. He teaches my hands to war so that my arms bend a bow of brass. You have also given me the shield of your salvation. Your gentleness has made me great. You have enlarged my steps under me. My feet have not slipped. I have pursued my enemies and destroyed them. I didn't turn again until they were consumed. I have consumed them and struck them through so that they can't arise. Yes, they have fallen under my feet. For you have armed me with strength for the battle. You have subdued under me those who rose up against me. You have also made my enemies turn their backs to me, that I might cut off those who hate me. They looked, but there was none to save, even to Yahweh, but he didn't answer them. Then I beat them as small as the dust of the earth. I crushed them as the mire of the streets and spread them abroad. You also have delivered me from the strivings of my people. You have kept me to be the head of the nations.
a people whom I have not known, will serve me. The foreigners will submit themselves to me. As soon as they hear of me, they will obey me. The foreigners will fade away and will come trembling out of their close places. Yahweh lives. Blessed be my rock. Exalted be God, the rock of my salvation. Even the God who executes vengeance for me, who brings down peoples under me, who brings me away from my enemies. Yes, you lift me up above those who rise up against me. You deliver me from the violent man. Therefore, I will give thanks to you, Yahweh, among the nations will sing praises to your name. He gives great deliverance to his king and shows loving kindness to his anointed, to David and to his seed forevermore. Chapter 23 David's Last Song Now these are the last words of David. David, the son of Jesse, says, The man who was raised on high, says, The anointed of the God of Jacob, The sweet psalmist of Israel, The spirit of Yahweh spoke by me, His word was on my tongue. The God of Israel said, The rock of Israel spoke to me, One who rules over men righteously, who rules in the fear of God, shall be as the light of the morning, when the sun rises, a morning without clouds, when the tender grass springs out of the earth, through clear shining after rain. Most certainly my house is not so with God, yet he has made with me an everlasting covenant, ordered in all things, and sure, for it is all my salvation and all my desire, although he doesn't make it grow. But all of the ungodly shall be as thorns to be thrust away, because they can't be taken with the hand. But the man who touches them must be armed with iron and the staff of a spear. They shall be utterly burned with fire in their place. David's Mighty Men These are the names of the mighty men whom David had. Joseph Bathshebeth, a Tachimonite, chief of the captains. The same was Adeno the Esnite, against eight hundred slain at one time. After him was Eleazar, the son of Dodai, the son of an Ahohite, one of the three mighty men with David, when they defied the Philistines, who were there gathered together to battle, and the men of Israel were gone away. He arose and struck the Philistines until his hand was weary, and his hand froze to the sword. And Yahweh worked a great victory that day, and the people returned after him only to take spoil. After him was Shammah, the son of Agi, a Hararite. The Philistines were gathered together into a troop, where there was a plot of ground full of lentils, and the people fled from the Philistines. But he stood in the midst of the plot and defended it, and killed the Philistines. And Yahweh worked a great victory. Three of the thirty chief men went down, and came to David in the harvest time, to the cave of Adullam. And the troop of the Philistines was encamped in the valley of Rephaim. David was then in the stronghold, and the garrison of the Philistines was then in Bethlehem. David longed and said, Oh, that one would give me water to drink of the well of Bethlehem, which is by the gate. The three mighty men broke through the army of the Philistines and drew water out of the well of Bethlehem that was by the gate and took it and brought it to David. 
but he would not drink of it, but poured it out to Yahweh. He said, Be it far from me, Yahweh, that I should do this. Isn't it the blood of the men who went in jeopardy of their lives? Therefore he would not drink it. The three mighty men did these things. Abishai, the brother of Joab, the son of Zeruiah, was chief of the three. He lifted up his spear against three hundred and killed them and had a name among the three. Wasn't he most honorable of the three? Therefore he was made their captain. However, he didn't attain to the first three. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, the son of a valiant man of Kabzeel, who had done mighty deeds, he killed the two sons of Ariel, of Moab, he went down also and killed a lion in the midst of a pit in time of snow. He killed an Egyptian, a goodly man, and the Egyptian had a spear in his hand. But he went down to him with a staff and plucked the spear out of the Egyptian's hand and killed him with his own spear. These things did Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and had a name among the three mighty men. He was more honorable than the thirty, but he didn't attain to the first three. David set him over his guard. Azahel, the brother of Joab, was one of the thirty. Elhanan, the son of Dodo of Bethlehem. Shammah, the Herodite. Elika, the Herodite. Helez, the Paltite. Ira, the son of Ikish, the Tekoite. Abiezer, the Anathothite, Mibani, the Hushathite, Zalmon, the Ahohite, Meharai, the Notaphathite, Heleb, the son of Baana, the Notaphathite, Etai, the son of Ribai, of Gibeah, of the children of Benjamin, Benaiah, a Pirithonite, Hidai, of the brooks of Gaash, Abialban, the Arbathite, Asmaveth, the Barhumite, Eliaba, the Shealbanite, the sons of Jashan, Jonathan, Shema, the Hararite, Ahiam, the son of Sherar, the Ararite, Eliphalet, the son of Ahasbi, the son of the Maacathite, Eliam, the son of Ahithophel, the Gilonite, Hezro, the Carmelite, Peari, the Arbite, Igal, the son of Nathan of Zobah, Benai, the Gadite, Zelek, the Ammonite, Nahari, the Berothite, armor bearers to Joab, the son of Zeruiah, Ira, the Ithrite, Garab the Ithrite, Uriah the Hittite, thirty-seven in all. Chapter 24 David's Census Again the anger of Yahweh was kindled against Israel, and he moved David against them, saying, Go, number Israel and Judah. The king said to Joab, the captain of the army who was with him, Now go back and forth through all the tribes of Israel, from Dan even to Beersheba, and number the people, that I may know the sum of the people. Joab said to the king, Now may Yahweh your God add to the people, however many they may be, one hundred times, and may the eyes of my lord the king see it. But why does my lord the king delight in this thing? Notwithstanding, the king's word prevailed against Joab and against the captains of the army. Joab and the captains of the army went out from the presence of the king to number the people of Israel. They passed over the Jordan and encamped in Aurora on the right side of the city that is in the middle of the valley of Gad. 
and to Jazer. Then they came to Gilead, and to the land of Tatim Hachai, and they came to Danjaan, and around to Sidon, and came to the stronghold of Tyre, and to all the cities of the Hivites, and of the Canaanites. And they went out to the south of Judah at Beersheba. So when they had gone back and forth through all the land, they came to Jerusalem at the end of nine months and twenty days. Joab gave up the sum of the numbering of the people to the king. And there were in Israel eight hundred thousand valiant men who drew the sword, and the men of Judah were five hundred thousand men. Judgment for David's sin. David's heart struck him after that he had numbered the people. David said to Yahweh, I have sinned greatly in that which I have done. But now, Yahweh, put away, I beg you, the iniquity of your servant, for I have done very foolishly. When David rose up in the morning, the word of Yahweh came to the prophet Gad, David's seer, saying, Go and speak to David. Thus says Yahweh, I offer you three things. Choose one of them, that I may do it to you. So Gad came to David and told him, and said to him, Shall seven years of famine come to you in your land? Or will you flee three months before your foes while they pursue you? Or shall there be three days pestilence in your land? Now answer, and consider what answer I shall return to him who sent me. David said to Gad, I am in distress. Let us fall now into the hand of Yahweh, for his mercies are great. Let me not fall into the hand of man. Pestilence Sent So Yahweh sent a pestilence on Israel from the morning even to the appointed time, and there died of the people from Dan even to Beersheba seventy thousand men. When the angel stretched out his hand toward Jerusalem to destroy it, Yahweh relented of the disaster, and said to the angel who destroyed the people, It is enough. Now stay your hand. The angel of Yahweh was by the threshing floor of Arana, the Jebusite. David spoke to Yahweh when he saw the angel who struck the people, and said, Behold, I have sinned, and I have done perversely. But these sheep, what have they done? Please let your hand be against me and against my father's house. David Builds an Altar Gad came that day to David and said to him, Go up, build an altar to Yahweh on the threshing floor of Arana the Jebusite. David went up according to the saying of Gad, as Yahweh commanded. Arana looked out, and saw the king and his servants coming on toward him. Then Arana went out and bowed himself before the king, with his face to the ground. Arana said, Why has my lord the king come to his servant? David said, To buy your threshing floor, to build an altar, to Yahweh, that the plague may be stopped from afflicting the people. Arana said to David, Let my lord the king take and offer up what seems good to him. Behold, the cattle for the burnt offering, and the threshing instruments, and the yokes of the oxen for the wood. All this, king, does Arana give to the king. Arana said to the king, May Yahweh, your God, accept you. The king said to Arana, No, but I will most certainly buy it from you for a price. I will not offer burnt offerings to Yahweh, my God, 
which cost me nothing. So David bought the threshing floor and the oxen for fifty shekels of silver. David built an altar to Yahweh there and offered burnt offerings and peace offerings. So Yahweh was entreated for the land, and the plague was stayed from Israel. First Kings Chapter 1 Abishag Cares for David Now King David was old, and stricken in years, and they covered him with clothes, but he couldn't keep warm. Therefore his servants said to him, Let there be sought for my lord the king a young virgin, and let her stand before the king, and cherish him, and let her lie in your bosom, that my lord the king may keep warm. So they sought for a beautiful young lady throughout all the borders of Israel, and found Abishag the Shunammite and brought her to the king. The young lady was very beautiful, and she cherished the king, and ministered to him. But the king didn't know her intimately. Adonijah usurps the kingdom. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, exalted himself, saying, I will be king. Then he prepared him chariots and horsemen, and fifty men to run before him. His father had not displeased him at any time in saying, Why have you done so? And he was also a very handsome man, and he was born after Absalom. He conferred with Joab, the son of Zeruiah, and with Abiathar, the priest, and they, following Adonijah, helped him. But Zadok, the priest, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and Nathan the prophet, and Shimei, and Rei, and the mighty men who belonged to David, were not with Adonijah. Adonijah killed sheep and cattle and fatlings by the stone of Zoheleth, which is beside Enrogel, and he called all his brothers, the king's sons, and all the men of Judah, the king's servants. But Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah, and the mighty men, and Solomon his brother, he didn't call. Nathan and Bathsheba before David Then Nathan spoke to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon, saying, Haven't you heard that Adonijah the son of Haggith reigns, and David our Lord doesn't know it? Now therefore, come, please let me give you counsel, that you may save your own life, and the life of your son, Solomon. Go in to King David and tell him, Didn't you, my lord, king, swear to your handmaid, saying, Assuredly, Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? Why then does Adonijah reign? Behold, while you yet talk there with the king, I also will come in after you and confirm your words. Bathsheba went in to the king into the room. The king was very old, and Abishag, the Shunammite, was ministering to the king. Bathsheba bowed and did obeisance to the king. The king said, What would you like? She said to him, My lord, you swore by Yahweh your God to your handmaid, assuredly, Solomon, your son, shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne. Now, behold, Adonijah reigns, and you, my lord the king, don't know it. He has slain cattle and fatlings and sheep in abundance, and has called all the sons of the king, and Abiathar the priest, and Joab the captain of the army. But he hasn't called Solomon your servant. You, my lord the king, the eyes of all Israel are on you, that you shall tell them who shall sit on the throne of my lord the king after him. Otherwise it will happen, when my lord the king shall sleep with his fathers, that I and my son Solomon shall be counted offenders. Behold, while she yet talked with the king, Nathan the prophet came in. 
they told the king, saying, Behold, Nathan the prophet. When he had come in before the king, he bowed himself before the king with his face to the ground. Nathan said, My lord, king, have you said, Adonijah shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne? For he has gone down this day, and has slain cattle, and fatlings, and sheep in abundance, and has called all the king's sons, and the captains of the army, and Abiathar the priest. Behold, they are eating and drinking before him, and say, Long live King Adonijah. But he hasn't called me, even me your servant, and Zadok the priest, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and your servant Solomon. Is this thing done by my lord the king? And you haven't shown to your servants who should sit on the throne of my lord the king after him? David renews his oath to Bathsheba. Then King David answered, Call to me Bathsheba. She came into the king's presence and stood before the king. The king swore and said, As Yahweh lives, who has redeemed my soul out of all adversity, most certainly, as I swore to you by Yahweh, the God of Israel, saying, Assuredly, Solomon your son shall reign after me, and he shall sit on my throne in my place. Most certainly, so will I do this day. Then Bathsheba bowed with her face to the earth, and did obeisance to the king, and said, Let my lord King David live for ever. Solomon anointed king. King David said, Call to me Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada. They came before the king. The king said to them, Take with you the servants of your Lord, and cause Solomon my son to ride on my own mule, and bring him down to Gihon. Let Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet anoint him there, king over Israel. Blow the trumpet and say, Long live King Solomon. Then you shall come up after him, and he shall come and sit on my throne, for he shall be king in my place. I have appointed him to be prince over Israel and over Judah. Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, answered the king and said, Amen. May Yahweh, the God of my lord the king, say so. As Yahweh has been with my lord the king, even so may he be with Solomon, and make his throne greater than the throne of my lord King David. So Zadok the priest, and Nathan the prophet, and Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the Carathites and the Pelathites went down, and caused Solomon to ride on King David's mule, and brought him to Gihon. Zadok the priest took the horn of oil out of the tent, and anointed Solomon. They blew the trumpet, and all the people said, Long live King Solomon! All the people came up after him, and the people piped with pipes, and rejoiced with great joy, so that the earth shook with the sound of them. Adonijah informed of Solomon's kingship. Adonijah and all the guests who were with him heard it as they had made an end of eating. When Joab heard the sound of the trumpet, he said, Why is this noise of the city being in an uproar? While he yet spoke, behold, Jonathan, the son of Abiathar, the priest, came. And Adonijah said, Come in, for you are a worthy man, and bring good news. Jonathan answered Adonijah, most certainly, our lord King David has made Solomon king. The king has sent with him Zadok the priest, Nathan the prophet, Benaiah the son of Jehoiada, and the Carathites, and the Pelathites, 
and they have caused him to ride on the king's mule. Zadok the priest and Nathan the prophet have anointed him king in Gihon. They have come up from there rejoicing, so that the city rang again. This is the noise that you have heard. Also, Solomon sits on the throne of the kingdom. Moreover, the king's servants came to bless our lord King David, saying, May your God make the name of Solomon better than your name, and make his throne greater than your throne. And the king bowed himself on the bed. Also thus said the king, Blessed be Yahweh, the God of Israel, who has given one to sit on my throne this day, my eyes even seeing it. All the guests of Adonijah were afraid, and rose up, and each man went his way. Adonijah feared because of Solomon, and he arose and went and caught hold on the horns of the altar. It was told Solomon, saying, Behold, Adonijah fears King Solomon, for behold, he has laid hold on the horns of the altar, saying, Let King Solomon swear to me first that he will not kill his servant with the sword. Solomon said, If he shows himself a worthy man, not a hair of him shall fall to the earth, but if wickedness be found in him, he shall die. So King Solomon sent, and they brought him down from the altar. He came and did obeisance to King Solomon. And Solomon said to him, Go to your house. Chapter 2 David Instructs Solomon now the days of David drew near that he should die. And he commanded Solomon his son, saying, I am going the way of all the earth. You be strong, therefore, and show yourself a man, and keep the instruction of Yahweh your God, to walk in his ways, to keep his statutes, his commandments, his ordinances, and his testimonies, according to that which is written in the law of Moses, that you may prosper in all that you do, and wherever you turn yourself, that Yahweh may establish his word, which he spoke concerning me, saying, If your children take heed to their way, to walk before me in truth with all their heart, and with all their soul. There shall not fail you, he said, a man on the throne of Israel. Moreover, you know also what Joab, the son of Zeruiah, did to me, even what he did to the two captains of the armies of Israel, to Abner, the son of Ner, and to Amasa, the son of Jether, whom he killed, and shed the blood of war in peace, and put the blood of war on his sash that was about his waist, and in his shoes that were on his feet. Do therefore according to your wisdom, and don't let his gray head go down to Sheol in peace. But show kindness to the sons of Barzillai, the Gileadite, and let them be of those who eat at your table. For so they came to me when I fled from Absalom, your brother. Behold, there is with you Shimei, the son of Jira, the Benjamite of Bahurim, who cursed me with a grievous curse in the day when I went to Mahanaim. But he came down to meet me at the Jordan, and I swore to him by Yahweh, saying, I will not put you to death with the sword. Now, therefore, don't hold him guiltless, for you are a wise man, and you will know what you ought to do to him, and you shall bring his gray head down to Sheol with blood. The Death of David David slept with his fathers and was buried in the city of David. 
The days that David reigned over Israel were forty years. Seven years reigned he in Hebron, and thirty-three years reigned he in Jerusalem. Solomon sat on the throne of David his father, and his kingdom was firmly established. Solomon's reign established. Then Adonijah, the son of Haggith, came to Bathsheba, the mother of Solomon. She said, Do you come peaceably? He said, Peaceably. He said, Moreover, I have something to tell you. She said, Say on. He said, You know that the kingdom was mine, and that all Israel set their faces on me, that I should reign. However, the kingdom is turned around, and has become my brother's, for it was his from Yahweh. Now I ask one petition of you. Don't deny me. She said to him, Say on. He said, Please speak to Solomon the king, for he will not tell you no, that he give me Abishag the Shunammite as wife. Bathsheba said, All right. I will speak for you to the king. The Execution of Adonijah Bathsheba, therefore, went to King Solomon to speak to him for Adonijah. The king rose up to meet her and bowed himself to her and sat down on his throne and caused a throne to be set for the king's mother, and she sat on his right hand. Then she said, I ask one small petition of you. Don't deny me. The king said to her, Ask on, my mother, for I will not deny you. She said, Let Abishag the Shunammite be given to Adonijah, your brother, as wife. King Solomon answered his mother, Why do you ask Abishag the Shunammite for Adonijah? Ask for him the kingdom also, for he is my elder brother, even for him and for Abiathar the priest, and for Joab the son of Zeruiah. Then King Solomon swore by Yahweh, saying, God do so to me, and more also, if Adonijah has not spoken this word against his own life. Now therefore, as Yahweh lives, who has established me, and set me on the throne of David my father, and who has made me a house, as he promised, Surely Adonijah shall be put to death this day. King Solomon sent by Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he fell on him, so that he died. To Abiathar the priest, the king said, Go to Anathoth, to your own fields, for you are worthy of death, but I will not at this time put you to death, because you bore the ark of the Lord Yahweh before David my father and because you were afflicted in all in which my father was afflicted. So Solomon thrust out Abiathar from being priest to Yahweh, that he might fulfill the word of Yahweh, which he spoke concerning the house of Eli in Shiloh. The Execution of Joab The news came to Joab, for Joab had turned after Adonijah, though he didn't turn after Absalom. Joab fled to the tent of Yahweh and caught hold on the horns of the altar. It was told King Solomon, Joab has fled to the tent of Yahweh, and behold, he is by the altar. Then Solomon sent Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, saying, Go, fall on him. Benaiah came to the tent of Yahweh and said to him, Thus says the king, Come forth. He said, no, but I will die here. Benaiah brought the king word again, saying, Thus says Joab, and thus he answered me. The king said to him, Do as he has said, and fall on him, and bury him, that you may take away the blood which Joab shed without cause from me and from my father's house. Yahweh will return his blood on his own head, because he fell on two men more righteous and better than he, 
and killed them with the sword, and my father David didn't know it. Abner, the son of Ner, captain of the army of Israel, and Amasa, the son of Jether, captain of the army of Judah. So shall their blood return on the head of Joab, and on the head of his seed forever. But to David, and to his seed, and to his house, and to his throne, there shall be peace forever from Yahweh. Then Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, went up, and fell on him, and killed him, and he was buried in his own house in the wilderness. The king put Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, in his place over the army. And Zadok the priest did the king put in the place of Abiathar. The Execution of Shimei The king sent and called for Shimei, and said to him, Build yourself a house in Jerusalem, and dwell there, and don't go out from there anywhere. For on the day you go out and pass over the brook Kidron, know for certain that you shall surely die. Your blood shall be on your own head. Shimei said to the king, The saying is good. As my lord the king has said, so will your servant do. Shimei lived in Jerusalem many days. It happened at the end of three years that two of the servants of Shimei ran away to Achish, son of Maacah, king of Gath, they told Shimei, saying, Behold, your servants are in Gath. Shimei arose and saddled his donkey and went to Gath, to Achish, to seek his servants. And Shimei went and brought his servants from Gath. It was told Solomon that Shimei had gone from Jerusalem to Gath and was calm again. The king sent and called for Shimei and said to him, didn't I adjure you by Yahweh, and warn you, saying, Know for certain that on the day you go out and walk abroad anywhere, you shall surely die? You said to me, The saying that I have heard is good. Why then have you not kept the oath of Yahweh and the commandment that I have instructed you with? The king said moreover to Shimei, you know all the wickedness which your heart is privy to, that you did to David, my father. Therefore, Yahweh shall return your wickedness on your own head. But King Solomon shall be blessed, and the throne of David shall be established before Yahweh forever. So the king commanded Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, and he went out and fell on him, so that he died. The kingdom was established in the hand of Solomon. Chapter 3 Solomon's Rule Consolidated Solomon made affinity with Pharaoh, king of Egypt, and took Pharaoh's daughter and brought her into the city of David until he had made an end of building his own house and the house of Yahweh and the wall of Jerusalem all around. Only the people sacrificed in the high places, because there was no house built for the name of Yahweh until those days. Solomon loved Yahweh, walking in the statutes of David his father. Only he sacrificed and burnt incense in the high places. The king went to Gibeon to sacrifice there, for that was the great high place, a thousand burnt offerings did Solomon offer on that altar. In Gibeon, Yahweh appeared to Solomon in a dream by night, and God said, Ask what I shall give you. Solomon's Prayer for Wisdom Solomon said, You have shown to your servant David, my father, great loving kindness according as he walked before you, in truth and in righteousness, and in uprightness of heart with you. You have kept for him this great loving kindness, that you have given him a son to sit on his throne, as it is this day. Now, Yahweh, my God, 
you have made your servant king instead of David my father. I am but a little child. I don't know how to go out or come in. Your servant is in the midst of your people, which you have chosen, a great people, that can't be numbered nor counted for multitude. Give your servant, therefore, an understanding heart to judge your people, that I may discern between good and evil. For who is able to judge this your great people? God grants wisdom, riches, honor. The speech pleased the Lord that Solomon had asked this thing. God said to him, Because you have asked this thing, and have not asked for yourself long life, neither have asked riches for yourself, nor have asked the life of your enemies, but have asked for yourself understanding to discern justice. Behold, I have done according to your word. Behold, I have given you a wise and an understanding heart, so that there has been none like you before you, neither after you shall any arise like you. I have also given you that which you have not asked, both riches and honor, so that there shall not be any among the kings like you all your days. If you will walk in my ways, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as your father David walked, then I will lengthen your days. Solomon awoke, and behold, it was a dream. Then he came to Jerusalem and stood before the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh and offered up burnt offerings, offered peace offerings, and made a feast to all his servants. Solomon Judges Wisely Then two women who were prostitutes came to the king and stood before him. The one woman said, O oh, my lord, I and this woman dwell in one house. I delivered a child with her in the house. It happened the third day after I delivered that this woman delivered also. We were together. There was no stranger with us in the house, just us two in the house. This woman's child died in the night because she lay on it. She arose at midnight and took my son from beside me while your handmaid slept and laid it in her bosom and laid her dead child in my bosom. When I rose in the morning to nurse my child, behold, it was dead. But when I had looked at it in the morning, behold, it was not my son whom I bore. The other woman said, No, but the living is my son and the dead is your son. The first said, No, but the dead is your son, and the living is my son. Thus they spoke before the king. Then the king said, The one says, This is my son who lives, and your son is the dead. And the other says, No, but your son is the dead one, and my son is the living one. The king said, Get me a sword. They brought a sword before the king. The king said, Divide the living child in two, and give half to the one, and half to the other. Then the woman whose the living child was spoke to the king, for her heart yearned over her son, and she said, O oh, my lord, give her the living child, and in no way kill it. But the other said, it shall be neither mine nor yours. Divide it. Then the king answered, Give her the living child, and in no way kill it. She is its mother. All Israel heard of the judgment which the king had judged, and they feared the king, for they saw that the wisdom of God was in him to do justice. Chapter 4 Solomon's Princes King Solomon was king over all Israel. These were the princes whom he had. Azariah, 
the son of Zadok, the priest, Elihoreph, and Ahijah, the sons of Shisha, scribes, Jehoshaphat, the son of Ahilud, the recorder, and Benaiah, the son of Jehoiada, was over the army, and Zadok and Abiathar were priests, and Azariah, the son of Nathan, was over the officers, and Zabud, the son of Nathan, was chief minister, and the king's friend, and Ahishar was over the household, and Adoniram, the son of Abda, was over the men subject to forced labor. Solomon's Twelve Officers Solomon had twelve officers over all Israel, who provided food for the king and his household. Each man had to make provision for a month in the year. These are their names. Ben-Hur in the hill country of Ephraim, ben Deker, in Mekaz, and in Shealbim, and Beth Shemesh, and Elan Beth Hanan, ben Hesed, in Aruboth, to him pertained Soko, and all the land of Hefer, ben Abinadab, in all the height of Dor, he had Tafath, the daughter of Solomon, as wife, Baana, the son of Ahilud, in Teanach and Megiddo, and all Bethshean, which is beside Zarethan, beneath Jezreel, from Bethshean to Abel Mehola, as far as beyond Jogmium, Ben Geber, in Ramoth Gilead, to him pertained the towns of Jair, the son of Manasseh, which are in Gilead. Even to him pertained the region of Argob, which is in Bashan, sixty great cities with walls and bronze bars. Ahinadab, the son of Iddo, in Mahanaim. Ahimaaz, in Naphtali. He also took Basimath, the daughter of Solomon, as wife. Baana, the son of Hushai, in Asher and Beeloth. Jehoshaphat, the son of Perua, in Issachar, Shimei, the son of Elah, in Benjamin, Geber, the son of Uri, in the land of Gilead, the country of Sihon, king of the Amorites, and of Og, king of Bashan, and he was the only officer who was in the land. Solomon's Wealth Judah and Israel were many, as the sand which is by the sea in multitude, eating and drinking and making merry. Solomon ruled over all the kingdoms, from the river to the land of the Philistines, and to the border of Egypt. They brought tribute and served Solomon all the days of his life. Solomon's provision for one day was thirty measures of fine flour, and sixty measures of meal, ten head of fat cattle, and twenty head of cattle out of the pastures, and one hundred sheep, besides harts and gazelles, and roebucks, and fattened fowl. For he had dominion over all the region on this side the river, from Tifsa even to Gaza, over all the kings on this side the river, and he had peace on all sides around him. Judah and Israel lived safely, every man under his vine and under his fig tree, from Dan even to Beersheba, all the days of Solomon. Solomon had forty thousand stalls of horses for his chariots, and twelve thousand horsemen. Those officers provided food for King Solomon, and for all who came to King Solomon's table, every man in his month. They let nothing be lacking. Barley also, and straw for the horses, and swift steeds brought they to the place where the officers were, every man according to his duty. Solomon's Wisdom God gave Solomon wisdom and understanding exceeding much, and very great understanding, 
even as the sand that is on the seashore. Solomon's wisdom excelled the wisdom of all the children of the east and all the wisdom of Egypt, for he was wiser than all men, than Ethan the Ezrahite, and Heman, and Calcol, and Darda, the sons of Mahol, and his fame was in all the nations all around. He spoke three thousand proverbs, and his songs were one thousand five. He spoke of trees, from the cedar that is in Lebanon, even to the hyssop that springs out of the wall. He spoke also of animals, and of birds, and of creeping things, and of fish. There came of all peoples to hear the wisdom of Solomon from all kings of the earth who had heard of his wisdom. End of section 28Chapter 5 Preparations for the Temple Hiram, king of Tyre, sent his servants to Solomon, for he had heard that they had anointed him king in the place of his father, for Hiram was ever a lover of David. Solomon sent to Hiram, saying, You know how that David my father could not build a house for the name of Yahweh his God, for the wars which were about him on every side, until Yahweh put them under the soles of his feet. But now Yahweh my God has given me rest on every side. There is neither adversary nor evil occurrence. Behold, I purpose to build a house for the name of Yahweh my God, as Yahweh spoke to David my father, saying, Your son whom I will set on your throne in your place, he shall build the house for my name. Now therefore, command that they cut me cedar trees out of Lebanon. My servants shall be with your servants, and I will give you wages for your servants, according to all that you shall say. For you know that there is not among us any who knows how to cut timber, like the Sidonians. It happened, when Hiram heard the words of Solomon, that he rejoiced greatly, and said, Blessed is Yahweh this day, who has given to David a wise son over this great people. Hiram said to Solomon, saying, I have heard the message which you have sent to me. I will do all your desire concerning timber of cedar and concerning timber of fir. My servants shall bring them down from Lebanon to the sea. I will make them into rafts to go by sea to the place that you shall appoint me and will cause them to be broken up there, and you shall receive them. You shall accomplish my desire in giving food for my household. So Hiram gave Solomon timber of cedar and timber of fir, according to all his desire. Solomon gave Hiram 20,000 measures of wheat for food to his household, and 20 measures of pure oil, Solomon gave this to Hiram year by year. Yahweh gave Solomon wisdom, as he promised him. And there was peace between Hiram and Solomon, and they too made a treaty together. Solomon's Workmen and Laborers King Solomon raised a levy out of all Israel, and the levy was 30,000 men. He sent them to Lebanon, 10,000 a month by courses. A month they were in Lebanon, and two months at home. And Adoniram was over the men subject to forced labor. Solomon had 70,000 who bore burdens, and 80,000 who were stone cutters in the mountains. Besides Solomon's chief officers who were over the work, 3,300 who bore rule over the people who labored in the work. The king commanded, and they cut out great stones, costly stones, to lay the foundation of the house 
with worked stone. Solomon's builders and Hiram's builders and the Gebelites did fashion them and prepared the timber and the stones to build the house. Chapter 6 Solomon Builds the Temple It happened in the 480th year after the children of Israel were come out of the land of Egypt in the fourth year of Solomon's reign over Israel, in the month Ziv, which is the second month, that he began to build the house of Yahweh, the house which King Solomon built for Yahweh. Its length was sixty cubits, and its breadth twenty cubits, and its height thirty cubits. The porch before the temple of the house, twenty cubits was its length, according to the breadth of the house and ten cubits was its breadth before the house. For the house he made windows of fixed latticework. The Chambers Against the wall of the house he built stories all around, against the walls of the house all around, both of the temple and of the oracle, and he made side rooms all around. The nethermost story was five cubits broad, and the middle was six cubits broad, and the third was seven cubits broad. For on the outside he made offsets in the wall of the house all around, that the beams should not have hold in the walls of the house. The house, when it was in building, was built of stone prepared at the quarry and there was neither hammer nor axe nor any tool of iron heard in the house while it was in building. The door for the middle side rooms was in the right side of the house, and they went up by winding stairs into the middle story, and out of the middle into the third. So he built the house and finished it, and he covered the house with beams and planks of cedar. He built the stories against all the house, each five cubits high, and they rested on the house with timber of cedar. God's Promise The word of Yahweh came to Solomon, saying, Concerning this house which you are building, if you will walk in my statutes and execute my ordinances and keep all my commandments to walk in them, then will I establish my word with you, which I spoke to David, your father. I will dwell among the children of Israel, and will not forsake my people Israel. So Solomon built the house and finished it. The Temple's Interior He built the walls of the house within with boards of cedar, from the floor of the house to the walls of the ceiling. He covered them on the inside with wood, and he covered the floor of the house with boards of fir. He built twenty cubits on the hinder part of the house with boards of cedar, from the floor to the walls of the ceiling. He built them for it within, for an oracle, even for the most holy place. The house that is, the temple before the oracle, was forty cubits long. There was cedar on the house within, carved with buds and open flowers. All was cedar. There was no stone seen. He prepared an oracle in the midst of the house within, to set there the ark of the covenant of Yahweh. Within the oracle was a space of twenty cubits in length and twenty cubits in breadth, and twenty cubits in its height, and he overlaid it with pure gold, and he covered the altar with cedar. So Solomon overlaid the house within with pure gold, and he drew chains of gold across before the oracle, and he overlaid it with gold. The whole house he overlaid with gold, until all the house was finished. Also, the whole altar that belonged to the oracle he overlaid with gold. The Cherubim In the oracle he made two cherubim 
of olive wood, each ten cubits high. Five cubits was the one wing of the cherub, and five cubits the other wing of the cherub. From the uttermost part of the one wing to the uttermost part of the other were ten cubits. The other cherub was ten cubits. Both the cherubim were of one measure and one form. The height of the one cherub was ten cubits, and so was it of the other cherub. He set the cherubim within the inner house, and the wings of the cherubim were stretched forth, so that the wing of the one touched the one wall, and the wing of the other cherub touched the other wall, and their wings touched one another in the midst of the house. He overlaid the cherubim with gold. He carved all the walls of the house around with carved figures of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers, inside and outside. The floor of the house he overlaid with gold, inside and outside. The Doors For the entrance of the oracle he made doors of olive wood. The lintel and doorposts were a fifth part of the wall. So he made two doors of olive wood, and he carved on them carvings of cherubim and palm trees and open flowers, and overlaid them with gold. And he spread the gold on the cherubim and on the palm trees. So also made he for the entrance of the temple door posts of olive wood, out of a fourth part of the wall, and two doors of fir wood. The two leaves of the one door were folding, and the two leaves of the other door were folding. He carved thereon cherubim and palm trees and open flowers, and he overlaid them with gold fitted on the engraved work. The Courtyard he built the inner court with three courses of cut stone and a course of cedar beams. In the fourth year was the foundation of the house of Yahweh laid in the month Ziv. In the eleventh year, in the month Bul, which is the eighth month, was the house finished throughout all its parts and according to all its fashion. So was he seven years in building it. Chapter 7 Solomon Builds His Palace Solomon was building his own house thirteen years, and he finished all his house. For he built the house of the forest of Lebanon. Its length was one hundred cubits, and its breadth fifty cubits, and its height thirty cubits, on four rows of cedar pillars, with cedar beams on the pillars. It was covered with cedar above, over the forty-five beams that were on the pillars, fifteen in a row. There were beams in three rows, and window was over against window in three ranks. All the doors and posts were made square with beams, and window was over against window in three ranks. He made the porch of pillars. Its length was fifty cubits, and its breadth thirty cubits, and a porch before them, and pillars and a threshold before them. He made the porch of the throne where he was to judge, even the porch of judgment and it was covered with cedar from floor to floor. His house where he was to dwell, the other court within the porch, was of the like work. He made also a house for Pharaoh's daughter, whom Solomon had taken as wife, like this porch. All these were of costly stones, even of cut stone, according to measure, sawed with saws, inside and outside, even from the foundation to the coping, and so on the outside to the great court. The foundation was of costly stones, even great stones, stones of ten cubits, 
and stones of eight cubits. Above were costly stones, even cut stones, according to measure, and cedar wood. The great court around had three courses of cut stone and a course of cedar beams, like as the inner court of the house of Yahweh and the porch of the house. The Work of Hiram King Solomon sent and fetched Hiram of Tyre. He was the son of a widow of the tribe of Naphtali, and his father was a man of Tyre, a worker in brass. And he was filled with wisdom and understanding and skill to work all works in brass. He came to King Solomon and performed all his work for he fashioned the two pillars of brass, eighteen cubits high apiece, and a line of twelve cubits encircled either of them about. He made two capitals of molten brass to set on the tops of the pillars. The height of the one capital was five cubits, and the height of the other capital was five cubits. There were nets of checker work, and wreaths of chain work for the capitals which were on the top of the pillars, seven for the one capital and seven for the other capital. So he made the pillars, and there were two rows around on the one network to cover the capitals that were on the top of the pillars, and so did he for the other capital. The capitals that were on the top of the pillars in the porch were of lily work, four cubits. There were capitals above also on the two pillars, close by the belly, which was beside the network, and the pomegranates were two hundred, in rows around on the other capital. He set up the pillars at the porch of the temple, and he set up the right pillar, and called its name Jachin, and he set up the left pillar, and called its name Boaz. On the top of the pillars was lily work. So was the work of the pillars finished. The Sea of Cast Metal He made the molten sea of ten cubits from brim to brim, round in compass, and its height was five cubits, and a line of thirty cubits encircled it. Under its brim around there were buds which encircled it, for ten cubits, encircling the sea. The buds were in two rows, cast when it was cast. It stood on twelve oxen, three looking toward the north, and three looking toward the west, and three looking toward the south, and three looking toward the east. And the sea was set on them above and all their hinder parts were inward. It was a hand breadth thick, and its brim was worked like the brim of a cup, like the flower of a lily. It held two thousand baths. The Ten Bases He made the ten bases of brass. Four cubits was the length of one base, and four cubits its breadth and three cubits its height. The work of the bases was like this. They had panels, and there were panels between the ledges, and on the panels that were between the ledges were lions, oxen, and cherubim, and on the ledges there was a pedestal above, and beneath the lions and oxen were wreaths of hanging work. Every base had four bronze wheels, and axles of brass, and the four feet of it had supports. Beneath the basin were the supports molten, with wreaths at the side of each. The mouth of it within the capital and above was a cubit, and its mouth was round after the work of a pedestal, a cubit and a half, and also on its mouth were engravings, and their panels were four square not round. The four wheels were underneath the panels, and the axles of the wheels were in the base, 
and the height of a wheel was a cubit and half a cubit. The work of the wheels was like the work of a chariot wheel, their axles and their rims and their spokes and their naves were all molten. There were four supports at the four corners of each base. Its supports were of the base itself. In the top of the base was there a round compass, half a cubit high. And on the top of the base, its stays and its panels were of the same. On the plates of its stays and on its panels, he engraved cherubim, lions, and palm trees, according to the space of each, with wreaths all around. In this way he made the ten bases. All of them had one casting, one measure, and one form. The Ten Bronze Basins He made ten basins of brass. One basin contained forty baths, and every basin was four cubits, and on every one of the ten bases, one basin. He set the bases, five on the right side of the house, and five on the left side of the house, and he set the sea on the right side of the house eastward, toward the south. The Vessels Hiram made the pots and the shovels, and the basins. So Hiram made an end of doing all the work that he worked for King Solomon in the house of Yahweh. The two pillars and the two bowls of the capitals that were on the top of the pillars, and the two networks to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the top of the pillars, and the four hundred pomegranates for the two networks two rows of pomegranates for each network to cover the two bowls of the capitals that were on the pillars, and the ten bases, and the ten basins on the bases, and the one sea, and the twelve oxen under the sea, and the pots, and the shovels, and the basins. Even all these vessels which Hiram made for King Solomon, in the house of Yahweh were of burnished brass. In the plain of the Jordan did the king cast them, in the clay ground between Sokoth and Zarethan. Solomon left all the vessels unweighed, because they were exceeding many. The weight of the brass could not be found out. Solomon made all the vessels that were in the house of Yahweh, the golden altar, and the table whereupon the showbread was, of gold, and the lampstands, five on the right side, and five on the left, before the oracle, of pure gold, and the flowers, and the lamps, and the tongs, of gold, and the cups, and the snuffers, and the basins, and the spoons, and the firepans of pure gold, and the hinges, both for the doors of the inner house, the most holy place, and for the doors of the house, to wit, of the temple, of gold. Thus all the work that King Solomon worked in the house of Yahweh was finished. Solomon brought in the things which David his father had dedicated, even the silver and the gold and the vessels, and put them in the treasuries of the house of Yahweh. Chapter 8 The Ark Enters the Temple Then Solomon assembled the elders of Israel, and all the heads of the tribes, the princes of the fathers' houses of the children of Israel, to King Solomon in Jerusalem, to bring up the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh out of the city of David, which is Zion. All the men of Israel assembled themselves to King Solomon at the feast, in the month Ethanim, which is the seventh month, 
all the elders of Israel came, and the priests took up the ark. They brought up the ark of Yahweh, and the tent of meeting, and all the holy vessels that were in the tent. Even these did the priests and the Levites bring up. King Solomon and all the congregation of Israel, who were assembled to him, were with him before the ark sacrificing sheep and cattle that could not be counted nor numbered for multitude. The priests brought in the Ark of the Covenant of Yahweh to its place, into the oracle of the house, to the most holy place, even under the wings of the cherubim. For the cherubim spread forth their wings over the place of the Ark, and the cherubim covered the Ark, and its poles above. The poles were so long that the ends of the poles were seen from the holy place before the oracle, but they were not seen outside, and there they are to this day. There was nothing in the ark except the two tables of stone which Moses put there at Horeb, when Yahweh made a covenant with the children of Israel when they came out of the land of Egypt. It came to pass, when the priests were come out of the holy place, that the cloud filled the house of Yahweh, so that the priests could not stand to minister by reason of the cloud, for the glory of Yahweh filled the house of Yahweh. Solomon praises the Lord. Then Solomon said, Yahweh has said that he would dwell in the thick darkness. I have surely built you a house of habitation, a place for you to dwell in forever. The king turned his face about and blessed all the assembly of Israel, and all the assembly of Israel stood. He said, Blessed is Yahweh, the God of Israel, who spoke with his mouth to David your father, and has with his hand fulfilled it, saying, Since the day that I brought forth my people Israel out of Egypt, I chose no city out of all the tribes of Israel to build a house, that my name might be there. But I chose David to be over my people Israel. Now it was in the heart of David my father to build a house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. But Yahweh said to David, my father, Whereas it was in your heart to build a house for my name, you did well that it was in your heart. Nevertheless, you shall not build the house, but your son, who shall come forth out of your body, he shall build the house for my name. Yahweh has established his word that he spoke. For I have risen up in the place of David, my father, and I sit on the throne of Israel, as Yahweh promised, and have built the house for the name of Yahweh, the God of Israel. There I have set a place for the ark, in which is the covenant of Yahweh, which he made with our fathers when he brought them out of the land of Egypt. Solomon's Prayer of Dedication Solomon stood before the altar of Yahweh in the presence of all the assembly of Israel and spread forth his hands toward heaven, and he said, Yahweh, the God of Israel, there is no God like you in heaven above or on earth beneath who keep covenant and loving kindness with your servants, who walk before you with all their heart who have kept with your servant David, my father, that which you promised him. Yes, you spoke with your mouth and have fulfilled it with your hand, as it is this day. Now, therefore, may Yahweh, the God of Israel, keep with your servant David, my father, that which you have promised him, saying, There shall not fail you a man in my sight, to sit on the throne of Israel, if only your children take heed to their way, to walk before me as you have walked before me. Now, therefore, 
God of Israel, please let your word be verified, which you spoke to your servant David, my father. But will God in very deed dwell on the earth? Behold, heaven and the heaven of heavens can't contain you, how much less this house that I have built. Yet have respect for the prayer of your servant and for his supplication, Yahweh my God, to listen to the cry and to the prayer which your servant prays before you this day, that your eyes may be open toward this house night and day, even toward the place of which you have said, My name shall be there to listen to the prayer which your servant shall pray toward this place. Listen to the supplication of your servant and of your people Israel when they shall pray toward this place. Yes, here in heaven, your dwelling place, and when you hear, forgive. If a man sins against his neighbor and an oath is laid on him to cause him to swear, and he comes and swear before your altar in this house. Then hear in heaven, and do, and judge your servants, condemning the wicked to bring his way on his own head, and justifying the righteous to give him according to his righteousness. When your people Israel are struck down before the enemy, because they have sinned against you, if they turn again to you, and confess your name, and pray, and make supplication to you in this house. Then hear in heaven, and forgive the sin of your people Israel, and bring them again to the land which you gave to their fathers. When the sky is shut up, and there is no rain, because they have sinned against you, if they pray toward this place, and confess your name, and turn from their sin when you afflict them. Then hear in heaven and forgive the sin of your servants and of your people Israel when you teach them the good way in which they should walk and send rain on your land which you have given to your people for an inheritance. If there is famine in the land, if there is pestilence, if there is blight, mildew, locust, or caterpillar, if their enemy besieges them in the land of their cities, whatever plague, whatever sickness there is, whatever prayer and supplication is made by any man or by all your people Israel, who shall each know the plague of his own heart and spread forth his hands toward this house, then here in heaven your dwelling place, and forgive, and do, and render to every man according to all his ways, whose heart you know. For you, even you only, know the hearts of all the children of men, that they may fear you all the days that they live in the land which you gave to our fathers. Moreover, concerning the foreigner, who is not of your people Israel, when he shall come out of a far country for your name's sake. For they shall hear of your great name, and of your mighty hand, and of your outstretched arm. When he shall come and pray toward this house, here in heaven your dwelling place, and do according to all that the foreigner calls to you for, that all the peoples of the earth may know your name, to fear you, as do your people Israel, and that they may know that this house which I have built is called by your name. If your people go out to battle against their enemy, by whatever way you shall send them, and they pray to Yahweh toward the city which you have chosen, and toward the house which I have built for your name, then hear in heaven their prayer and their supplication and maintain their cause. If they sin against you, for there is no man who doesn't sin, and you are angry with them, and deliver them to the enemy, so that they carry them away, captive, to the land of the enemy, far off or near, 
Yet if they shall repent in the land where they are carried captive, and turn again, and make supplication to you in the land of those who carried them captive, saying, We have sinned and have done perversely, we have dealt wickedly, if they return to you with all their heart and with all their soul in the land of their enemies who carried them captive, and pray to you toward their land which you gave to their fathers, the city which you have chosen, and the house which I have built for your name, then hear their prayer and their supplication in heaven, your dwelling place, and maintain their cause and forgive your people who have sinned against you and all their transgressions in which they have transgressed against you, and give them compassion before those who carried them captive, that they may have compassion on them. For they are your people and your inheritance, which you have brought forth out of Egypt from the midst of the furnace of iron that your eyes may be open to the supplication of your servant and to the supplication of your people Israel, to listen to them whenever they cry to you. For you separated them from among all the peoples of the earth to be your inheritance, as you spoke by Moses your servant when you brought our fathers out of Egypt, Lord Yahweh. Solomon's Benediction it was so that when Solomon had made an end of praying all this prayer and supplication to Yahweh, he arose from before the altar of Yahweh, from kneeling on his knees with his hands spread forth toward heaven. He stood and blessed all the assembly of Israel with a loud voice, saying, Blessed be Yahweh, who has given rest to his people Israel, according to all that he promised. There has not failed one word of all his good promise, which he promised by Moses his servant. May Yahweh our God be with us, as he was with our fathers. Let him not leave us, nor forsake us, that he may incline our hearts to him, to walk in all his ways, and to keep his commandments and his statutes, and his ordinances, which he commanded our fathers. Let these my words, with which I have made supplication before Yahweh, be near to Yahweh our God, day and night, that he may maintain the cause of his servant, and the cause of his people Israel, as every day shall require, that all the peoples of the earth may know that Yahweh, he is God, there is none else. Let your heart, therefore, be perfect with Yahweh our God, to walk in his statutes and to keep his commandments, as at this day. Sacrifices of Dedication The king and all Israel with him offered sacrifice before Yahweh. Solomon offered for the sacrifice of peace offerings which he offered to Yahweh, two and twenty thousand head of cattle, and one hundred twenty thousand sheep. So the king and all the children of Israel dedicated the house of Yahweh. The same day did the king make the middle of the court holy that was before the house of Yahweh, for there he offered the burnt offering, and the meal offering, and the fat of the peace offerings because the bronze altar that was before Yahweh was too little to receive the burnt offering and the meal offering and the fat of the peace offerings. So Solomon held the feast at that time, and all Israel with him, a great assembly, from the entrance of Hamath to the brook of Egypt, before Yahweh our God, seven days and seven days, even fourteen days. On the eighth day he sent the people away, and they blessed the king, and went to their tents joyful and glad of heart for all the goodness that Yahweh had shown to David his servant, 
and to Israel, his people. Chapter 9 God's Covenant with Solomon It happened when Solomon had finished the building of the house of Yahweh and the king's house, and all Solomon's desire which he was pleased to do, that Yahweh appeared to Solomon the second time, as he had appeared to him at Gibeon. Yahweh said to him, I have heard your prayer and your supplication that you have made before me. I have made this house holy, which you have built, to put my name there forever, and my eyes and my heart shall be there perpetually. As for you, if you will walk before me, as David your father walked, in integrity of heart and in uprightness, to do according to all that I have commanded you, and will keep my statutes and my ordinances. Then I will establish the throne of your kingdom over Israel forever, according as I promised to David your father, saying, There shall not fail you a man on the throne of Israel. But if you turn away from following me, you or your children, and not keep my commandments and my statutes which I have set before you, but shall go and serve other gods and worship them, then will I cut off Israel out of the land which I have given them, and this house which I have made holy for my name will I cast out of my sight and Israel shall be a proverb and a byword among all peoples. Though this house is so high, yet shall everyone who passes by it be astonished, and shall hiss, and they shall say, Why has Yahweh done thus to this land and to this house? And they shall answer, because they forsook Yahweh their God, who brought forth their fathers out of the land of Egypt, and laid hold of other gods, and worshipped them, and served them. Therefore Yahweh has brought all this evil on them. Cities Given to Hiram It happened at the end of twenty years, in which Solomon had built the two houses, the house of Yahweh and the king's house. Now Hiram, the king of Tyre, had furnished Solomon with cedar trees and fir trees and with gold, according to all his desire, that then King Solomon gave Hiram twenty cities in the land of Galilee, Hiram came out from Tyre to see the cities which Solomon had given him, and they didn't please him. He said, What cities are these which you have given me, my brother? He called them the land of Cable to this day. Hiram sent to the king 120 talents of gold. Solomon's Numerous Achievements this is the reason of the levy which King Solomon raised, to build the house of Yahweh, and his own house, and Milo, and the wall of Jerusalem, and Hazor, and Megiddo, and Gezer. Pharaoh, king of Egypt, had gone up, and taken Gezer, and burnt it with fire, and slain the Canaanites who lived in the city, and given it for a portion to his daughter, Solomon's wife. Solomon built Gezer, and Bethhoron the Lord, and Baaloth, and Tamar in the wilderness, in the land, and all the storage cities that Solomon had, and the cities for his chariots, and the cities for his horsemen, and that which Solomon desired to build for his pleasure in Jerusalem, and in Lebanon, 
and in all the land of his dominion. As for all the people who were left of the Amorites, the Hittites, the Perizzites, the Hivites, and the Jebusites, who were not of the children of Israel, their children who were left after them in the land, whom the children of Israel were not able utterly to destroy. Of them did Solomon raise a levy of bondservants to this day. But of the children of Israel did Solomon make no bondservants. But they were the men of war, and his servants, and his princes, and his captains, and rulers of his chariots, and of his horsemen. These were the chief officers who were over Solomon's work, five hundred fifty, who bore rule over the people who labored in the work. But Pharaoh's daughter came up out of the city of David to her house, which Solomon had built for her. Then did he build Milo. Three times a year did Solomon offer burnt offerings and peace offerings on the altar which he built to Yahweh burning incense therewith on the altar that was before Yahweh. So he finished the house. King Solomon made a navy of ships in Ezion Geber, which is beside Eloth, on the shore of the Red Sea, in the land of Edom. Hiram sent in the navy his servants, sailors who had knowledge of the sea, with the servants of Solomon. They came to Ophir, and fetched from there gold, four hundred and twenty talents, and brought it to King Solomon. Chapter 10 The Queen of Sheba When the Queen of Sheba heard of the fame of Solomon concerning the name of Yahweh, she came to prove him with hard questions. She came to Jerusalem with a very great train, with camels that bore spices, and very much gold, and precious stones. And when she was come to Solomon, she talked with him of all that was in her heart. Solomon told her all her questions. There was not anything hidden from the king which he didn't tell her. When the queen of Sheba had seen all the wisdom of Solomon, and the house that he had built, and the food of his table, and the sitting of his servants, and the attendance of his ministers, and their clothing, and his cupbearers, and his ascent by which he went up to the house of Yahweh. There was no more spirit in her. She said to the king, It was a true report that I heard in my own land of your acts and of your wisdom. However, I didn't believe the words until I came, and my eyes had seen it. Behold, the half was not told me. Your wisdom and prosperity exceed the fame which I heard. Happy are your men, happy are these your servants, who stand continually before you, who hear your wisdom. Blessed is Yahweh your God, who delighted in you, to set you on the throne of Israel. Because Yahweh loved Israel forever, therefore made he you king, to do justice and righteousness. She gave the king 120 talents of gold, and of spices very great store, and precious stones. There came no more such abundance of spices as these which the queen of Sheba gave to King Solomon. The navy also of Hiram, that brought gold from Ophir, brought in from Ophir great plenty of almug trees and precious stones. The king made of the almug trees pillars for the house of Yahweh and for the king's house, harps also, and stringed instruments for the singers. There came no such almug trees, nor were seen to this day. King Solomon gave to the queen of Sheba all her desire, whatever she asked, besides that which Solomon gave her of his royal bounty. So she turned and went to her own land, she and her servants. Solomon's Riches
Now the weight of gold that came to Solomon in one year was 666 talents of gold, besides that which the traders brought, and the traffic of the merchants, and of all the kings of the mixed people, and of the governors of the country. King Solomon made 200 bucklers of beaten gold. Six hundred shekels of gold went to one buckler. He made three hundred shields of beaten gold. Three minas of gold went to one shield. And the king put them in the house of the forest of Lebanon. Moreover, the king made a great throne of ivory and overlaid it with the finest gold. There were six steps to the throne, and the top of the throne was round behind. And there were stays on either side by the place of the seat, and two lions standing beside the stays. Twelve lions stood there on the one side and on the other side on the six steps. There was nothing like it made in any kingdom. All King Solomon's drinking vessels were of gold, and all the vessels of the house of the forest of Lebanon were of pure gold. None were of silver. It was nothing accounted of in the days of Solomon. For the king had at sea a navy of Tarshish with the navy of Hiram. Once every three years came the navy of Tarshish, bringing gold and silver, ivory and apes and peacocks. So King Solomon exceeded all the kings of the earth in riches and in wisdom. All the earth sought the presence of Solomon to hear his wisdom, which God had put in his heart. They brought every man his tribute, vessels of silver and vessels of gold and clothing and armor and spices, horses and mules, a rate year by year. Solomon gathered together chariots and horsemen, and he had a thousand and four hundred chariots, and twelve thousand horsemen that he bestowed in the chariot cities and with the king at Jerusalem. The king made silver to be in Jerusalem as stones, and cedars made he to be as the sycamore trees that are in the lowland for abundance. The horses which Solomon had were brought out of Egypt, and the king's merchants received them in droves, each drove at a price. A chariot came up and went out of Egypt for six hundred shekels of silver, and a horse for one hundred fifty, and so for all the kings of the Hittites, and for the kings of Syria, did they bring them out by their means. Chapter 11 Solomon's Foreign Wives now King Solomon loved many foreign women, together with the daughter of Pharaoh, women of the Moabites, Ammonites, Edomites, Sidonians, and Hittites, of the nations concerning which Yahweh said to the children of Israel, You shall not go among them, neither shall they come among you, for surely they will turn away your heart after their gods. Solomon joined to these in love. He had seven hundred wives, princesses, and three hundred concubines, and his wives turned away his heart. For it happened, when Solomon was old, that his wives turned away his heart after other gods, and his heart was not perfect with Yahweh his God, as was the heart of David his father. For Solomon went after Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, and after Milcom, the abomination of the Ammonites. Solomon did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and didn't go fully after Yahweh, as did David his father. Then did Solomon build a high place for Chemosh, the abomination of Moab, on the mountain that is before Jerusalem, and for Molech the abomination of the children of Ammon. So did he for all his foreign wives, who burnt incense and sacrificed to their gods. God's Anger Against Solomon 
Yahweh was angry with Solomon because his heart was turned away from Yahweh, the God of Israel, who had appeared to him twice and had commanded him concerning this thing, that he should not go after other gods. But he didn't keep that which Yahweh commanded. Therefore, Yahweh said to Solomon, Because this is done by you, and you have not kept my covenant and my statutes, which I have commanded you, I will surely tear the kingdom from you, and will give it to your servant. Notwithstanding, I will not do it in your days, for David your father's sake but I will tear it out of the hand of your son. However, I will not tear away all the kingdom, but I will give one tribe to your son, for David my servant's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, which I have chosen. Hey, Dad's Return Yahweh raised up an adversary to Solomon. Hadad the Edomite. He was of the king's seed in Edom. For it happened, when David was in Edom, and Joab, the captain of the army, was gone up to bury the slain, and had struck every male in Edom. For Joab and all Israel remained there six months, until he had cut off every male in Edom, that Hadad fled he and certain Edomites of his father's servants with him, to go into Egypt, Hadad being yet a little child. They arose out of Midian and came to Paran, and they took men with them out of Paran, and they came to Egypt, to Pharaoh, king of Egypt, who gave him a house and appointed him food and gave him land. Hadad found great favor in the sight of Pharaoh, so that he gave him as wife the sister of his own wife, the sister of Topanes the queen. The sister of Topanes bore him Genubath, his son, whom Topanes weaned in Pharaoh's house. And Genubath was in Pharaoh's house among the sons of Pharaoh. When Hadad heard in Egypt, that David slept with his fathers, and that Joab, the captain of the army, was dead. Hadad said to Pharaoh, Let me depart, that I may go to my own country. Then Pharaoh said to him, But what have you lacked with me, that, behold, you seek to go to your own country? He answered, Nothing. However, only let me depart. Reasons Hostility God raised up another adversary to him, Reason, the son of Eliada, who had fled from his lord Hadadezer, king of Zobah. He gathered men to him and became captain over a troop when David killed them of Zobah. And they went to Damascus and lived therein and reigned in Damascus. He was an adversary to Israel all the days of Solomon, besides the mischief that Hadad did. And he abhorred Israel and reigned over Syria. Jeroboam's Rebellion Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, an Ephraimite of Zerida, a servant of Solomon, whose mother's name was Zeruah, a widow, he also lifted up his hand against the king. This was the reason why he lifted up his hand against the king. Solomon built Millo and repaired the breach of the city of David his father. The man Jeroboam was a mighty man of valor, and Solomon saw the young man that he was industrious, and he put him in charge of all the labor of the house of Joseph. It happened at that time when Jeroboam went out of Jerusalem, that the prophet Ahijah the Shilonite found him in the way. Now Ahijah had clad himself with a new garment, and they too were alone in the field. Ahijah laid hold of the new garment that was on him, and tore it in twelve pieces, 
he said to Jeroboam, Take ten pieces, for thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Behold, I will tear the kingdom out of the hand of Solomon, and will give ten tribes to you, but he shall have one tribe, for my servant David's sake, and for Jerusalem's sake, the city which I have chosen out of all the tribes of Israel because that they have forsaken me, and have worshipped Ashtoreth, the goddess of the Sidonians, Chemosh, the god of Moab, and Milcom, the god of the children of Ammon. They have not walked in my ways, to do that which is right in my eyes, and to keep my statutes and my ordinances, as David his father did. However, I will not take the whole kingdom out of his hand, but I will make him prince all the days of his life. For David, my servant's sake, whom I chose, who kept my commandments and my statutes. But I will take the kingdom out of his son's hand, and will give it to you, even ten tribes. To his son will I give one tribe, that David, my servant, may have a lamp always before me in Jerusalem the city which I have chosen me to put my name there. I will take you, and you shall reign according to all that your soul desires, and shall be king over Israel. It shall be, if you will listen to all that I command you, and will walk in my ways, and do that which is right in my eyes, to keep my statutes and my commandments, as David my servant did, that I will be with you and will build you a sure house, as I built for David, and will give Israel to you. I will for this afflict the seed of David, but not forever. Solomon sought therefore to kill Jeroboam, but Jeroboam arose, and fled into Egypt, to Shishak, king of Egypt, and was in Egypt until the death of Solomon. The Death of Solomon now the rest of the acts of Solomon, and all that he did, and his wisdom, aren't they written in the book of the Acts of Solomon? The time that Solomon reigned in Jerusalem over all Israel was forty years. Solomon slept with his fathers, and was buried in the city of David his father. And Rehoboam his son reigned in his place. Chapter 12 Rebellion Against Rehoboam Rehoboam went to Shechem, for all Israel were come to Shechem to make him king. It happened when Jeroboam the son of Nebat heard of it, for he was yet in Egypt, where he had fled from the presence of King Solomon. And Jeroboam lived in Egypt, and they sent and called him that Jeroboam and all the assembly of Israel came and spoke to Rehoboam, saying, Your father made our yoke grievous. Now, therefore, make you the grievous service of your father and his heavy yoke which he put on us lighter, and we will serve you. He said to them, Depart for three days, then come back to me. The people departed. King Rehoboam took counsel with the old men, who had stood before Solomon his father, while he yet lived, saying, What counsel do you give me to return answer to this people? They spoke to him, saying, If you will be a servant to this people this day, and will serve them, and answer them, and speak good words to them, then they will be your servants forever. But he forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him, and took counsel with the young men who had grown up with him, who stood before him. He said to them, What counsel do you give, that we may return answer to this people, who have spoken to me, saying, Make the yoke that your father did put on us lighter? The young men who had grown up with him spoke to him, saying, Thus you shall tell this people who spoke to you, saying, Your father made our yoke heavy, but make it lighter to us. You shall say to them, 
My little finger is thicker than my father's waist. Now, whereas my father burdened you with a heavy yoke, I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So Jeroboam and all the people came to Rehoboam the third day, as the king asked, saying, Come to me again the third day. The king answered the people roughly, and forsook the counsel of the old men which they had given him, and spoke to them according to the counsel of the young men, saying, My father made your yoke heavy, but I will add to your yoke. My father chastised you with whips, but I will chastise you with scorpions. So the king didn't listen to the people, for it was a thing brought about of Yahweh, that he might establish his word, which Yahweh spoke by Ahijah the Shilonite to Jeroboam the son of Nebat. The Kingdom Divided when all Israel saw that the king didn't listen to them, the people answered the king, saying, What portion have we in David? Neither do we have an inheritance in the son of Jesse. To your tents, Israel! Now see to your own house, David. So Israel departed to their tents. But as for the children of Israel who lived in the cities of Judah, Rehoboam reigned over them. Then King Rehoboam sent Adoram, who was over the men subject to forced labor. And all Israel stoned him to death with stones. King Rehoboam made speed to get him up to his chariot to flee to Jerusalem. So Israel rebelled against the house of David to this day. Shemaiah's Prophecy It happened when all Israel heard that Jeroboam was returned, that they sent and called him to the congregation and made him king over all Israel. There was none who followed the house of David, but the tribe of Judah only. When Rehoboam was come to Jerusalem, he assembled all the house of Judah and the tribe of Benjamin, a hundred and eighty thousand chosen men who were warriors, to fight against the house of Israel, to bring the kingdom again to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon. But the word of God came to Shemaiah, the man of God, saying, Speak to Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, king of Judah, and to all the house of Judah and Benjamin, and to the rest of the people, saying, Thus says Yahweh, you shall not go up, nor fight against your brothers, the children of Israel. Everyone return to his house, for this thing is of me. So they listened to the word of Yahweh, and returned, and went their way, according to the word of Yahweh. Jeroboam's Idolatry then Jeroboam built Shechem in the hill country of Ephraim and lived in it. And he went out from there and built Penuel. Jeroboam said in his heart, Now the kingdom will return to the house of David. If this people goes up to offer sacrifices in the house of Yahweh at Jerusalem, then the heart of this people will turn again to their Lord, even to Rehoboam, king of Judah and they will kill me, and return to Rehoboam king of Judah. Whereupon the king took counsel, and made two calves of gold, and he said to them, It is too much for you to go up to Jerusalem. Look and see your gods, Israel, which brought you up out of the land of Egypt. He set the one in Bethel, and the other put he in Dan. This thing became a sin, for the people went to worship before the one, even to Dan. He made houses of high places, and made priests from among all the people, who were not of the sons of Levi. Jeroboam ordained a feast in the eighth month, on the fifteenth day of the month, 
like the feast that is in Judah. And he went up to the altar. So did he in Bethel, sacrificing to the calves that he had made. And he placed in Bethel the priests of the high places that he had made. He went up to the altar which he had made in Bethel on the fifteenth day in the eighth month, even in the month which he had devised of his own heart. And he ordained a feast for the children of Israel and went up to the altar to burn incense. End of section 29. Chapter 13 Jeroboam's Hand Withers Behold, there came a man of God out of Judah by the word of Yahweh to Bethel, and Jeroboam was standing by the altar to burn incense. He cried against the altar by the word of Yahweh and said, Altar, altar, thus says Yahweh, Behold, a son shall be born to the house of David, Josiah by name. On you he shall sacrifice the priests of the high places who burn incense on you, and they will burn men's bones on you. He gave a sign the same day, saying, This is the sign which Yahweh has spoken. Behold, the altar will be split apart and the ashes that are on it will be poured out. It happened when the king heard the saying of the man of God, which he cried against the altar in Bethel, that Jeroboam put out his hand from the altar, saying, Seize him! His hand, which he put out against him, dried up, so that he could not draw it back again to himself. The altar also was split apart, and the ashes poured out from the altar, according to the sign which the man of God had given by the word of Yahweh. The king answered the man of God, Now entreat the favor of Yahweh your God, and pray for me, that my hand may be restored me again. The man of God entreated Yahweh, and the king's hand was restored him again, and became as it was before. The king said to the man of God, Come home with me, and refresh yourself, and I will give you a reward. The man of God said to the king, Even if you gave me half of your house, I would not go in with you, neither would I eat bread nor drink water in this place. For so was it commanded me by the word of Yahweh, saying, You shall eat no bread nor drink water neither return by the way that you came. So he went another way, and didn't return by the way that he came to Bethel. The Prophet's Disobedience Now there lived an old prophet in Bethel, and one of his sons came and told him all the works that the man of God had done that day in Bethel. They also told their father the words which he had spoken to the king. Their father said to them, Which way did he go? Now his sons had seen which way the man of God went, who came from Judah. He said to his sons, Saddle the donkey for me. So they saddled the donkey for him, and he rode on it. He went after the man of God, and found him sitting under an oak. He said to him, Are you the man of God who came from Judah? He said, I am. Then he said to him, Come home with me and eat bread. He said, I may not return with you, nor go in with you, neither will I eat bread nor drink water with you in this place. For it was said to me by the word of Yahweh, You shall eat no bread nor drink water there, nor turn again to go by the way that you came. He said to him, I also am a prophet, as you are. And an angel spoke to me by the word of Yahweh, saying, Bring him back with you into your house, that he may eat bread and drink water. He lied to him. 
So he went back with him and ate bread in his house and drank water. It happened, as they sat at the table, that the word of Yahweh came to the prophet who brought him back. And he cried to the man of God who came from Judah, saying, Thus says Yahweh, Because you have been disobedient to the mouth of Yahweh, and have not kept the commandment which Yahweh your God commanded you, but came back, and have eaten bread, and drunk water, in the place of which he said to you, Eat no bread, and drink no water. Your body shall not come to the tomb of your fathers. It happened, after he had eaten bread, and after he had drunk, that he saddled the donkey for the prophet whom he had brought back. When he had gone, a lion met him by the way and killed him. His body was cast in the way, and the donkey stood by it. The lion also stood by the body. Behold, men passed by and saw the body cast in the way, and the lion standing by the body. And they came and told it in the city where the old prophet lived. When the prophet who brought him back from the way heard of it, he said, It is the man of God who was disobedient to the mouth of Yahweh. Therefore Yahweh has delivered him to the lion, which has mauled him and slain him, according to the word of Yahweh, which he spoke to him. He spoke to his sons, saying, Saddle the donkey for me. They saddled it. He went and found his body cast in the way, and the donkey and the lion standing by the body. The lion had not eaten the body, nor mauled the donkey. The prophet took up the body of the man of God and laid it on the donkey and brought it back. He came to the city of the old prophet to mourn and to bury him. He laid his body in his own grave, and they mourned over him saying, Alas, my brother, it happened, after he had buried him, that he spoke to his sons, saying, When I am dead, then bury me in the tomb in which the man of God is buried. Lay my bones beside his bones, for the saying which he cried by the word of Yahweh against the altar in Bethel, and against all the houses of the high places which are in the cities of Samaria, will surely happen. After this thing, Jeroboam didn't return from his evil way, but again made priests of the high places from among all the people. Whoever wanted to, he consecrated him, that there might be priests of the high places. This thing became sin to the house of Jeroboam, even to cut it off and to destroy it from off the surface of the earth. Chapter 14 Ahijah's Prophecy Against Jeroboam At that time, Abijah, the son of Jeroboam, fell sick. Jeroboam said to his wife, Please, get up and disguise yourself that you won't be recognized as the wife of Jeroboam. Go to Shiloh. Behold, there is Ahijah the prophet, who spoke concerning me that I should be king over this people. Take with you ten loaves and cakes and a jar of honey, and go to him. He will tell you what will become of the child. Jeroboam's wife did so, and arose, and went to Shiloh and came to the house of Ahijah. Now Ahijah could not see, for his eyes were set by reason of his age. Yahweh said to Ahijah, Behold, the wife of Jeroboam comes to inquire of you concerning her son, for he is sick. Thus and thus you shall tell her, for it will be when she comes in that she will pretend to be another woman. It was so, when Ahijah heard the sound of her feet, as she came in at the door, that he said, Come in, 
you wife of Jeroboam. Why do you pretend to be another? For I am sent to you with heavy news. Go, tell Jeroboam. Thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, Because I exalted you from among the people, and made you prince over my people Israel, and tore the kingdom away from the house of David, and gave it to you, and yet you have not been as my servant David, who kept my commandments, and who followed me with all his heart, to do that only which was right in my eyes, but have done evil above all who were before you, and have gone and made you other gods and molten images, to provoke me to anger, and have cast me behind your back. Therefore, behold, I will bring evil on the house of Jeroboam, and will cut off from Jeroboam everyone who urinates on a wall, he who is shut up, and he who is left at large in Israel and will utterly sweep away the house of Jeroboam, as a man sweeps away dung, until it is all gone. He who dies of Jeroboam in the city shall the dogs eat, and he who dies in the field shall the birds of the sky eat, for Yahweh has spoken it. Arise, therefore, and go to your house. When your feet enter the city, the child shall die. All Israel shall mourn for him and bury him, for he only of Jeroboam shall come to the grave, because in him there is found some good thing toward Yahweh the God of Israel, in the house of Jeroboam. Moreover, Yahweh will raise him up a king over Israel, who shall cut off the house of Jeroboam. This is day, what, even now? For Yahweh will strike Israel, as a reed is shaken in the water, and he will root up Israel out of this good land which he gave to their fathers, and will scatter them beyond the river, because they have made their Asherim, provoking Yahweh to anger. He will give Israel up because of the sins of Jeroboam, which he has sinned and with which he has made Israel to sin. Jeroboam's wife arose and departed and came to Terza. As she came to the threshold of the house, the child died. All Israel buried him and mourned for him, according to the word of Yahweh, which he spoke by his servant Ahijah the prophet. Nadab succeeds Jeroboam. The rest of the acts of Jeroboam, how he warred and how he reigned, behold, they are written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel. The days which Jeroboam reigned were two and twenty years, and he slept with his fathers, and Nadab his son reigned in his place. Rehoboam's Wicked Reign in Judah Rehoboam, the son of Solomon, reigned in Judah. Rehoboam was forty-one years old when he began to reign, and he reigned seventeen years in Jerusalem, the city which Yahweh had chosen out of all the tribes of Israel to put his name there. And his mother's name was Naamah the Ammonitess, 
Judah did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and they provoked him to jealousy with their sins which they committed, above all that their fathers had done. For they also built them high places, and pillars, and asherim, on every high hill, and under every green tree. And there were also sodomites in the land, they did according to all the abominations of the nations which Yahweh drove out before the children of Israel. Shishak raids Jerusalem. It happened in the fifth year of King Rehoboam that Shishak, king of Egypt, came up against Jerusalem. And he took away the treasures of the house of Yahweh and the treasures of the king's house. He even took away all, and he took away all the shields of gold which Solomon had made. King Rehoboam made in their place shields of brass, and committed them to the hands of the captains of the guard, who kept the door of the king's house. It was so, that as often as the king went into the house of Yahweh, the guard bore them, and brought them back into the guard room. Now the rest of the acts of Rehoboam and all that he did, aren't they written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? There was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam continually. Rehoboam slept with his fathers and was buried with his fathers in the city of David. And his mother's name was Naamah the Ammonitess. Abijam, his son, reigned in his place. Chapter 15 Abijam's Wicked Reign in Judah Now in the eighteenth year of King Jeroboam, the son of Nebat began Abijam to reign over Judah. Three years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. He walked in all the sins of his father, which he had done before him. And his heart was not perfect with Yahweh his God, as the heart of David his father. Nevertheless, for David's sake, did Yahweh his God give him a lamp in Jerusalem to set up his son after him and to establish Jerusalem. Because David did that which was right in the eyes of Yahweh, and didn't turn aside from anything that he commanded him all the days of his life, except only in the matter of Uriah the Hittite. Now there was war between Rehoboam and Jeroboam all the days of his life. The rest of the acts of Abijam and all that he did, aren't they written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? There was war between Abijam and Jeroboam. Abijam slept with his fathers, and they buried him in the city of David, and Asa his son reigned in his place. Asa's Good Reign in Judah In the twentieth year of Jeroboam, king of Israel, began Asa to reign over Judah. Forty-one years reigned he in Jerusalem, and his mother's name was Maacah, the daughter of Abishalom. Asa did that which was right in the eyes of Yahweh, as did David his father. He put away the Sodomites out of the land, and removed all the idols that his fathers had made. Also Maacah, his mother, he removed from being queen, because she had made an abominable image for an Asherah. And Asa cut down her image, and burnt it at the brook Kidron. But the high places were not taken away. Nevertheless, the heart of Asa was perfect with Yahweh all his days. He brought into the house of Yahweh the things that his father had dedicated, and the things that himself had dedicated silver, and gold, and vessels. War between Asa and Baasha 
there was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. Baasha, king of Israel, went up against Judah and built Ramah, that he might not allow anyone to go out or come in to Asa, king of Judah. Then Asa took all the silver and the gold that were left in the treasures of the house of Yahweh and the treasures of the king's house, and delivered them into the hand of his servants. And king Asa sent them to Ben-Hadad, the son of Tabrimon, the son of Hezion, king of Syria, who lived at Damascus, saying, There is a treaty between me and you between my father and your father. Behold, I have sent to you a present of silver and gold. Go, break your treaty with Baasha, king of Israel, that he may depart from me. Ben-Hadad listened to King Asa and sent the captains of his armies against the cities of Israel and struck Ijon and Dan and abel beth and all Kinneroth with all the land of Naphtali. It happened, when Baasha heard of it, that he left off building Ramah and lived in Terzah. Then King Asa made a proclamation to all Judah. None was exempted. And they carried away the stones of Ramah and its timber with which Baasha had built. And King Asa built therewith Geba of Benjamin, and Mizpah. Jehoshaphat succeeds Asa. Now the rest of all the acts of Asa, and all his might, and all that he did, and the cities which he built, aren't they written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Judah? But in the time of his old age, he was diseased in his feet. Asa slept with his fathers, and was buried with his fathers in the city of David, his father. And Jehoshaphat, his son, reigned in his place. Nadab's Wicked Reign in Israel Nadab, the son of Jeroboam, began to reign over Israel in the second year of Asa, king of Judah. And he reigned over Israel two years. He did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and walked in the way of his father, and in his sin with which he made Israel to sin. Baasha, the son of Ahijah, of the house of Issachar, conspired against him. And Baasha struck him at Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines, for Nadab and all Israel were laying siege to Gibbethon. Even in the third year of Asa, king of Judah, did Baasha kill him and reign in his place. It happened that, as soon as he was king, he struck all the house of Jeroboam. He didn't leave to Jeroboam any who breathed until he had destroyed him, according to the saying of Yahweh which he spoke by his servant Ahijah the Shilonite. For the sins of Jeroboam, which he sinned, and with which he made Israel to sin, because of his provocation with which he provoked Yahweh, the God of Israel, to anger. Now the rest of the acts of Nadab and all that he did, aren't they written in the book of the Chronicles of the Kings of Israel? There was war between Asa and Baasha, king of Israel, all their days. Baasha's Wicked Reign in Israel In the third year of Asa, king of Judah, began Baasha, the son of Ahijah, to reign over all Israel in Terzah, and reigned twenty-four years. He did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and walked in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin with which he made Israel to sin. Chapter 16
Jehu's prophecy against Baasha. The word of Yahweh came to Jehu, the son of Hanani, against Baasha, saying, Because I exalted you out of the dust, and made you prince over my people Israel, and you have walked in the way of Jeroboam, and have made my people Israel to sin, to provoke me to anger with their sins. Behold, I will utterly sweep away Baasha and his house, and I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat. The dogs will eat Baasha's descendants who die in the city, and he who dies of his in the field, the birds of the sky will eat. Now the rest of the acts of Baasha, and what he did, and his might, Aren't they written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? Baasha slept with his fathers and was buried in Terzah. And Elah, his son, reigned in his place. Moreover, by the prophet Jehu, the son of Hanani, came the word of Yahweh against Baasha and against his house both because of all the evil that he did in the sight of Yahweh, to provoke him to anger with the work of his hands, in being like the house of Jeroboam, and because he struck him. Elah reigns in Israel. In the twenty-sixth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Elah, the son of Baasha, to reign over Israel, in Terzah, and reigned two years. His servant Zimri, captain of half his chariots, conspired against him. Now he was in Terzah, drinking himself drunk in the house of Arza, who was over the household in Terzah. And Zimri went in and struck him and killed him in the twenty-seventh year of Asa, king of Judah and reigned in his place. It happened when he began to reign, as soon as he sat on his throne, that he struck all the house of Baasha. He didn't leave him a single one who urinates on a wall, neither of his relatives, nor of his friends. Thus Zimri destroyed all the house of Baasha, according to the word of Yahweh which he spoke against Baasha by Jehu the prophet, for all the sins of Baasha and the sins of Elah his son, which they sinned, and with which they made Israel to sin, to provoke Yahweh, the God of Israel, to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Elah and all that he did, aren't they written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? Zimri reigns in Israel. In the twenty-seventh year of Asa, king of Judah, did Zimri reign seven days in Terzah. Now the people were encamped against Gibbethon, which belonged to the Philistines. The people who were encamped heard say, Zimri has conspired and has also struck the king. Therefore all Israel made Amri, the captain of the army, king over Israel that day in the camp. Amri went up from Gibbethon, and all Israel with him, and they besieged Terzah. It happened, when Zimri saw that the city was taken, that he went into the castle of the king's house, and burnt the king's house over him with fire, and died for his sins which he sinned in doing that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, in walking in the way of Jeroboam, and in his sin which he did to make Israel to sin. Now the rest of the acts of Zimri and his treason that he did, aren't they written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? Amri reigns in Israel. Then were the people of Israel divided into two parts. 
half of the people followed Tibni, the son of Gynath, to make him king, and half followed Umri. But the people who followed Umri prevailed against the people who followed Tibni, the son of Gynath. So Tibni died, and Umri reigned. In the thirty-first year of Asa, king of Judah, began Umri to reign over Israel, and reigned twelve years. Six years reigned he in Terzah. He bought the hill Samaria of Shemer for two talents of silver, and he built on the hill, and called the name of the city which he built after the name of Shemer, the owner of the hill, Samaria. Amri did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, and dealt wickedly above all who were before him. For he walked in all the way of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and in his sins, with which he made Israel to sin, to provoke Yahweh, the God of Israel, to anger with their vanities. Now the rest of the acts of Amri, which he did, and his might that he showed, Aren't they written in the book of the chronicles of the kings of Israel? So Amri slept with his fathers, and was buried in Samaria. And Ahab his son reigned in his place. Ahab reigns in Israel, marries Jezebel. In the thirty-eighth year of Asa, king of Judah, began Ahab the son of Amri, to reign over Israel. And Ahab, the son of Amri, reigned over Israel in Samaria twenty-two years. Ahab, the son of Amri, did that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, above all that were before him. It happened, as if it had been a light thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he took as wife Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbaal, king of the Sidonians, and went and served Baal and worshipped him. He reared up an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he had built in Samaria. Ahab made the Asherah, and Ahab did yet more to provoke Yahweh, the God of Israel, to anger than all the kings of Israel who were before him. In his days did Hiel, the Bethelite, build Jericho. He laid its foundation with the loss of Abiram, his firstborn, and set up its gates with the loss of his youngest son, Segub, according to the word of Yahweh, which he spoke by Joshua, the son of Nun. Chapter 17 Ravens feed Elijah. Elijah the Tishbite, who was of the foreigners of Gilead, said to Ahab, As Yahweh, the God of Israel, lives, before whom I stand, there shall not be dew nor rain these years, but according to my word. The word of Yahweh came to him, saying, Go away from here. Turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Kareth, that is before the Jordan. It shall be that you shall drink of the brook. I have commanded the ravens to feed you there. So he went, and did according to the word of Yahweh. For he went and lived by the brook Kareth, that is before the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and flesh in the morning, and bread and flesh in the evening, and he drank of the brook. It happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. The Widow of Zarephath The word of Yahweh came to him, saying, Arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to sustain you. So he arose and went to Zarephath. 
And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please, get me a little water in a vessel that I may drink. As she was going to get it, he called to her and said, Please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. She said, As Yahweh your God lives, I don't have a cake, but a handful of meal in the jar, and a little oil in the jar. Behold, I am gathering two sticks, that I may go in and bake it for me and my son, that we may eat it and die. Elijah said to her, Don't be afraid. Go and do as you have said, but make me of it a little cake first, and bring it out to me, and afterward make some for you and for your son. For thus says Yahweh, the God of Israel, The jar of meal shall not empty, neither shall the jar of oil fail, until the day that Yahweh sends rain on the earth. She went and did according to the saying of Elijah, and she and he and her house ate many days. The jar of meal didn't empty, neither did the jar of oil fail, according to the word of Yahweh, which he spoke by Elijah. Elijah raises the widow's son. It happened after these things that the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, fell sick. And his sickness was so severe that there was no breath left in him. She said to Elijah, What have I to do with you, you man of God? You have come to me to bring my sin to memory and to kill my son? He said to her, Give me your son. He took him out of her bosom and carried him up into the room where he stayed and laid him on his own bed. He cried to Yahweh and said, Yahweh, my God, have you also brought evil on the widow with whom I stay by killing her son? He stretched himself on the child three times and cried to Yahweh and said, Yahweh, my God, please let this child's soul come into him again. Yahweh listened to the voice of Elijah and the soul of the child came into him again, and he revived. Elijah took the child and brought him down out of the room into the house and delivered him to his mother. And Elijah said, Behold, your son lives. The woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God and that the word of Yahweh in your mouth is truth. Chapter 18 Elijah Confronts Ahab It happened after many days that the word of Yahweh came to Elijah in the third year, saying, Go, show yourself to Ahab, and I will send rain on the earth. Elijah went to show himself to Ahab. The famine was severe in Samaria. Ahab called Obadiah, who was over the household. Now Obadiah feared Yahweh greatly, for it was so when Jezebel cut off the prophets of Yahweh that Obadiah took 100 prophets and hid them by 50 in a cave and fed them with bread and water. Ahab said to Obadiah, Go through the land, to all the springs of water, and to all the brooks. Perhaps we may find grass, and save the horses and mules alive, and we not lose all the animals. So they divided the land between them, to pass through it. Ahab went one way by himself, and Obadiah went another way by himself. As Obadiah was in the way, behold, Elijah met him. And he recognized him, and fell on his face, and said, Is it you, my lord Elijah? He answered him, It is I. Go tell your lord, Behold, Elijah is here. He said, 
wherein have I sinned, that you would deliver your servant into the hand of Ahab to kill me? As Yahweh your God lives, there is no nation or kingdom where my Lord has not sent to seek you. When they said, He is not here, he took an oath of the kingdom and nation that they didn't find you. Now you say, Go tell your Lord, Behold, Elijah is here. It will happen as soon as I am gone from you that the Spirit of Yahweh will carry you I don't know where. And so when I come and tell Ahab, and he can't find you, he will kill me. But I, your servant, have feared Yahweh from my youth. Wasn't it told, my Lord, what I did when Jezebel killed the prophets of Yahweh? How I hid one hundred men of Yahweh's prophets with fifty to a cave, and fed them with bread and water. Now you say, Go tell your Lord, Behold, Elijah is here, and he will kill me. Elijah said, As Yahweh of armies lives, before whom I stand, I will surely show myself to him today. Elijah on Mount Carmel So Obadiah went to meet Ahab and told him, and Ahab went to meet Elijah. It happened when Ahab saw Elijah that Ahab said to him, Is that you, you troubler of Israel? He answered, I have not troubled Israel but you and your father's house, in that you have forsaken the commandments of Yahweh, and you have followed the Baals. Now therefore, send and gather to me all Israel to Mount Carmel, and four hundred fifty of the prophets of Baal, and four hundred of the prophets of the Asherah, who eat at Jezebel's table. So Ahab sent to all the children of Israel, and gathered the prophets together, to Mount Carmel. Elijah came near to all the people and said, How long will you waver between the two sides? If Yahweh is God, follow him. But if Baal, then follow him. The people answered him not a word. Then Elijah said to the people, I, even I only, am left a prophet of Yahweh. But Baal's prophets are four hundred fifty men. Let them, therefore, give us two bulls, and let them choose one bull for themselves, and cut it in pieces, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire under it. And I will dress the other bull, and lay it on the wood, and put no fire under it. You call on the name of your God, and I will call on the name of Yahweh the God who answers by fire, let him be God. All the people answered, It is well said. Elijah said to the prophets of Baal, Choose one bull for yourselves, and dress it first, for you are many, and call on the name of your God, but put no fire under it. They took the bull which was given them, and they dressed it, and called on the name of Baal, from morning even until noon, saying, Baal, hear us. But there was no voice, nor any who answered. They leaped about the altar which was made. It happened at noon that Elijah mocked them and said, Cry aloud, for he is a god. Either he is musing, or he has gone aside, or he is on a journey, or perhaps he sleeps and must be awakened. They cried aloud and cut themselves in their way with knives and lances until the blood gushed out on them. It was so when midday was past that they prophesied until the time of the offering of the oblation, but there was neither voice nor any to answer nor any who regarded. Elijah said to all the people, Come near to me, and all the people came near to him. He repaired the altar of Yahweh that was thrown down. Elijah took twelve stones, according to the number of the tribes of the sons of Jacob, to whom the word of Yahweh came, saying, Israel shall be your name. 
With the stones, he built an altar in the name of Yahweh. He made a trench around the altar, large enough to contain two measures of seed. He put the wood in order and cut the bull in pieces and laid it on the wood. He said, Fill four jars with water and pour it on the burnt offering and on the wood. He said, Do it a second time. And they did it the second time. He said, Do it a third time. And they did it the third time. The water ran around the altar, and he also filled the trench with water. Elijah's Prayer it happened at the time of the offering of the oblation that Elijah the prophet came near and said, Yahweh, the God of Abraham, of Isaac, and of Israel, let it be known this day that you are God in Israel, and that I am your servant, and that I have done all these things at your word. Hear me, Yahweh, hear me, that this people may know that you, Yahweh are God, and that you have turned their heart back again. Then the fire of Yahweh fell and consumed the burnt offering and the wood and the stones and the dust and licked up the water that was in the trench. When all the people saw it, they fell on their faces. They said, Yahweh, he is God. Yahweh, he is God. Elijah said to them, Seize the prophets of Baal. Don't let one of them escape. They seized them. Elijah brought them down to the brook Kishon and killed them there. The Lord sends rain. Elijah said to Ahab, Get up, eat and drink for there is the sound of abundance of rain. So Ahab went up to eat and to drink. Elijah went up to the top of Carmel, and he bowed himself down on the earth and put his face between his knees. He said to his servant, Go up now, look toward the sea. He went up and looked and said, There is nothing. He said, Go again seven times. It happened at the seventh time that he said, Behold, a small cloud like a man's hand is rising out of the sea. He said, Go up, tell Ahab, get ready and go down so that the rain doesn't stop you. It happened in a little while that the sky grew black with clouds and wind, and there was a great rain. Ahab rode and went to Jezreel. The hand of Yahweh was on Elijah, and he tucked his cloak into his belt and ran before Ahab to the entrance of Jezreel. Chapter 19 Elijah Flees Jezebel Ahab told Jezebel all that Elijah had done and how he had killed all the prophets with the sword. Then Jezebel sent a messenger to Elijah, saying, So let the gods do to me, and more also, if I don't make your life as the life of one of them by tomorrow about this time. When he saw that, he arose and went for his life, and came to Beersheba, which belongs to Judah, and left his servant there. But he himself went a day's journey into the wilderness, and came and sat down under a juniper tree, and he requested for himself that he might die, and said, It is enough. Now, O Yahweh, take away my life, for I am not better than my father's. He lay down and slept under a juniper tree, and behold, an angel touched him, and said to him, Arise and eat. He looked, and behold, there was at his head a cake baked on the coals and a jar of water. He ate and drank and lay down again. The angel of Yahweh came again the second time and touched him and said, Arise and eat, 
because the journey is too great for you. He arose and ate and drank and went in the strength of that food forty days and forty nights to Horeb, the mount of God. The Lord speaks to Elijah at Horeb. He came there to a cave and lodged there. And behold, the word of Yahweh came to him, and he said to him, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for Yahweh, the God of armies, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and slain your prophets with the sword. I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. He said, Go out and stand on the mountain before Yahweh. Behold, Yahweh passed by, and a great and strong wind tore the mountains and broke in pieces the rocks before Yahweh. But Yahweh was not in the wind. After the wind, an earthquake. But Yahweh was not in the earthquake. After the earthquake, a fire passed. But Yahweh was not in the fire. And after the fire, a still, small voice. It was so, when Elijah heard it, that he wrapped his face in his mantle and went out and stood in the entrance of the cave. Behold, a voice came to him and said, What are you doing here, Elijah? He said, I have been very jealous for Yahweh, the God of armies, for the children of Israel have forsaken your covenant, thrown down your altars, and slain your prophets with the sword. I, even I only, am left, and they seek my life to take it away. Yahweh said to him, Go, return on your way to the wilderness of Damascus. When you arrive, you shall anoint Hazael to be king over Syria. You shall anoint Jehu, the son of Nimshi, to be king over Israel, and you shall anoint Elisha, the son of Shaphat, of Abel Meholah, to be prophet in your place. It shall happen that he who escapes from the sword of Hazael, Jehu will kill, and he who escapes from the sword of Jehu, Elisha will kill. Yet will I leave seven thousand in Israel, all the knees which have not bowed to Baal, and every mouth which has not kissed him. The Call of Elisha So he departed there, and found Elisha, the son of Shaphat, who was plowing, with twelve yoke of oxen before him, and he with the twelfth. And Elijah passed over to him, and cast his mantle on him. He left the oxen, and ran after Elijah, and said, Let me please kiss my father and my mother, and then I will follow you. He said to him, Go back again, for what have I done to you? He returned from following him, and took the yoke of oxen, and killed them and boiled their flesh with the instruments of the oxen, and gave to the people, and they ate. Then he arose, and went after Elijah, and served him. Chapter 20 Ahab's Wars with Syria Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, gathered all his army together, and there were thirty-two kings with him, and horses and chariots. And he went up and besieged Samaria, and fought against it. He sent messengers to Ahab, king of Israel, into the city, and said to him, Thus says Ben-Hadad, Your silver and your gold is mine, your wives also and your children, even the best, are mine. The king of Israel answered, 
It is according to your saying, my lord, O king. I am yours, and all that I have. The messengers came again and said, Ben-Hadad says, I sent indeed to you, saying, You shall deliver me your silver and your gold, and your wives and your children. But I will send my servants to you tomorrow about this time, and they shall search your house and the houses of your servants, and it shall be that whatever is pleasant in your eyes, they shall put it in their hand and take it away. Then the king of Israel called all the elders of the land and said, Please notice how this man seeks mischief, for he sent to me for my wives and for my children and for my silver and for my gold, and I didn't deny him. All the elders and all the people said to him, don't listen, neither consent. Therefore he said to the messengers of Ben-Hadad, Tell my lord the king, All that you sent for to your servant at the first I will do, but this thing I cannot do. The messengers departed and brought him back the message. Ben-Hadad sent to him and said, The gods do so to me, and more also, if the dust of Samaria shall suffice for handfuls for all the people who follow me. The king of Israel answered, Tell him, don't let him who puts on his armor brag like he who takes it off. It happened, when Ben-Hadad heard this message, as he was drinking, he and the kings, in the pavilions, that he said to his servants, Prepare to attack! they prepared to attack the city. Ahab defeats Ben-Hadad. Behold, a prophet came near to Ahab, king of Israel, and said, Thus says Yahweh, Have you seen all this great multitude? Behold, I will deliver it into your hand this day, and you shall know that I am Yahweh. Ahab said, By whom? He said, Thus says Yahweh, By the young men of the princes of the provinces. Then he said, Who shall begin the battle? He answered, You. Then he mustered the young men of the princes of the provinces, and they were two hundred and thirty-two. After them he mustered all the people, even all the children of Israel, being seven thousand. They went out at noon, but Ben-Hadad was drinking himself drunk in the pavilions, he and the kings, the thirty-two kings who helped him. The young men of the princes of the provinces went out first, and Ben-Hadad sent out, and they told him, saying, Men are coming out from Samaria, he said, if they have come out for peace, take them alive. Or if they have come out for war, take them alive. So these went out of the city, the young men of the princes of the provinces, and the army which followed them. They each killed his man. The Syrians fled, and Israel pursued them. Ben-Hadad, the king of Syria, escaped on a horse with horsemen. The king of Israel went out and struck the horses and chariots and killed the Syrians with a great slaughter. The prophet came near to the king of Israel and said to him, Go, strengthen yourself, and mark, and see what you do, for at the return of the year the king of Syria will come up against you. The servants of the king of Syria said to him, their god is a god of the hills, therefore they were stronger than we. But let us fight against them in the plain, and surely we shall be stronger than they. Do this thing, take the kings away, every man out of his place, and put captains in their place. Muster an army, like the army that you have lost, horse for horse, and chariot for chariot. We will fight against them in the plain and surely we will be stronger than them. He listened to their voice, and did so. 
Another War with Ben Haydad. It happened at the return of the year that Ben Hadad mustered the Syrians and went up to Aphek to fight against Israel. The children of Israel were mustered and were provisioned and went against them. The children of Israel encamped before them like two little flocks of young goats. But the Syrians filled the country. A man of God came near and spoke to the king of Israel and said, Thus says Yahweh, because the Syrians have said, Yahweh is a God of the hills, but he is not a God of the valleys. Therefore, I will deliver all this great multitude into your hand, and you shall know that I am Yahweh. They encamped one over against the other seven days. So it was that in the seventh day the battle was joined. And the children of Israel killed 100,000 footmen of the Syrians in one day. But the rest fled to Aphek, into the city. And the wall fell on 27,000 men who were left. Ben-Hadad fled and came into the city, into an inner room. Ahab spares Ben-Hadad. His servants said to him, See now, we have heard that the kings of the house of Israel are merciful kings. Please let us put sackcloth on our bodies and ropes on our heads and go out to the king of Israel. Maybe he will save your life. So they put sackcloth on their bodies and ropes on their heads and came to the king of Israel and said, Your servant Ben-Hadad says, Please, let me live he said is he still alive he is my brother now the men observed diligently and hurried to take this phrase and they said your brother ben hadad then he said go bring him then ben hadad came out to him and he caused him to come up into the chariot ben hadad said to him the cities which my father took from your father I will restore. You shall make streets for yourself in Damascus, as my father made in Samaria. I, said Ahab, will let you go with this covenant. So he made a covenant with him and let him go. A prophet reproves Ahab. A certain man of the sons of the prophets said to his fellow by the word of Yahweh, Please, strike me. The man refused to strike him. Then he said to him, Because you have not obeyed the voice of Yahweh, behold, as soon as you are departed from me, a lion shall kill you. As soon as he was departed from him, a lion found him and killed him. Then he found another man and said, Please, strike me. The man struck him, smiting and wounding him. So the prophet departed and waited for the king by the way and disguised himself with his headband over his eyes. As the king passed by, he cried to the king and he said, Your servant went out into the midst of the battle and behold, a man turned aside and brought a man to me and said, Guard this man. If by any means he be missing, then your life shall be for his life, or else you shall pay a talent of silver. As your servant was busy here and there, he was gone. The king of Israel said to him, So your judgment shall be. Yourself have decided it. He hurried and took the headband away from his eyes, and the king of Israel recognized that he was of the prophets. He said to him, Thus says Yahweh, Because you have let go out of your hand the man whom I had devoted to destruction, therefore your life shall go for his life, and your people for his people. The king of Israel went to his house, sullen and angry, and came to Samaria. Chapter 21 
Ahab covets Naboth's vineyard. It happened after these things that Naboth, the Jezreelite, had a vineyard, which was in Jezreel, hard by the palace of Ahab, king of Samaria. Ahab spoke to Naboth, saying, Give me your vineyard, that I may have it for a garden of herbs, because it is near to my house, and I will give you for it a better vineyard than it. Or if it seems good to you, I will give you its worth in money. Naboth said to Ahab, May Yahweh forbid me that I should give the inheritance of my fathers to you. Ahab came into his house sullen and angry because of the word which Naboth the Jezreelite had spoken to him. For he had said, I will not give you the inheritance of my fathers. He laid himself down on his bed and turned away his face and would eat no bread. But Jezebel, his wife, came to him and said to him, Why is your spirit so sad that you eat no bread? He said to her, Because I spoke to Naboth the Jezreelite and said to him, Give me your vineyard for money, or else, if it pleases you, I will give you another vineyard for it. He answered, I will not give you my vineyard. Jezebel his wife said to him, Do you now govern the kingdom of Israel? Arise and eat bread, and let your heart be merry. I will give you the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite. So she wrote letters in Ahab's name and sealed them with his seal and sent the letters to the elders and to the nobles who were in his city, who lived with Naboth. She wrote in the letters, saying, Proclaim a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. Set two men, base fellows, before him and let them testify against him, saying, You cursed God and the king. Then carry him out and stone him to death. Jezebel's Plot The men of his city, even the elders and the nobles who lived in his city, did as Jezebel had sent to them, according as it was written in the letters which she had sent to them. They proclaimed a fast and set Naboth on high among the people. The two men, the base fellows, came in and sat before him. The base fellows testified against him, even against Naboth, in the presence of the people, saying, Naboth cursed God and the king. Then they carried him out of the city and stoned him to death with stones. Then they sent to Jezebel, saying, Naboth has been stoned and is dead. It happened when Jezebel heard that Naboth was stoned and was dead, that Jezebel said to Ahab, Arise, take possession of the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite, which he refused to give you for money, for Naboth is not alive, but dead. It happened when Ahab heard that Naboth was dead, that Ahab rose up to go down to the vineyard of Naboth the Jezreelite to take possession of it. Elijah denounces Ahab and Jezebel. The word of Yahweh came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, Arise, go down to meet Ahab, king of Israel who dwells in Samaria. Behold, he is in the vineyard of Naboth, where he has gone down to take possession of it. You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says Yahweh, Have you killed and also taken possession? You shall speak to him, saying, Thus says Yahweh, in the place where dogs licked the blood of Naboth, dogs will lick your blood, even yours. Ahab said to Elijah, Have you found me, my enemy? He answered, I have found you, because you have sold yourself to do that which is evil in the sight of Yahweh. Behold, 
I will bring evil on you, and will utterly sweep you away, and will cut off from Ahab everyone who urinates against a wall, and him who is shut up, and him who is left at large in Israel. I will make your house like the house of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, and like the house of Baasha, the son of Ahijah, for the provocation with which you have provoked me to anger, and have made Israel to sin. Yahweh also spoke of Jezebel, saying, The dogs shall eat Jezebel by the rampart of Jezreel. The dogs will eat he who dies of Ahab in the city, and the birds of the sky will eat he who dies in the field. Ahab's Repentance But there was none like Ahab, who sold himself to do that which was evil in the sight of Yahweh, whom Jezebel his wife stirred up. He did very abominably in following idols, according to all that the Amorites did, whom Yahweh cast out before the children of Israel. It happened, when Ahab heard those words, that he tore his clothes, and put sackcloth on his flesh, and fasted, and lay in sackcloth, and went softly. The word of Yahweh came to Elijah the Tishbite, saying, See how Ahab humbles himself before me? Because he humbles himself before me, I will not bring the evil in his days, but in his son's days will I bring the evil on his house. End of section 30